Section 41 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 41. Chapter 44, Part 5 Such high profits naturally begat intruders upon their commerce, and in order to secure themselves against encroachments, the patentees were armed with high and arbitrary powers from the council, by which they were enabled to oppress the people at leisure, and to exact money from such as they thought proper to accuse of interfering with their patent. The patentees of Saltpeter having the power of entering into every house, and of committing what havoc they pleased in stables, cellars, or wherever they suspected Saltpeter might be gathered, commonly extorted money from those who desired to free themselves from this damage or trouble. And while all domestic intercourse was thus restrained, lest any scope should remain for industry, almost every species of foreign commerce was confined to exclusive companies, who bought and sold at any price that they themselves thought proper to offer or exact. These grievances, the most intolerable for the present, and the most pernicious in their consequences, that were ever known in any age or under any government, had been mentioned in the last Parliament, and a petition had even been presented to the Queen, complaining of the patents. But she still persisted in defending her monopolists against her people. A bill was now introduced into the lower house, abolishing all these monopolies, and as the former application had been unsuccessful, a law was insisted on as the only certain expedient for correcting these abuses. The courtiers, on the other hand, maintained that this matter regarded the prerogative, and that the commons could never hope for success, if they did not make application in the most humble and respectful manner to the Queen's goodness and beneficence. The topics which were advanced in the House, and which came equally from the courtiers and the country gentlemen, and were admitted by both, will appear the most extraordinary to such as are prepossessed with an idea of the privileges enjoyed by the people during that age, and of the liberty possessed under the administration of Elizabeth. It was asserted that the Queen inherited both an enlarging and a restraining power. By her prerogative she might set at liberty what was restrained by statute or otherwise, and by her prerogative she might restrain what was otherwise at liberty, that the royal prerogative was not to be canvassed, nor disputed, nor examined, and did not even admit of any limitation, that absolute princes, such as the sovereigns of England, were a species of divinity, that it was in vain to attempt tying the queen's hands by laws or statutes, since by means of her dispensing power she could loosen herself at pleasure, and that even if a clause should be annexed to a statute, excluding her dispensing power, she could first dispense with that clause, and then with the statute. After all this discourse, more worthy of a Turkish divan than of an English House of Commons, according to our present idea of this assembly, the queen, who perceived how odious monopolies had become, and what heats were likely to arise, sent for the speaker, and desired him to acquaint the house that she would immediately cancel the most grievous and oppressive of these patents. The house was struck with astonishment, and admiration and gratitude at this extraordinary instance of the queen's goodness and condescension. A member said, with tears in his eyes, that if a sentence of everlasting happiness had been pronounced in his favour, 
he could not have felt more joy than that with which he was at present overwhelmed another observed that this message from the sacred person of the queen was a kind of gospel or glad tidings and ought to be received as such and be written in the tablets of their hearts and it was further remarked that in the same manner as the deity would not give his glory to another so the queen herself was the only agent in their present prosperity and happiness the house voted that the speaker with a committee should ask permission to wait on her majesty and return thanks to her for her gracious concessions to her people when the speaker with the other members was introduced to the queen they all flung themselves on their knees and remained in that posture a considerable time till she thought proper to express her desire that they should rise the speaker displayed the gratitude of the commons because her sacred ears were ever open to hear them and her blessed hands ever stretched out to relieve them they acknowledged he said in all duty and thankfulness acknowledged that before they called her preventing grace and all-deserving goodness watched over them for their good more ready to give than they could desire much less deserve he remarked that the attribute which was most proper to god to perform all he promiseth appertained also to her and that she was all truth all constancy and all goodness and he concluded with these expressions neither do we present our thanks in words or any outward sign which can be no sufficient retribution for so great goodness but in all duty and thankfulness prostrate at your feet we present our most loyal and thankful hearts even the last drop of blood in our hearts and the last spirit of breath in our nostrils to be poured out to be breathed up for your safety the queen heard very patiently this speech in which she was flattered in phrases appropriated to the supreme being and she returned an answer full of such expressions of tenderness towards her people as ought to have appeared fulsome after the late instances of rigour which she had employed and from which nothing but necessity had made her depart thus was this critical affair happily terminated and elizabeth by prudently receding in time from part of her prerogative maintained her dignity and preserved the affections of her people the commons granted her a supply quite unprecedented of four subsidies and eight fifteenths and they were so dutiful as to vote this supply before they received any satisfaction in the business of monopolies which they justly considered as of the utmost importance to the interest and happiness of the nation had they attempted to extort that concession by keeping the supply in suspense so haughty was the queen's disposition that this appearance of constraint and jealousy had been sufficient to have produced a denial of all their requests and to have forced her into some acts of authority still more violent and arbitrary the remaining events of this reign are neither numerous nor important the queen finding that the spaniards had involved her in so much trouble by fomenting and assisting the irish rebellion resolved to give them employment at home and she fitted out a squadron of nine ships under sir richard levison admiral and sir william monson vice-admiral whom she sent on an expedition to the coast of spain the admiral with part of the squadron met the galleons loaded with treasure but was not strong enough to attack them the vice-admiral also fell in with some rich ships but they escaped for a like reason and these two brave officers that their expedition might not prove entirely fruitless resolved to attack the harbour of serimbra in portugal 
where they received intelligence a very rich carrack had taken shelter the harbour was guarded by a castle there were eleven galleys stationed in it and the militia of the country to the number as was believed of twenty thousand men appeared in arms on the shore yet notwithstanding these obstacles and others derived from the winds and tides the english squadron broke into the harbour dismounted the guns of the castle sunk or burnt or put to flight the galleys and obliged the carrack to surrender they brought her home to england and she was valued at a million of ducats a sensible loss to the spaniards and a supply still more important to elizabeth the affairs of ireland after the defeat of tyrone and the expulsion of the spaniards hastened to a settlement lord mountjoy divided his army into small parties and harassed the rebels on every side he built charlemont and many other small forts which were impregnable to the irish and guarded all the important passes of the country the activity of sir henry dockray and sir arthur chichester permitted no repose or security to the rebels and many of the chieftains after skulking during some time in woods and morasses submitted to mercy and received such conditions as the deputy was pleased to impose upon them tyrone himself made application by arthur macbarron his brother to be received upon terms but mountjoy would not admit him except he made an absolute surrender of his life and fortunes to the queen's mercy he appeared before the deputy at milfont in a habit and posture suitable to his present fortune and after acknowledging his offence in the most humble terms he was committed to custody by mountjoy who intended to bring him over captive into england to be disposed of at the queen's pleasure but elizabeth was now incapable of receiving any satisfaction from this fortunate event she had fallen into a profound melancholy which all the advantages of her high fortune all the glories of her prosperous reign were unable in any degree to alleviate or assuage some ascribed this depression of mind to her repentance of granting a pardon to tyrone whom she had always resolved to bring to condign punishment for his treasons but who had made such interest with the ministers as to extort a remission from her others with more likelihood accounted for her dejection by a discovery which she had made of the correspondence maintained in her court with her successor the king of scots and by the neglect to which on account of her old age and infirmities she imagined herself to be exposed but there is another cause assigned for her melancholy which has long been rejected by historians as romantic but which late discoveries seem to have confirmed some incidents happened which revived her tenderness for essex and filled her with the deepest sorrow for the consent which she had unwarily given to his execution the earl of essex after his return from the fortunate expedition against cadiz observing the increase of the queen's fond attachment towards him took occasion to regret that the necessity of her service required him often to be absent from her person and exposed him to all those ill offices which his enemies more assiduous in their attendance could employ against him she was moved with this tender jealousy and making him the present of a ring desired him to keep that pledge of her affection and assured him that into whatever disgrace he should fall whatever prejudices she might be induced to entertain against him yet if he sent her that ring she would immediately upon the sight of it recall her former tenderness would afford him a patient hearing and would lend a favourable ear to his apology essex notwithstanding all his misfortunes 
reserved this precious gift to the last extremity but after his trial and condemnation he resolved to try the experiment and he committed the ring to the countess of nottingham whom he desired to deliver it to the queen the countess was prevailed on by her husband the mortal enemy of essex not to execute the commission and elizabeth who still expected that her favourite would make this last appeal to her tenderness and who ascribed the neglect of it to his invincible obstinacy was after much delay and many internal combats pushed by resentment and policy to sign the warrant for his execution the countess of nottingham falling into sickness and affected with the near approach of death was seized with remorse for her conduct and having obtained a visit from the queen she craved her pardon and revealed to her the fatal secret the queen astonished with this incident burst into a furious passion she shook the dying countess in her bed and crying to her that god might pardon her but she never could and thenceforth resigned herself over to the deepest and most incurable melancholy she rejected all consolation she even refused food and sustenance and throwing herself on the floor she remained sullen and immovable feeding her thoughts on her afflictions and declaring life and existence an insufferable burden to her few words she uttered and they were all expressive of some inward grief which she cared not to reveal but sighs and groans were the chief vent which she gave to her despondency and which though they discovered her sorrows were never able to ease or assuage them ten days and nights she lay upon the carpet leaning on cushions which her maids brought her and her physicians could not persuade her to allow herself to be put to bed much less to make trial of any remedies which they prescribed to her her anxious mind at last had so long preyed on her frail body that her end was visibly approaching and the council being assembled sent the keeper admiral and secretary to know her will with regard to her successor she answered with a faint voice that as she had held a regal sceptre she desired no other than a royal successor cecil requesting her to explain herself more particularly she subjoined that she would have a king to succeed her and who should that be but her nearest kinsman the king of scots being then advised by the archbishop of canterbury to fix her thoughts upon god she replied that she did so nor did her mind in the least wander from him her voice soon after left her and senses failed she fell into a lethargic slumber which continued some hours and she expired gently without further struggle or convulsion in the seventieth year of her age and forty-fifth of her reign so dark a cloud overcast the evening of that day which had shone out with a mighty lustre in the eyes of all europe there are few great personages in history who have been more exposed to the calumny of enemies and the adulation of friends than queen elizabeth and yet there scarcely is any whose reputation has been more certainly determined by the unanimous consent of posterity the unusual length of her administration and the strong features of her character were able to overcome all prejudices and obliging her detractors to abate much of their invectives and her admirers somewhat of their panegyrics have at last 
in spite of political factions and what is more of religious animosities produced a uniform judgment with regard to her conduct her vigour her constancy her magnanimity her penetration vigilance address are allowed to merit the highest praises and appear not to have been surpassed by any person that ever filled a throne a conduct less rigorous less imperious more sincere more indulgent to her people would have been requisite to form a perfect character by the force of her mind she controlled all her more active and stronger qualities and prevented them from running into excess her heroism was exempt from temerity her frugality from avarice her friendship from partiality her active temper from turbulency and a vain ambition she guarded not herself with equal care or equal success from lesser infirmities the rivalship of beauty the desire of admiration the jealousy of love and the sallies of anger her singular talents for government were founded equally on her temper and on her capacity endowed with a great command over herself she soon obtained an uncontrolled ascendant over her people and while she merited all their esteem by her real virtues she also engaged their affections by her pretended ones few sovereigns of england succeeded to the throne in more difficult circumstances and none ever conducted the government with such uniform success and felicity though unacquainted with the practice of toleration the true secret for managing religious factions she preserved her people by her superior prudence from those confusions in which theological controversy had involved all the neighboring nations and though her enemies were the most powerful princes of europe the most active the most enterprising the least scrupulous she was able by her vigor to make deep impressions on their states her own greatness meanwhile remained untouched and unimpaired the wise ministers and brave warriors who flourished under her reign share the praise of her success but instead of lessening the applause due to her they make great addition to it they owed all of them their advancement to her choice they were supported by her constancy and with all their abilities they were never able to acquire any undue ascendant over her in her family in her court in her kingdom she remained equally mistress the force of the tender passions was great over her but the force of her mind was still superior and the combat which her victory visibly cost her serves only to display the firmness of her resolution and the loftiness of her ambitious sentiments the fame of this princess though it has surmounted the prejudices both of faction and bigotry yet lies still exposed to another prejudice which is more durable because more natural and which according to the different views in which we survey her is capable either of exalting beyond measure or diminishing the lustre of her character this prejudice is founded on the consideration of her sex when we contemplate her as a woman we are apt to be struck with the highest admiration of her great qualities and extensive capacity but we are also apt to require some more softness of disposition some greater lenity of temper some of those amiable weaknesses by which her sex is distinguished but the true method of estimating her merit is to lay aside all these considerations and consider her merely as a rational being placed in authority and entrusted with the government of mankind 
we may find it difficult to reconcile our fancy to her as a wife or a mistress but her qualities as a sovereign though with some considerable exceptions are the object of undisputed applause and approbation end of section forty one chapter forty four part five section forty two of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by richard carpenter history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume Volume 1D, Section 42, Appendix 3, Part 1. The party among us, who have distinguished themselves by adhering to liberty and popular government, have long indulged their prejudices against the succeeding race of princes, and by bestowing unbounded panegyrics on the virtue and wisdom of Elizabeth. They have been so extremely ignorant of the transactions of this reign, as to extol her for a quality which of all others she was least possessed of a tender regard for the constitution and a concern for the liberties and privileges of her people but as it is scarcely possible for the prepossessions of party to throw a veil much longer over facts so palpable and undeniable there is a danger lest the public should run into the opposite extreme and should entertain an aversion to the memory of a princess who exercised the royal authority in a manner so contrary to all the ideas which we at present entertain of a legal constitution but elizabeth only supported the prerogatives transmitted to her by her predecessors she believed that her subjects were entitled to no more liberty than their ancestors had enjoyed she found that they entirely acquiesced in her arbitrary administration and it was not natural for her to find fault with a form of government by which she herself was invested with such unlimited authority in the particular exertions of power the question ought never to be forgotten what is best but in the general distribution of power among the several members of a constitution there can seldom be admitted any other question than what is established few examples occur of princes who have willingly resigned their power none of those who have without a struggle and reluctance allowed it to be extorted from them if any other rule than established practice be followed factions and dissensions must multiply without end and though many constitutions and none more than the british have been improved even by violent innovations the praise bestowed on those patriots to whom the nation has been indebted for its privileges ought to be given with some reserve and surely without the least rancor against those who adhered to the ancient constitution in order to understand the ancient constitution of england there is not a period which deserves more to be studied than the reign of elizabeth the prerogatives of this princess were scarcely ever disputed and she therefore employed them without scruple her imperious temper a circumstance in which she went far beyond her successors rendered her exertions of power violent and frequent and discovered the full extent of her authority the great popularity which she enjoyed proves that she did not infringe any established liberties of the people there remains evidence sufficient to ascertain the most noted acts of her administration and though that evidence must be drawn from a source wide of the ordinary historians it becomes only more authentic on that account and serves as a stronger proof that her particular exertions of power were conceived to be nothing but the ordinary course of administration since they were not thought remarkable enough to be recorded even by contemporary writers if there was any difference in this particular 
the people in former reigns seem rather to have been more submissive than even during the age of elizabeth it may not be improper to recount some of the ancient prerogatives of the crown and lay open the sources of that great power which the english monarchs formerly enjoyed one of the most ancient and most established instruments of power was the court of star chamber which possessed an unlimited discretionary authority of fining imprisoning and inflicting corporal punishment and whose jurisdiction extended to all sorts of offences contempts and disorders that lay not within reach of the common law the members of this court consisted of the privy council and the judges men who all of them enjoyed their offices during pleasure and when the prince himself was present he was the sole judge and all others could only interpose with their advice there needed but this one court in any government to put an end to all regular legal and exact plans of liberty for who durst set himself in opposition to the crown and ministry or aspire to the character of being a patron of freedom while exposed to so arbitrary a jurisdiction i much question whether any of the absolute monarchies in europe contain at present so illegal and despotic a tribunal the court of high commission was another jurisdiction still more terrible both because the crime of heresy of which it took cognizance was more undefinable than any civil offence and because its method of inquisition and of administering oaths were more contrary to all the most simple ideas of justice and equity the fines and imprisonments imposed by this court were frequent the deprivations and suspensions of the clergy for nonconformity were also numerous and comprehended at one time the third of all the ecclesiastics of england the queen in a letter to the archbishop of canterbury said expressly that she was resolved that no man should be suffered to decline either on the left or on the right hand from the drawn line limited by authority and by her law and injunctions but martial law went beyond even these two courts in a prompt and arbitrary and violent method of decision whenever there was an insurrection of public disorder the crown employed martial law and it was during that time exercised not only over the soldiers but over the whole people any one might be punished as a rebel or an aider and a better of rebellion whom the provost marshal or lieutenant of a county or their deputies pleased to suspect lord bacon says that the trial at common law granted to the lord of essex and his fellow conspirators was a favour for that the case would have borne and required the severity of martial law we have seen instances of it being employed by queen mary in defence of orthodoxy there remains a letter of queen elizabeth to the earl of sussex after the suppression of the northern rebellion in which she sharply reproves him because she had not heard of his having executed any criminals by martial law though it is probable that near eight hundred persons suffered one way or another on account of that slight insurrection but the kings of england did not always limit the exercise of this law to times of civil war and disorder in fifteen fifty two when there was no rebellion or insurrection king edward granted a commission of martial law and empowered the commissioners to execute it as should be thought by their discretion most necessary queen elizabeth too was not sparing in the use of this law in fifteen seventy three one peter burchett a puritan being persuaded that it was meritorious to kill such as opposed the truth of the gospel ran into the streets and wounded hawkins the famous sea captain whom he took for hatton the queen's favourite the queen was so incensed that she ordered him to be punished instantly by martial law but upon the remonstrance of some prudent counsellors who told her that this law was usually confined to turbulent times she recalled her order and delivered over burchett to the common law but she continued not always so reserved in executing this authority 
there remains a proclamation of hers in which she orders martial law to be used against all such as import bulls or even forbidden books and pamphlets from abroad and prohibits the questioning of their lieutenants or their deputies for their arbitrary punishment of such offenders any law or statute to the contrary in any wise notwithstanding we have another act of hers still more extraordinary the streets of london were much infested with idle vagabonds and riotous persons the lord mayor had endeavoured to repress this disorder the star chamber had exerted its authority and inflicted punishment on these rioters but the queen finding those remedies ineffectual revived martial law and gave sir thomas wilford a commission of provost marshal granting him authority and commanding him upon signification given by the justices of peace in london or the neighbouring counties of such offenders worthy to be speedily executed by martial law to attach and take the same persons and in the presence of the said justices according to justice of martial law to execute them upon the gallows or gibbet openly or near to such place where the said rebellious and incorrigible offenders shall be found to have committed the said great offences i suppose it would be difficult to produce an instance of such an act of authority in any place nearer than muscovy the patent of high constable granted to earl rivers by edward the fourth proves the nature of the office the powers are unlimited perpetual and remain in force during peace as well as during war and rebellion the parliament in edward the sixth reign acknowledged the jurisdiction of the constable and marshal's court to be part of the laws of the land the star chamber and high commission and court martial though arbitrary jurisdictions had still some pretence of a trial at least of a sentence but there was a grievous punishment very generally inflicted in that age without any other authority than the warrant of a secretary of state or of the privy council and that was imprisonment in any jail and during any time that the ministers should think proper in suspicious times all the jails were full of prisoners of state and those unhappy victims of public jealousy were sometimes thrown into dungeons loaded with irons and treated in the most cruel manner without their being able to obtain any remedy from the law this practice was an indirect way of employing torture but the rack itself though not admitted in the ordinary execution of justice was frequently used upon any suspicion by authority of a warrant from a secretary or the privy council even the council in the marches of wales were empowered by their very commission to make use of torture whenever they thought proper there cannot be a stronger proof of how lightly the rack was employed than the following story told by lord bacon we shall give it in his own words the queen was mightily incensed against hayward on account of a book he dedicated to lord essex being a story of the first year of henry the fourth thinking it a seditious prelude to put into the people's heads boldness and faction she said that she had an opinion that there was treason in it and asked me if i could not find any places in it that might be drawn within the case of treason whereto i answered for treason sure i found none but for felony very many and when her majesty hastily asked me wherein i told her the author had committed very apparent theft for he had taken most of the sentences of cornelius tacitus and translated them into english and put them into his text and another time when the queen could not be persuaded that it was his writing whose name was on it but that it had some more mischievous author and said with a great indignation that she would have him racked to produce his author i replied nay madam he is a doctor never rack his person but rack his style let him have pen ink paper and help of books and be enjoined to continue the story where it breaketh off and i will undertake by collating the styles to judge whether he were the author or no thus had it not been for bacon's humanity or rather his wit 
this author a man of letters had been put to the rack for a most innocent performance his real offence was his dedicating a book to that magnificent patron of the learned the earl of essex at a time when this nobleman lay under her majesty's displeasure the queen's menace of trying and punishing hayward for treason could easily have been executed let his book have been ever so innocent while so many terrors hung over the people no jury durst have acquitted a man when the court was resolved to have him condemned the practice also of not confronting witnesses with the prisoner gave the crown lawyers all imaginable advantage against him and indeed there scarcely occurs any instance during all these reigns that a sovereign or the ministers were ever disappointed in the issue of a prosecution timid juries and judges who held their offices during pleasure never failed to second all the views of the crown the power of pressing both for sea and land service and obliging any person to accept of any office however mean or unfit for him was another prerogative totally incompatible with freedom osborne giving the following account of elizabeth's method of employing this prerogative in case she found any likely to interrupt her occasions says he she did seasonably prevent him by a chargeable employment abroad or putting him upon some service at home which she knew least grateful to the people contrary to a false maximum since practised with far worse success by such princes as thought it better husbandry to buy off enemies than reward friends the practice with which osborne reproaches the two immediate successors of elizabeth proceed partly from the extreme difficulty of their situation partly from the greater lenity of their disposition the power of pressing as may naturally be imagined was often abused in other respects by men of inferior rank and officers often exacted money for freeing persons from the service the government of england during that age however different in other particulars bore in this respect some resemblance to that of turkey at present the sovereign possessed every power except that of imposing taxes and in both countries this limitation unsupported by other privileges appears rather prejudicial to the people in turkey it obliges the sultan to permit the extortion of the pashas and governors of provinces from whom he afterwards squeezes presents or takes forfeitures in england it engaged the queen to erect monopolies and grant patents for exclusive trade an invention so pernicious that had she gone on during attractive years at her own rate england the seat of riches and arts and commerce would have contained at present as little industry as morocco or the coast of barbary we may further observe that this valuable privilege valuable only because it proved afterwards the means by which the parliament extorted all their other privileges was very much encroached on in an indirect manner during the reign of elizabeth as well as of her predecessors she often exacted loans from her people an arbitrary and unequal kind of imposition and which individuals felt severely for though the money had been regularly repaid which was seldom the case it lay in the prince's hands without interest which was a sensible loss to the persons from whom the money was borrowed there remains a proposal made by lord burleigh for levying a general loan on the people equivalent to a subsidy a scheme which would have laid the burden more equally but which was in different words a taxation imposed without consent of parliament it is remarkable that the scheme thus proposed without any visible necessity by that wise minister is the very same which henry the eighth executed and which charles i enraged by ill usage from his parliament and reduced to the greatest difficulties put afterwards in practice to the great discontent of the nation the demand of benevolence was another invention of that age for taxing the people this practice was so little conceived to be irregular that the commons in fifteen eighty five offered the queen a benevolence 
which she very generously refused, as having no occasion at that time for money. Queen Mary, also by order of council, increased the customs in some branches, and her sister imitated the example. There was a species of ship money imposed at the time of the Spanish invasion. The several ports were required to equip a certain number of vessels at their own charge, and such was the alacrity of the people for the public defence that some of the ports, particularly London, sent double the number demanded of them. When any levies were made for Ireland, France, or the Low Countries, the Queen obliged the counties to levy the soldiers, to arm and clothe them, and carry them to the seaports at their own charge. New Year's gifts were at that time expected from the nobility, and from the more considerable gentry. Purveyance and preemption were also methods of taxation, unequal, arbitrary, and oppressive. The whole kingdom sensibly felt the burden of these impositions, and it was regarded as a great privilege conferred on Oxford and Cambridge to prohibit the purveyors from taking any commodities within five miles of these universities. The queen victualled her navy by means of this prerogative during the first years of her reign. Wardship was the most regular and legal of all these impositions by prerogative, and yet was it a great badge of slavery and oppressive to all the considerable families. When an estate devolved to a female, the sovereign obliged her to marry any one he pleased. Whether the heir were male or female, the crown enjoyed the whole profit of the estate during the minority. The giving of a rich wardship was a usual method of rewarding a courtier or favorite. The inventions were endless, which arbitrary power might employ for the extorting of money, while the people imagined that their property was secured by the crowns being debarred from imposing taxes. Stripe has preserved a speech of Lord Burley to the Queen and Council, in which are contained some particulars not a little extraordinary. Burley proposes that she should erect a court for the correction of all abuses, and should confer on the commissioners a general inquisitorial power over the whole kingdom. He sets before her the example of her wise grandfather, Henry the Seventh, who by such methods extremely augmented his revenue, and he recommends that this new court should proceed as well by the direction and ordinary course of the laws as by virtue of her majesty's supreme regiment and absolute power from whence law proceeded in a word he expects from this institution greater accession to the royal treasure than henry the eighth derived from the abolition of the abbeys and all the forfeitures of ecclesiastical revenues this project of lord burleigh's needs not i think any comment a form of government must be very arbitrary indeed where a wise and good minister could make such a proposal to the sovereign embargoes on merchandise was another engine of royal power by which the english princes were able to extort money from the people we have seen instances in the reign of mary elizabeth before her coronation issued an order to the customs house prohibiting the sale of all crimson silk which should be imported till the court were first supplied she expected no doubt a good pennyworth from the merchants while they lay under her restraint the parliament pretended to the right of enacting laws as well as of granting subsidies but this privilege was during that age still more insignificant than the other queen elizabeth expressly prohibited them from meddling either with state matters or ecclesiastical causes, and she openly sent the members to prison who dared to transgress her imperial edict in these particulars. There passed few sessions of Parliament during her reign where there occur not instances of this arbitrary conduct. End of section 42, Appendix 3, Part 1 Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington Section 43 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar 
to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 42, Appendix 3, Part 2. But the legislative power of the Parliament was a mere fallacy, while the sovereign was universally acknowledged to possess a dispensing power by which all the laws could be invalidated and rendered of no effect. The exercise of this power was also an indirect method practised for erecting monopolies. Where the statutes laid any branch of manufacture under restrictions, the sovereign, by exempting one person from the laws, gave him in effect the monopoly of that commodity there was no grievance at that time more universally complained of than the frequent dispensing with the penal laws but in reality the crown possessed the full legislative power by means of proclamations which might affect any matter even of the greatest importance and which the star chamber took care to see more rigorously executed than the laws themselves the motives for these proclamations were sometimes frivolous and even ridiculous queen elizabeth had taken offence at the smell of woad and she issued an edict prohibiting any one from cultivating that useful plant she was also pleased to take offence at the long swords and high ruffs then in fashion she sent about her officers to break every man's sword and clip every man's ruff which was beyond a certain dimension this practice resembles the method employed by the great czar peter to make his subjects change their garb the queen's prohibition of the prophesying or the assemblies instituted for fanatical prayers and conferences was founded on a better reason but shows still the unlimited extent of her prerogative any number of persons could not meet together in order to read the scriptures and confer about religion though in ever so orthodox a manner without her permission there were many other branches of prerogative incompatible with an exact and regular enjoyment of liberty none of the nobility could marry without permission from the sovereign the queen detained the earl of southampton long in prison because he privately married the earl of essex's cousin no man could travel without the consent of the prince sir william evers underwent a severe persecution because he had presumed to pay a private visit to the king of scots the sovereign even assumed a supreme and uncontrolled authority over all foreign trade and neither allowed any person to enter or depart the kingdom nor any commodity to be imported or exported without his consent the parliament in the thirteenth of the queen praised her for not imitating the practice usual among her predecessors of stopping the course of justice by particular warrants there could not possibly be a greater abuse nor a stronger mark of arbitrary power and the queen in refraining from it was very laudable but she was by no means constant in this reserve there remain in the public records some warrants of hers for exempting particular persons from all lawsuits and prosecutions if in these warrants she says she grants from her royal prerogative which she will not allow to be disputed it was very usual in queen elizabeth's reign and probably in all the preceding reigns for noblemen or privy councillors to commit to prison any one who had happened to displease them by suing for his just debts and the unhappy person though he gained his cause in the courts of justice was commonly obliged to relinquish his property in order to obtain his liberty some likewise who had been delivered from prison by the judges were again committed to custody in secret places without any possibility of obtaining relief and even the officers and the sergeants of the courts of law were punished for executing the writs in favor of these persons nay it was usual to send for people by pursuivants a kind of harpies who then attended 
the orders of the council and high commission and they were brought up to london and constrained by imprisonment not only to withdraw their lawful suits but also to pay the pursuivants great sums of money the judges in the thirty-fourth of the queen complained to her majesty of the frequency of this practice it is probable that so egregious a tyranny was carried no farther down than the reign of elizabeth since the parliament who presented the petition of right found no later instances of it and even these very judges of elizabeth who thus protect the people against the tyranny of the great expressly allow that a person committed by special command of the queen is not bailable it is easy to imagine that in such a government no justice could by course of law be obtained of the sovereign unless he were willing to allow it in the naval expedition undertaken by raleigh and frobisher against the spaniards in the year fifteen ninety two a very rich carrack was taken worth two hundred thousand pounds the queen's share in the great adventure was only a tenth but as the prize was so great and exceeded so much the expectation of all the adventurers she was determined not to rest contented with her share raleigh humbly and earnestly begged her to accept of a hundred thousand pounds in lieu of all her demands or rather extortions and says that the present which the proprietors were willing to make her of eighty thousand pounds was the greatest that ever prince received from a subject but it is no wonder the queen in her administration should pay so little regard to liberty while the parliament itself in enacting laws was entirely negligent of it the persecuting statutes which they passed against papists and puritans are extremely contrary to the genius of freedom and by exposing such multitudes to the tyranny of priests and bigots accustomed the people to the most disgraceful subjection their conferring an unlimited supremacy on the queen or what is worse acknowledgment of her inherent right to it was another proof of their voluntary servitude the law of the twenty-third of her reign making seditious words against the queen capital is also a very tyrannical statute and a use no less tyrannical was sometimes made of it the case of udall a puritanical clergyman seems singular even in those arbitrary times this man had published a book called a demonstration of discipline in which he inveighed against the government of bishops and though he had carefully endeavoured to conceal his name he was thrown into prison upon the suspicion and brought to trial for this offence it was pretended that the bishops were part of the queen's political body and to speak against them was really to attack her and was therefore felony by the statute this was not the only inequity to which udall was exposed the judges would not allow the jury to determine anything but the fact whether udall had written the book or not without examining his intention or the import of the words in order to prove the fact the crown lawyers did not produce a single witness to the court they only read the testimony of two persons absent one of whom said that udall had told him he was the author another that a friend of udall's had said so they would not allow udall to produce any exculpatory evidence which they said was never to be permitted against the crown and they tendered him an oath by which he was required to depose that he was not the author of the book and his refusal to make that deposition was employed as the strongest proof of his guilt it was almost needless to add that notwithstanding these multiplied inequities a verdict of death was given by the jury against udall for as the queen was extremely bent upon his prosecution it was impossible he could escape he died in prison before execution of the sentence the case of penry was if possible still harder this man was a zealous puritan or rather a brownist a small sect which afterwards increased and received the name of independence he had written against the hierarchy several tracts such as martin marprelate thesis martiniae 
and other compositions full of low scurrility and petulant satire after concealing himself for some years he was seized and as the statute against seditious words required that the criminal should be tried within a year after committing the offence he could not be indicted for his printed books he was therefore tried for some papers found in his pocket as if he had thereby scattered sedition it was also imputed to him by the lord keeper puckering that in some of these papers he had only acknowledged her majesty's royal power to establish laws ecclesiastical and civil but had avoided the usual terms of making enacting decreeing and ordaining laws which imply says the lord keeper a most absolute authority penry for these offences was condemned and executed thus we have seen that the most absolute authority of the sovereign to make use of the lord's keeper's expression was established on above twenty branches of prerogative which are now abolished and which were every one of them totally incompatible with the liberty of the subject but what ensured more effectually the slavery of the people than even these branches of prerogative was the established principles of the time which attributed to the prince such an unlimited and indefeasible power as was supposed to be the origin of all law and could be circumscribed by none the homilies published for the use of the clergy and which they were enjoined to read every sunday in all the churches inculcate everywhere a blind and unlimited passive obedience to the prince which on no account and under no pretence is it ever lawful for subjects in the smallest article to depart from or infringe much noise has been made because some court chaplains during the succeeding reigns were permitted to preach such doctrines but there is a great difference between these sermons and discourses published by authority avowed by the prince and council and promulgated to the whole nation so thoroughly were these principles imbibed by the people during the reigns of elizabeth and her predecessors that opposition to them was regarded as the most flagrant sedition and was not even rewarded by the public praise and approbation which can alone support men under such dangers and difficulties as attend the resistance to tyrannical authority it was only during the next generation that the noble principles of liberty took root and spreading themselves under the shelter of puritanical absurdities became fashionable among the people it is worth remarking that the advantage usually ascribed to absolute monarchy a greater regularity of police and a more strict execution of the laws did not attend the former english government though in many respects it fell under that denomination a demonstration of this truth is contained in a judicious paper which is preserved by stripe and which was written by an eminent justice of the peace of somersetshire in the year fifteen ninety six near the end of the queen's reign when the authority of that prince may be supposed to be fully corroborated by time and her maxims of government improved by long practice this paper contains an account of the disorders which then prevailed in the county of somerset the author says that forty persons had there been executed in a year for robberies theft and other felonies thirty-five burnt in the hand thirty-seven whipped one hundred and eighty-three discharged that those who were discharged were most wicked and desperate persons who never could come to any good because they would not work and none would take them into service that notwithstanding this great number of indictments the fifth part of the felonies committed in the country were not brought to trial the greater number escaped censure either from the superior cunning of the felons the remissness of the magistrates or the foolish lenity of the people that the rapines committed by the infinite number of wicked wandering idle people were intolerable to the poor countrymen and obliged them to keep a perpetual watch over their sheepfolds their pastures their woods and their cornfields that the other counties of england were in no better condition than somersetshire and many of them were even worse 
that there were at least three or four hundred able-bodied vagabonds in every county who lived by theft and rapine and who sometimes met in troops to the number of sixty and committed spoil on the inhabitants that if all the felons of this kind were assembled they would be able if reduced to good subjection to give the greatest enemy her majesty has a strong battle and that the magistrates themselves were intimidated from executing the laws upon them and there were instances of justices of the peace who after giving sentences against rogues had interposed to stop the execution of their own sentence on account of the danger which hung over them from the confederates of these felons in the year fifteen seventy five the queen complained in parliament of the bad execution of the laws and threatened that if the magistrates were not for the future more vigilant she would entrust authority to indigent and needy persons who would find an interest in a more exact administration of justice it appears that she was as good as her word for in the year sixteen o one there were great complaints made in parliament for the rapine of justices of the peace and a member said that this magistrate was an animal who for half a dozen of chickens would dispense with a dozen of penal statutes it is not easy to account for this relaxation of government and neglect of police during a reign of so much vigour as that of elizabeth the small revenue of the crown is the most likely cause that can be assigned the queen had it not in her power to interest a great number in assisting her to execute the laws on the whole the english have no reason from the example of their ancestors to be in love with the picture of absolute monarchy or to prefer the unlimited authority of the prince and his unbounded prerogatives to that noble liberty that sweet equality and that happy security by which they are at present distinguished above all nations in the universe the utmost that can be said in favour of the government of that age and perhaps it may be said with truth is that the power of the prince though really unlimited was exercised after the european manner and entered not into every part of the administration that the instances of a high exerted prerogative were not so frequent as to render property sensibly insecure or reduce the people to a total servitude that the freedom from faction the quickness of execution and the promptitude of those measures which could be taken for offence or defence made some compensation for the want of a legal and determinate liberty that as the prince commanded no mercenary army there was a tacit check on him which maintained that the government in that medium to which the people had been accustomed and that this situation of england though seemingly it approached nearer was in reality more remote from a despotic and eastern monarchy than the present government of that kingdom where the people though guarded by multiplied laws are totally naked defenceless and disarmed and besides are not secured by any middle power or independent powerful nobility interposed between them and the monarch we shall close the present appendix with a brief account of the revenues the military force the commerce and the arts and the learning of england during this period queen elizabeth's economy was remarkable and in some instances seemed to border on avarice the smallest expense if it could possibly be spared appeared considerable in her eyes and even the charge of an express during the most delicate transactions was not below her notice she was also attentive to every profit and embraced opportunities of gain which may appear somewhat extraordinary she kept for instance the see of ely vacant nineteen years in order to retain the revenue and it was usual with her when she promoted a bishop to take the opportunity of pillaging the see of some of its manners but that in reality there was little of no avarice in the queen's temper appears from this circumstance that she never amassed any treasure and even refused subsidies from the parliament when she had no present occasion for them yet we must not conclude from this circumstance 
that her economy proceeded from a tender concern for her people she loaded them with monopolies and exclusive patents which are much more oppressive than the most heavy taxes levied in an equal and regular manner the real source of her frugal conduct was derived from her desire of independency and her care to preserve her dignity which would have been endangered had she reduced herself to the necessity of having frequent recourse to parliamentary supplies in consequence of this motive the queen though engaged in successful and necessary wars thought it more prudent to make a continual dilapidation of the royal domains than demand the most moderate supplies from the commons as she lived unmarried and had no posterity she was content to serve her present turn though at the expense of her successors who by reason of this policy joined to other circumstances found themselves on a sudden reduced to the most extreme indigence the splendour of a court was during this age a great part of the public charge and as elizabeth was a single woman and expensive in no kind of magnificence except clothes this circumstance enabled her to perform great things by her narrow revenue she is said to have paid four millions of debt left on her crown by her father brother and sister and an incredible sum for that age the states at the time of her death owed her about eight hundred thousand pounds and the king of france four hundred and fifty thousand though that prince was extremely frugal and after the peace of vervin was continually amassing treasure the queen never could by the most pressing importunities prevail on him to make payment of those sums which she had so generously advanced him during his greatest distresses one payment of twenty thousand crowns and another of fifty thousand were all that she could obtain by the strongest representations she could make of the difficulties to which the rebellion in ireland had reduced her the queen expended on the wars with spain between the years fifteen eighty nine and fifteen ninety three the sum of one million three hundred thousand pounds besides the pittance of a double subsidy amounting to two hundred and eighty thousand pounds granted to her by parliament in the year fifteen ninety nine she spent six hundred thousand pounds in six months on the service of ireland sir robert cecil affirmed that in ten years ireland cost her three millions four hundred thousand pounds she gave the earl of essex a present of thirty thousand pounds upon his departure for the government of that kingdom lord burleigh computed that the value of the gifts conferred on that favoured amounted to three hundred thousand pounds a sum which though probably exaggerated is a proof of her strong affection towards him it was a common saying during the reign the queen pays bountifully though she rewards sparingly end of section forty three appendix three part two recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington Section 44 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D section forty four appendix three part three it is difficult to compute exactly the queen's ordinary revenue but it certainly fell much short of five hundred thousand pounds a year in the year fifteen ninety she raised the customs from fourteen thousand pounds a year to fifty thousand and obliged sir thomas smith who had farmed them to refund some of his former profits this improvement of the revenue was owing to the suggestions of one Carmarthen, and was opposed by Burley, Leicester, and Walsingham. But the Queen's perseverance overcame all their opposition. The great undertakings which she executed with so narrow a revenue, and with such small supplies from her people, prove the mighty effects of wisdom and economy. She received from the Parliament, during the course of her whole reign, only twenty subsidies 
and thirty-nine fifteenths. I pretend not to determine exactly the amount of these supplies, because the value of a subsidy was continually falling, and in the end of her reign it amounted only to eighty thousand pounds, though in the beginning it had been a hundred and twenty thousand. If we suppose that the supplies granted Elizabeth during a reign of forty-five years amounted to three millions, we shall not probably be much wide of the truth. This sum makes only sixty-six thousand six hundred and sixty-six pounds a year, and it is surprising that while the Queen's demands were so moderate and her expenses so well regulated, she should ever have found any difficulty in obtaining a supply from Parliament or be reduced to make sale of crown lands. But such was the extreme, I had almost said, absurd parsimony of the Parliaments during that period. They valued nothing in comparison of their money. The members had no connection with the court, and the very idea which they conceived of the trust committed to them was to reduce the demands of the crown and to grant as few supplies as possible. The crown, on the other hand, conceived the parliament in no other light than as a means of supply. Queen Elizabeth made a merit to her people of seldom summoning parliaments. No redress of grievances was expected from these assemblies. They were supposed to meet for no other purpose than to impose taxes. Before the reign of Elizabeth, the English princes had usually recourse to the city of Antwerp for voluntary loans, and their credit was so low that, besides paying the high interest of ten or twelve per cent, they were obliged to make the city of London join in the security. Sir Thomas Gresham, that great and enterprising merchant, one of the chief ornaments of this reign, engaged the company of merchant adventurers to grant a loan to the queen, and as the money was regularly repaid, her credit by degrees established itself in the city, and she shook off this dependence on foreigners. In the year 1559, however, the queen employed Gresham to borrow for her 200,000 pounds at Antwerp in order to enable her to reform the coin, which was at that time extremely debased. She was so impolitic as to make herself an innovation in the coin by dividing a pound of silver into 62 shillings instead of 60, the former standard. This is the last time the coin has been tampered with in England. Queen Elizabeth, sensible how much the defense of her kingdom depended on its naval power, was desirous to encourage commerce and navigation, but as her monopolies tended to extinguish all domestic industry, which is much more valuable than foreign trade, and is the foundation of it, the general train of her conduct was ill-calculated to serve the purpose at which she aimed, much less to promote the riches of her people. The exclusive companies also were an immediate check on foreign trade. Yet notwithstanding these discouragements, the spirit of the age was strongly bent on naval enterprises, and besides the military expeditions against the Spaniards, many attempts were made for new discoveries, and many new branches of foreign commerce were opened by the English. Sir Martin Frobisher undertook three fruitless voyages to discover the Northwest Passage. Davis, not discouraged by this ill success, made a new attempt when he discovered the strait which passed by his name. In the year 1600, the Queen granted the first patent to the East India Company. The stock of that company was 72,000 pounds, and they fitted out four ships under the command of James Lancaster for this new branch of trade. The adventure was successful, and the ships returning with a rich cargo encouraged the company to continue the commerce. The communication with Muscovy had been opened in Queen Mary's time by the discovery of the passage to Archangel, but the commerce to that country did not begin to be carried out in a great extent till about the year 1569. The Queen obtained from the Tsar an exclusive patent to the English for the whole trade of Muscovy, and she entered into a personal as well as national alliance with him. This Tsar was named John Basalides, a furious tyrant who, 
continually suspecting the revolt of his subjects, stipulated to have a safe retreat and protection in England. In order the better to ensure this resource, he proposed to marry an Englishwoman, and the Queen intended to have sent him Lady Anne Hastings, daughter of the Earl of Huntington. But when the lady was informed of the barbarous manners of the country, she wisely declined purchasing an empire at the expense of her ease and safety. The English, encouraged by the privileges which they had obtained from facilities, ventured farther into those countries than any Europeans had formerly done. They transported their goods along the river Dinwa in boats made of one entire tree which they towed and rowed up the stream as far as Walgoda. Thence they carried their commodities seven days' journey by land to Yersula, and then down the Volga to Astrakhan. At Astrakhan they built ships, crossed the Caspian Sea, and distributed their manufactures into Persia. But this bold attempt met with such discouragements that it was never renewed. After the death of John Basilides, his son Theodore revoked the patent which the English enjoyed for a monopoly of the Russian trade. When the Queen remonstrated against this innovation, he told her ministers that princes must carry an indifferent hand as well between their subjects as between foreigners, and not convert trade, which by the laws of nations ought to be common to all, into a monopoly for the private gain of a few. So much juster notions of commerce were entertained by this barbarian than appear in the conduct of the renowned Queen Elizabeth. Theodore, however, continued some privileges to the English on account of their being the discoverers of the communications between Europe and his country. The trade to Turkey commenced about the year 1583, and that commerce was immediately confined to a company by Queen Elizabeth. Before that time, the Grand Seigneur had always conceived England to be a dependent province of France, but having heard of the Queen's power and reputation, he gave a good reception to the English, and even granted them larger privileges than he had given to the French. The merchants of the Hansi towns complained loudly in the beginning of Elizabeth's reign of the treatment which they had received in the reigns of Edward and Mary. She prudently replied that as she would not innovate anything, she would still protect them in the immunities and privileges of which she found them possessed. This answer not contenting them, their commerce was soon after suspended for a time to the great advantage of the English merchants, who tried what they could themselves effect for promoting their commerce. They took the whole trade into their own hands, and their returns proving successful, they divided themselves into staplers and merchant adventurers, the former residing constantly at one place, the latter trying their fortunes in other towns and states abroad with cloth and other manufacturers. This success so enraged the Hansi towns that they tried all the methods which a discontented people could devise to draw upon the English merchants the ill opinion of other nations and states. They prevailed so far as to obtain an imperial edict by which the English were prohibited all commerce in the empire. The queen, by way of retaliation, retained sixty of their ships, which had been seized in the river Tagus, with contraband goods of the Spaniards. These ships the queen intended to have restored, as desiring to have compromised all differences with those trading cities but when she was informed that a great assembly was held at Lubeck in order to concert measures for distressing the English trade, she caused the ships and cargoes to be confiscated. Only two of them were released to carry home the news and to inform these states that she had the greatest contempt imaginable for all their proceedings. Henry the Eighth, in order to fit out a navy, was obliged to hire ships from Hamburg, Lubeck, Danzig, Genoa, and Venice. But Elizabeth, very early in her reign, put affairs upon a better footing, both by building some ships of her own and by encouraging the merchants to build large trading vessels, which on occasion were converted into ships of war. 
in the year 1582, the seamen in England were found to be 14,295 men, the number of vessels 1,232, of which there were only 217 above 80 tons. Monson pretends that though navigation decayed in the first years of James I by the practice of the merchants who carried on their trade in foreign bottoms, yet before the year 1640, this number of seamen was tripled in England. The navy which the Queen left at her decease appears considerable when we reflect only on the number of vessels, which were 42, but when we consider that none of these ships carried above 40 guns, and that four only came up to that number, that there were but two ships of a thousand tons, and twenty-three below five hundred, some of fifty, and some even twenty tons, and that the whole number of guns belonging to the fleet was seven hundred and seventy-four, we must entertain a contemptible idea of the English navy, compared to the force which it has now attained. In the year 1588, there were not above five vessels fitted out by the noblemen and seaports, which exceeded two hundred tons. In the year 1575, all the militia in the kingdom were computed at a hundred and eighty-two thousand nine hundred and twenty-nine. A distribution was made in the year 1595 of a hundred and forty thousand men, besides those which Wales could supply. These armies were formidable by their numbers, but their discipline and experience were not proportionate. Small bodies from Dunkirk and Newport frequently ran over and plundered the east coast. So unfit was the militia, as it was then constituted, for the defense of the kingdom. The Lord Lieutenants were first appointed to the counties in this reign. Mr. Murden has published from the Salisbury Collection a paper which contains the military force of the nation at the time of the Spanish Armada, and which is somewhat different from the account given by our ordinary historians. It makes all the able-bodied men of the kingdom amount to a hundred and eleven thousand five hundred and thirteen, those armed to eighty thousand eight hundred and seventy-five, of whom forty thousand seven hundred and twenty-seven were trained. It must be supposed that these able-bodied men consisted of such only as were registered, otherwise the small number is not to be accounted for. Yet Sir Edward Coke said in the House of Commons that he was employed about the same time, together with Poppenham, Chief Justice, to take a survey of all the people of England, and that they found them to be 900,000 of all sorts. This number, by the ordinary rules of computation, supposes that there were above 200,000 men able to bear arms. Yet even this number is surprisingly small. Can we suppose that the kingdom is six or seven times more populous at present, and that Murden's was the real number of men, excluding Catholics and children and infirm persons? Harrison says, that in the musters taken in the year 1574 and 1575, the men fit for service amounted to 1,172,674. Yet was it believed that a full third was admitted. Such uncertainty and contradiction are there in all these accounts. Notwithstanding the greatness of this number, the same author complains much of the decay of the populousness a vulgar complaint in all places and all ages. Guicciardini makes the inhabitants of England in this reign amount to two million. Whatever opinion we may form of the comparative populace of England in different periods, it must be allowed that, abstracting from the national debt, there is a prodigious increase of power in that, more perhaps than in any other European state, since the beginning of the last century. It would be no paradox to affirm that Ireland alone could, at present, exert a greater force than all the three kingdoms were capable of at the death of Queen Elizabeth. We might go further and assert that one good county in England is able to make, at least to support, a greater effort than the whole kingdom was capable of in the reign of Henry V, when the maintenance of a garrison in a small town like Calais formed more than a third of the ordinary national expense. 
such are the effects of liberty, industry, and good government. The state of the English manufacturers was at this time very low, and foreign wares of almost all kinds had preference. About the year 1590, there were in London four persons only rated in the subsidy books so high as 400 pounds. This computation is not indeed to be deemed an extract estimate of their wealth. In 1567, there were found, on inquiry, to be 4,851 strangers of all nations in London, of whom 3,838 were Flemings and only 58 Scots. The persecution in France and the Low Countries drove afterwards a greater number of foreigners into England, and the commerce, as well as manufactures of that kingdom, was very much improved by them. It was then that Sir Thomas Gresham built, at his own charge, the magnificent fabric of the exchange for the reception of the merchants. The queen visited it and gave it the appellation of the Royal Exchange. By a lucky accident in language, which has a great effect on men's ideas, the invidious word usury, which formerly meant the taking of any interest for money, came now to express only the taking of exorbitant and illegal interest. An act passed in 1571 violently condemns all usury, but permits 10% interest to be paid. Henry IV of France reduced interest to 6.5%, an indication of the great advance of France above England in commerce. Dr. Howell says that Queen Elizabeth, in the third of her reign, was presented with a pair of black silk knit stockings by her silk woman, and never wore cloth hose any more. The author of the present state of England says that about 1577, pocket watches were first brought into England from Germany. They are thought to have been invented at Nuremberg. About 1580, the use of coaches was introduced by the Earl of Arundel. Before that time, the Queen, on public occasions, rode behind her chamberlain. Camden says that in 1581, Randolph, so much employed by the Queen in foreign embassies, possessed the office of Postmaster General of England. It appears, therefore, that posts were then established, though from Charles I's regulations in 1635, it would seem that few post houses were erected before that time. In a remonstrance of the Hansi towns to the Diet of the Empire in 1582, it is affirmed that England exported annually about 200,000 pieces of cloth. This number seems to be much exaggerated. In the fifth of this reign was enacted the first law for the relief of the poor. A judicious author of that age confirms the vulgar observation that the kingdom was depopulating from the increase of enclosures and decay of tillage, and he ascribes the reason very justly to the restraints put on the exportation of corn, while full liberty was allowed to export all the produce of pasturage, such as wool, hides, leather, and tallow, etc. These prohibitions of exportation were derived from the prerogative, and were very injudicious. The queen, once on the commencement of her reign, had tried a contrary practice and with good success. From the same author we learn that the complaints renewed in our time were then very uncommon concerning the high prices of everything. There were two attempts made in this reign to settle colonies in America, one by Sir Humphrey Gilbert in Newfoundland, another by Sir Walter Raleigh in Virginia, but neither of these projects proved successful. All those noble settlements were made in the following reigns. The current specie of the kingdom in the end of this reign is computed at four millions. The Earl of Leicester desired Sir Francis Walsingham, then ambassador to France, to provide him with a writing master in that country, to whom he promises a hundred pounds a year, besides maintaining himself and servant and a couple of horses. I know, adds the Earl, that such a man as I want may receive higher wages in France, but let him consider that a shilling in England goes as far as two shillings in France. It is known that everything is much changed since that time. The nobility of this age still supported, in some degree, the ancient magnificence 
in their hospitality and in the number of their retainers, and the queen found it prudent to retrench by proclamation their expenses in this particular. The expense of hospitality she somewhat encouraged by the frequent visits she paid her nobility and the sumptuous feasts which she received from them. End of section 44, appendix 3, part 3. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 45 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D section 45 appendix 3 part 4 harrison after enumerating the queen's palaces adds but what shall i need to take upon me to repeat all and to tell what houses the queen's majesty's hath sith all is hers and when it pleases her in the summer season to recreate herself abroad and view the estate of the country and hear the complaints of her poor commons injured by her unjust officers or their substitutes every nobleman's house is her palace where she continueth during pleasure and tell her an entertainment in kenilworth castle which was extraordinary for expense and magnificence among other particulars we are told that three hundred and sixty-five hogsheads of beer were drunk at it the earl had fortified this castle at great expense and it contained arms for ten thousand men the earl of derby had a family consisting of two hundred and forty servants stowe remarks it as a singular proof of beneficence in this nobleman that he was contented with his rent from his tenants and exacted not any extraordinary services from them a proof that the great power of the sovereign what was almost unavoidable had very generally countenanced the nobility in tyrannizing over the people. Burley, though he was frugal and had no paternal estate, kept a family consisting of a hundred servants. He had a standing table for gentlemen and two other tables for persons of meaner condition, which were always served alike whether he were in town or in country. About his person he had people of great distinction insomuch that he could reckon up twenty gentlemen retainers who had each a thousand pounds a year and as many among his ordinary servants who were worth from a thousand pounds to three five ten and twenty thousand pounds it is to be remarked that though the revenues of the crown were at that time very small the ministers and courtiers sometimes found means by employing the boundless prerogative to acquire greater fortunes than it is possible for them at present to amass from their larger salaries and more limited authority. Burley entertained the queen twelve several times in his country house, where she remained three, four, or five weeks at a time. Each visit cost him two or three thousand pounds. The quantity of silver plate possessed by this nobleman is surprising, no less than fourteen or fifteen thousand pounds weight, which besides the fashion would be above forty two thousand pounds sterling in value yet burley left only four thousand pounds a year in land and eleven thousand pounds in money and as land was then commonly sold at ten years purchase this plate was nearly equal to all the rest of his fortune it appears that little value was then put upon the fashion of the plate which probably was but rude the weight was chiefly considered but though there were preserved great remains of the ancient customs the nobility were by degrees acquiring a taste for elegant luxury and many edifices in particular were built by them neat large and sumptuous to the great ornament of the kingdom says camden but to the no less decay of the glorious hospitality of the nation it is however more reasonable to think that this new turn of expense promoted arts and industry 
while the ancient hospitality was the source of vice, disorder, sedition, and idleness. Among the other species of luxury that of apparel began to increase during this age, and the queen thought proper to restrain it by proclamation. Her example was very little comfortable to her edicts, as no woman was ever more conceited of her beauty, or more desirous of making impression on the hearts of beholders. No one ever went to greater extravagance in apparel, or studied more the variety and richness of her dresses. She appeared almost every day in a different habit, and tried all the several modes by which she hoped to render herself agreeable. She was also so fond of her clothes that she never could part with any of them, and at her death she had in her wardrobe all the different habits to the number of three thousand which she had ever worn in her lifetime. The retrenchment of the ancient hospitality and the diminution of retainers were favorable to the prerogative of the sovereign, and by disabling the great noblemen from their resistance, promoted the execution of the laws and extended the authority of the courts of justice. There were many peculiar causes in the situation and character of Henry the Seventh which augmented the authority of the crown. Most of these causes concurred in succeeding princes, together with the factions in religion and the acquisition of the supremacy, a most important article of prerogative, but the manners of the age were a general cause which operated during this whole period and which continually tended to diminish the riches, and still more the influence of the aristocracy, anciently so formidable to the crown. The habits of luxury dissipated the immense fortunes of the ancient barons, and as the new methods of expense gave subsistence to mechanics and merchants who lived in an independent manner on the fruits of their own industry, a nobleman, instead of that unlimited ascendant which he was wont to assume over those who were maintained at his board or subsisted by salaries conferred on them, retained only that moderate influence which customers have over tradesmen and which can never be dangerous to civil government. The landed proprietors also, having a greater demand for money than for men, endeavored to turn their lands to the best account with regard to profit, and either enclosing their fields or joining many small farms into a few large ones, dismissed those useless hands which formerly were always at their call in every attempt to subvert the government or oppose a neighboring baron. By these means the cities increased. The middle rank of men began to be rich and powerful. The prince, who in effect was the same with the law, was implicitly obeyed, and though the further progress of the same causes begat a new plan of liberty, founded on the privileges of the commons, yet in the interval between the fall of the nobles and the rise of this order, the sovereign took advantage of the present situation and assumed an authority almost absolute. Whatever may be commonly imagined from the authority of Lord Bacon, and from that of Harrington and later authors, the laws of Henry the Seventh contributed very little towards the great revolution which happened about this period in the English Constitution. The practice of breaking entails by a fine and recovery had been introduced in the preceding reigns, and this prince only gave indirectly a legal sanction to the practice by reforming some abuses which attended it. But the settled authority which he acquired to the crown enabled the sovereign to encroach on the separate jurisdictions of the barons, and produced a more general and regular execution of the laws. The county's palatine underwent the same fate as the feudal powers, and by a statute of Henry the Seventh, the jurisdiction of these counties was annexed to the crown, and all writs were ordained to run in the king's name. But the change of manners was the chief cause of the secret revolution of government, and subverted the power of the barons. There appear still, in this reign, some remains of the ancient slavery of the boors and peasants, but none afterwards. Learning, on its revival, was held in high estimation by the English princes and nobles, and as it was not yet prostituted by being too common, even the great deemed it an object of ambition to obtain a character for literature. 
the four successive sovereigns, Henry, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth, may on one account or the other be admitted into the class of authors. Queen Catherine Parr translated a book, Lady Jane Grey, considering her age and her sex and her station, may be regarded as a prodigy of literature. Sir Thomas Smith was raised from being professor in Cambridge, first to be ambassador of France, then secretary of state. The dispatches of those times, and among others those of Burley himself, are frequently interlarded with quotations from the Greek and Latin classics. Even the ladies of the court valued themselves on knowledge. Lady Burley, Lady Bacon, and their two sisters were mistresses of the ancient as well as modern languages, and placed more pride in their erudition than in their rank and quality. Queen Elizabeth wrote and translated several books, and she was familiarly acquainted with the Greek as well as with the Latin tongue. It is pretended that she made an extemporary reply in Greek to the University of Cambridge, who had addressed her in that language. It is certain that she answered in Latin without premeditation, and in a very spirited manner to the Polish ambassador, who had been wanting in respect to her. When she had finished, she turned about to her courtiers and said, God's death, my lords, for she was much addicted to swearing. I have been forced this day to scour up my old Latin that hath long lain rusting. Elizabeth, even after she was queen, did not entirely drop the ambition of appearing as an author, and next to her desire of admiration for beauty, this seems to have been the chief object of her vanity. She translated Boethius, of the consolation of philosophy, in order, as she pretended, to allay her grief for Henry the Fourth's change of religion. As far as we can judge from Elizabeth's compositions, we may pronounce that, notwithstanding her application and her excellent parts, her taste in literature was but indifferent, and she was much inferior to her successor in this particular, who was himself no perfect model of eloquence. Unhappily for literature, at least for the learned of this age, the queen's vanity lay more in shining by her own learning than in encouraging men of genius by her liberality. Spencer himself, the finest English writer of his age, was long neglected, and after the death of Sir Philip Sidney, his patron, was allowed to die almost for want. This poet contains great beauties, a sweet and harmonious versification, easy elocution, and a fine imagination, yet does the perusal of his work become so tedious that one never finishes it from the mere pleasure which it affords. It soon becomes a kind of task-reading, and it requires some effort and resolution to carry us on to the end of his long performance. This effect, of which every one is conscious, is usually ascribed to the change of manners but manners have more changed since Homer's age, and yet that poet remains still the favorite of every reader of taste and judgment. Homer copied true natural manners, which, however rough or uncultivated, will always form an agreeable and interesting picture. But the pencil of the English poet was employed in drawing the affectations and conceits and fopperies of chivalry, which appear ridiculous as soon as they lose the recommendation of the mode. The tediousness of continued allegory, and that, too seldom striking or ingenious, has also contributed to render the fairy queen particularly tiresome, not to mention the too great frequency of its descriptions and the languor of its stanza. Upon the whole, Spencer maintains his place upon the shelves among our English classics, but he is seldom seen on the table, and there is scarcely any one, if he dares to be ingenuous, but will confess that notwithstanding all the merit of the poet, he affords an entertainment which the palate is soon satiated. Several writers of late have amused themselves in copying the style of Spencer, and no imitation has been so indifferent as not to bear a great resemblance to the original. His manner is so peculiar that it is almost impossible not to transfer some of it into the copy. End of section 45 Appendix 3, Part 4 Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington
Section 46 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one d section forty six chapter forty five part one james the first the crown of england was never transmitted from father to son with greater tranquillity than it passed from the family of tudor to that of stuart during the whole reign of elizabeth the eyes of men had been employed in search of her successor and when old age made the prospect of her death more immediate there appeared none but the king of scots who could advance any just claim or pretension to the throne he was great-grandson of margaret elder daughter of henry the seventh and on the failure of the male line his hereditary right remained unquestionable if the religion of mary queen of scots and the other prejudices contracted against her had formed any considerable obstacle to her succession these objections being entirely personal had no place with regard to her son men also considered that though the title derived from blood had been frequently violated since the norman conquest such licenses had proceeded more from force or intrigue than from any deliberate maxims of government the lineal heir had still in the end prevailed and both his exclusion and restoration had been commonly attended with such convulsions as were sufficient to warn all prudent men not likely to give way to such irregularities if the will of henry the eighth authorized by act of parliament had tacitly excluded the scottish line the tyranny and caprices of that monarch had been so signal that a settlement of this nature unsupported by any just reason had no authority with the people queen elizabeth too with her dying breath had recognized the undoubted title of her kinsman james and the whole nation seemed to dispose themselves with joy and pleasure for his reception though born and educated amidst a foreign and hostile people men hoped from his character of moderation and wisdom that he would embrace the maxims of an english monarch and the prudent foresaw greater advantages resulting from a union with scotland than disadvantages from submitting to a prince of that nation the alacrity with which the english looked towards the successor had appeared so evident to elizabeth that concurring with other causes it affected her with the deepest melancholy and that wise princess whose penetration and experience had given her the greatest insight into human affairs had not yet sufficiently weighed the ingratitude of courtiers and levity of the people as victory abroad and tranquillity at home had attended this princess she left the nation in such flourishing circumstances that her successor possessed every advantage except that of comparison with her illustrious name when he mounted the throne of england the king's journey from edinburgh to london immediately afforded to the inquisitive some circumstances of comparison which even the natural partiality in favour of their new sovereign could not interpret to his advantage as he passed along all ranks of men flocked about him from every quarter allured by interest or curiosity great were the rejoicings and loud and hearty the acclamations which resounded from all sides and every one could remember how the affability and popular manners of their queen displayed themselves amidst such concourse and exultation of her subjects but james though sociable and familiar with his friends and courtiers hated the bustle of a mixed multitude and though far from disliking flattery yet was he still fonder of tranquillity and ease 
he issued therefore a proclamation forbidding this resort of people on pretence of the scarcity of provisions and other inconveniences which he said would necessarily attend it he was not however insensible to the great flow of affection which appeared in his new subjects and being himself of an affectionate temper he seemed to have been in haste to make them some return of kindness and good offices to this motive probably we are to ascribe that profusion of titles which was observed in the beginning of his reign when in six weeks time after his entrance into the kingdom he is computed to have bestowed knighthood on no less than two hundred and thirty-seven persons if elizabeth's frugality of honours as well as of money had formerly been repined at it began now to be valued and esteemed and every one was sensible that the king by his lavish and premature conferring of favours had failed of obliging the persons on whom he bestowed them titles of all kinds became so common that they were scarcely marks of distinction and being distributed without choice or deliberation to persons unknown to the prince were regarded more as the proofs of facility and good nature than of any determined friendship or esteem a pasquinade was affixed to st paul's in which an art was promised to be taught very necessary to assist frail memories in retaining the names of the new nobility we may presume that the english would have thrown less blame on the king's facility in bestowing favours had these been confined entirely to their own nation and had not been shared out in too unequal proportions to his old subjects james who through his whole reign was more guided by temper and inclination than by the rules of political prudence had brought with him great numbers of his scottish courtiers whose impatience and importunity were apt in many particulars to impose on the easy nature of their master and extort favours of which it is natural to imagine his english subjects would loudly complain the duke of lennox the earl of mar lord hume lord kinloss sir george hume secretary elphinstone were immediately added to the english privy council sir george hume whom he created earl of dunbar was his declared favourite as long as that nobleman lived and was one of the wisest and most virtuous though the least powerful of all those whom the king ever honoured with that distinction hay some time after was created viscount doncaster then earl of carlisle and got an immense fortune from the crown all which he spent in a splendid and courtly manner ramsay obtained the title of earl of holderness and many others being raised on a sudden to the highest elevation increased by their insolence that envy which naturally attended them as strangers and ancient enemies it must however be owned in justice to james that he left almost all the chief officers in the hands of elizabeth's ministers and trusted the conduct of political concerns both foreign and domestic to his english subjects among these secretary cecil created successively lord effenden viscount cranbourne and earl of salisbury was always regarded as his prime minister and chief counsellor though the capacity and penetration of this minister were sufficiently known his favour with the king created surprise on the accession of that monarch the secret correspondence into which he had entered with james and which had sensibly contributed to the easy reception of that prince in england laid the foundation of cecil's credit and while all his former associates sir walter raleigh lord grey lord cobham were discountenanced on account of their animosity against essex as well as for other reasons this minister was continued in employment and treated with the greatest confidence and regard the capacity of james and his ministers in negotiation was immediately put to trial on the appearance of ambassadors from almost all the princes and states of europe in order to congratulate him on his accession and form with him 
new treaties and alliances besides ministers from venice denmark the palatinate henry frederick of nassau assisted by barnefeld the pensionary of holland was ambassador from the states of the united provinces aremberg was sent by archduke albert and taxis was expected in a little time from spain but he who most excited the attention of the public both on account of his own merit and that of his master was the marquis of rosny afterwards duke of sully prime minister and favourite of henry the fourth of france when the dominions of the house of austria devolved on philip the second all europe was struck with terror lest the power of a family which had been raised by fortune should now be carried to an immeasurable height by the wisdom and conduct of this monarch but never were apprehensions found in the event to be more groundless slow without prudence ambitious without enterprise false without deceiving anybody and refined without any true judgment such was the character of philip and such the character which during his lifetime and after his death he impressed on the spanish councils revolted or depopulated provinces discontented or indolent inhabitants were the spectacles which those dominions lying in every climate of the globe presented to philip the third a weak prince and to the duke of lerma a minister weak and odious but though military discipline which still remained was what alone gave some appearance of life and vigour to that languishing body yet so great was the terror produced by former power and ambition that the reduction of the house of austria was the object of men's vows throughout all the states of christendom it was not perceived that the french empire now united in domestic peace and governed by the most heroic and most amiable prince that adorns modern story was become of itself a sufficient counterpoise to the spanish greatness perhaps that prince himself did not perceive it when he proposed by his minister a league with james in conjunction with venice the united provinces and the northern crowns in order to attack the austrian dominions on every side and depress the exorbitant power of that ambitious family but the genius of the english monarch was not equal to such vast enterprises the love of peace was his ruling passion and it was his peculiar felicity that the conjectures of the times rendered the same object which was agreeable to him in the highest degree advantageous to his people the french ambassador therefore was obliged to depart from these extensive views and to concert with james the means of providing for the safety of the united provinces nor was this object altogether without its difficulties the king before his accession had entertained scruples with regard to the revolt of the low countries and being commonly open and sincere he had on many occasions gone so far as to give the dutch the appellation of rebels but having conversed more fully with english ministers and courtiers he found their attachment to that republic so strong and their opinion of common interests so established that he was obliged to sacrifice to politics his sense of justice a quality which even when erroneous is respectable as well as rare in a monarch he therefore agreed with rosny to support secretly the states-general in concert with the king of france lest their weakness and despair should oblige them to submit to their old master the articles of the treaty were few and simple it was stipulated that the two kings should allow the dutch to levy forces in their respective dominions and should underhand remit to that republic the sum of one million four hundred thousand livres a year for the pay of these forces that the whole sum should be advanced by the king of france but that the third of it should be deducted from the debt due by him to queen elizabeth and if the spaniards attacked either of the princes they agreed to assist each other henry with a force of ten thousand men james with that of six 
this treaty one of the wisest and most equitable concluded by james during the course of his reign was more the work of the prince himself than any of his ministers amidst the great tranquillity both foreign and domestic with which the nation was blessed nothing could be more surprising than the discovery of a conspiracy to subvert the government and to fix on the throne arabella stuart a near relation of the king's by the family of lennox and descended equally from henry the seventh everything remains still mysterious in this conspiracy and history can give us no clue to unravel it watson and clark two catholic priests were accused of the plot lord grey a puritan lord cobham a thoughtless man of no fixed principle and sir walter raleigh suspected to be of that philosophical sect who were then extremely rare in england and who have since received the appellation of free thinkers together with these mr broke brother to lord cobham sir griffin markham mr copley sir edward parham what cement could unite men of such discordant principles in so dangerous a combination what end they proposed or what means proportion to an undertaking of this nature has never yet been explained and cannot easily be imagined as raleigh grey and cobham were commonly believed after the queen's death to have opposed proclaiming the king till conditions should be made with him they were upon that account extremely obnoxious to the court and ministry and people were apt at first to suspect that the plot was merely a contrivance of secretary cecil to get rid of his old confederates now become his most inveterate enemies but the confession as well as trial of the criminals put the matter beyond doubt and though no one could find any marks of a concerted enterprise it appeared that men of furious and ambitious spirits meeting frequently together and believing all the world discontented like themselves had entertained very criminal projects and had even entered some of them at least into a correspondence with arlenberg the flemish ambassador in order to give disturbance to the new settlement the two priests and broke were executed cobham grey and markham were pardoned after they had laid their heads upon the block raleigh too was reprieved not pardoned and he remained in confinement many years afterwards it appears from sully's memoirs that raleigh secretly offered his services to the french ambassador and we may thence presume that meeting with a repulse from that quarter he had recourse for the same unwarrantable purposes to the flemish minister such a conjecture we are now enabled to form but it must be confessed that on his trial there appeared no proof of this transaction nor indeed any circumstance which could justify his condemnation he was accused by cobham alone in a sudden fit of passion upon hearing that raleigh when examined had pointed out some circumstances by which cobham's guilt might be known and ascertained this accusation cobham afterwards retracted and soon after he retracted his retraction yet upon the written evidence of this single witness a man of no honour or understanding and so contradictory in his testimony not confronted with raleigh not supported by any concurring circumstance was that great man contrary to all law and equity found guilty by the jury his name was at that time extremely odious in england and every man was pleased to give sentence against the capital enemy of essex the favourite of the people sir edward coke the famous lawyer then attorney-general managed the cause for the crown and threw out on raleigh such gross abuse as may be deemed a great reflection not only on his own memory but even in some degree on the manners of the age traitor monster viper and spider of hell are the terms which he employs against one of the most illustrious men of the kingdom who was under trial for life and fortune and who defended himself with temper eloquence and courage 
the next occupation of the king was entirely according to his heart's content he was employed in dictating magisterially to an assembly of divines concerning points of faith and discipline and in receiving the applauses of these holy men for his superior zeal and learning the religious disputes between the church and the puritans had induced him to call a conference at hampton court on pretence of finding expedients which might reconcile both parties though the severities of elizabeth towards the catholics had much weakened that party whose genius was opposite to the prevailing spirit of the nation like severities had had so little influence on the puritans who were encouraged by that spirit that no less than seven hundred and fifty clergymen of that party signed a petition to the king on his accession and many more seemed willing to adhere to it they all hoped that james having received his education in scotland and having sometimes professed an attachment to the church established there would at least abate the rigour of the laws enacted in support of the ceremonies and against puritans if he did not show more particular grace and encouragement to that sect but the king's disposition had taken strongly a contrary bias the more he knew the puritanical clergy the less favour he bore to them he had remarked in their scottish brethren a violent turn towards republicanism and a zealous attachment to civil liberty principles nearly allied to that religious enthusiasm with which they were actuated he had found that being mostly persons of low birth and mean education the same lofty pretensions which attended them in their familiar addresses to their maker of whom they believed themselves the peculiar favourites induced them to use the utmost freedoms with their earthly sovereign in both capacities of monarch and of theologian he had experienced the little complaisance which they were disposed to show him whilst they controlled his commands disputed his tenets and to his face before the whole people censured his conduct and behaviour if he had submitted to the indignity of courting their favour he treasured up on that account the stronger resentment against them and was determined to make them feel in their turn the weight of his authority though he had often met with resistance and faction and obstinacy in the scottish nobility he retained no ill-will to that order or rather showed them favour and kindness in england beyond what reason and sound policy could well justify but the ascendant which the presbyterian clergy had assumed over him was what his monarchical pride could never thoroughly digest he dreaded likewise the popularity which attended this order of men in both kingdoms as useless austerities and self-denial are imagined in many religions to render us acceptable to a benevolent being who created us solely for happiness james remarked that the rustic severity of these clergymen and of their whole sect had given them in the eyes of the multitude the appearance of sanctity and virtue strongly inclined himself to mirth and wine and sports of all kinds he apprehended their censure for his manner of life free and disengaged and being thus averse from temper as well as policy to the sect of puritans he was resolved if possible to prevent its further growth in england but it was the character of james's counsels throughout his whole reign that they were more wise and equitable in their end than prudent and political in the means though justly sensible that no part of civil administration required greater care or a nicer judgment than the conduct of religious parties he had not perceived that in the same proportion as this practical knowledge of theology is requisite the speculative refinements in it are mean and even dangerous in a monarch 
by entering zealously into frivolous disputes james gave them an air of importance and dignity which they could not otherwise have acquired and being himself enlisted in the quarrel he could no longer have recourse to contempt and ridicule the only proper method of appeasing it the church of england had not yet abandoned the rigid doctrines of grace and predestination the puritans had not yet separated themselves from the church nor openly renounced episcopacy though the spirit of the parties was considerably different the only appearing subjects of dispute were concerning the cross in baptism the ring in marriage the use of the surplice and the bowing at the name of jesus these were the mighty questions which were solemnly agitated in the conference at hampton court between some bishops and dignified clergymen on the one hand and some leaders of the puritanical party on the other the king and his ministers being present end of section forty six chapter forty five part one recording by asterix Section 47 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one d section forty seven chapter forty five part two the puritans were here so unreasonable as to complain of a partial and unfair management of the dispute as if the search after truth were in any degree the object of such conferences and a candid indifference so rare even among private inquirers in philosophical questions could ever be expected among princes and prelates in a theological controversy the king it must be confessed from the beginning of the conference showed the strongest propensity to the established church and frequently inculcated a maxim which though it has some foundation is to be received with great limitations no bishop no king the bishops in their turn were very liberal of their praises towards the royal disputant and the archbishop of canterbury said that undoubtedly his majesty spake by the special assistance of god's spirit a few alterations in the liturgy were agreed to and both parties separated with mutual dissatisfaction it had frequently been the practice of the puritans to form certain assemblies which they called prophesyings where alternately as moved by the spirit they displayed their pious zeal in prayers and exhortations and raised their own enthusiasm as well as that of their audience to the highest pitch from that social contagion which has so mighty an influence on holy fervours and from the mutual emulation which arose in those trials of religious eloquence such dangerous societies had been suppressed by elizabeth and the ministers in this conference moved the king for their revival but james sharply replied if you aim at a scottish presbytery it agrees as well with monarchy as god and the devil there jack and tom and will and dick shall meet and censure me and my counsel therefore i reiterate my former speech le roi s'avisera stay i pray for one seven years before you demand and then if you find me grow pursy and fat i may perchance hearken unto you for that government will keep me in breath and give me work enough such were the political considerations which determined the king in his choice among religious parties the next assembly in which james displayed his learning and eloquence was one that showed more spirit of liberty than appeared among his bishops and theologians 
the parliament was now ready to assemble being so long delayed on account of the plague which had broken out in london and raged to such a degree that above thirty thousand persons are computed to have died of it in a year though the city contained at that time little more than one hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants the speech which the king made on opening the parliament fully displays his character and proves him to have possessed more knowledge and better parts than prudence or any just sense of decorum and propriety though few productions of the age surpass this performance either in style or matter it wants that majestic brevity and reserve which become a king in his addresses to the great council of the nation it contains however a remarkable stroke of candour where he confesses his too great facility in yielding to the solicitations of suitors a fault which he promises to correct but which adhered to him and distressed him during the whole course of his reign the first business in which the commons were engaged was of the utmost importance to the preservation of their privileges and neither temper nor resolution was wanting in their conduct of it in the former periods of the english government the house of commons was of so small weight in the balance of the constitution that little attention had been given either by the crown the people or the house itself to the choice and continuance of the members it had been usual after parliaments were prolonged beyond one session for the chancellor to exert a discretionary authority of issuing new writs to supply the place of any members whom he judged incapable of attending either on account of their employment their sickness or other impediment this practice gave that minister and consequently the prince an unlimited power of modelling at pleasure the representatives of the nation yet so little jealousy had it created that the commons of themselves without any court influence or intrigue and contrary to some former votes of their own confirmed it in the twenty-third of elizabeth at that time though some members whose places had been supplied on account of sickness having now recovered their health appeared in the house and claimed their seat such was the authority of the chancellor that merely out of respect to him his sentence was adhered to and the new members were continued in their places here a most dangerous prerogative was conferred on the crown but to show the genius of that age or rather the channels in which power then ran the crown put very little value on this authority insomuch that two days afterwards the chancellor of himself resigned it back to the commons and gave them power to judge of a particular vacancy in their house and when the question concerning the chancellor's new writs was again brought on the carpet towards the end of the session the commons were so little alarmed at the precedent that though they readmitted some old members whose seats had been vacated on account of slight indispositions yet they confirmed the chancellor's sentence in instances where the distemper appeared to have been dangerous and incurable nor did they proceed any further in vindication of their privileges than to vote that during the sitting of parliament there do not at any time any writ go out for choosing or returning any member without the warrant of the house in elizabeth's reign we may remark and the reigns preceding sessions of parliament were not usually the twelfth part so long as the vacations and during the latter the chancellor's power if he pleased to exert it was confirmed at least left by this vote as unlimited and unrestrained as ever in a subsequent parliament the absolute authority of the queen was exerted in a manner still more open and began for the first time to give alarm to the commons new writs having been issued by the chancellor when there was no vacancy and a controversy arising upon that incident the queen sent a message to the house informing them that it were impertinent for them to deal in such matters these questions she said belonged only to the chancellor and she had appointed him to confer with the judges in order to settle all disputes with regard to elections 
the commons had the courage a few days after to vote that it was a most perilous precedent where two knights of a county were duly elected if any new writ should issue out for a second election without order of the house itself that the discussing and adjudging of this and such like differences belonged only to the house and that there should be no message sent to the lord chancellor not so much as to inquire what he had done in the matter because it was conceived to be a matter derogatory to the power and privilege of the house this is the most considerable and almost only instance of parliamentary liberty which occurs during the reign of that princess outlaws whether on account of debts or crimes had been declared by the judges incapable of enjoying a seat in the house where they must themselves be lawgivers but this opinion of the judges had been frequently overruled i find however in the case of vaughan who was questioned for an outlawry that having proved all his debts to have been contracted by surety ship and to have been most of them honestly compounded he was allowed on account of these favourable circumstances to keep his seat which plainly supposes that otherwise it would have been vacated on account of the outlawry when james summoned this parliament he issued a proclamation in which among many general advices which like a kind tutor he bestowed on his people he strictly enjoins them not to choose any outlaw for their representative and he adds if any person take upon him the place of knight citizen or burgess not being duly elected according to the laws and statutes in that behalf provided and according to the purport effect and true meaning of this our proclamation then every person so offending to be fined or imprisoned for the same a proclamation here was plainly put on the same footing with a law and that in so delicate a point as the right of elections most alarming circumstances had there not been reason to believe that this measure being entered into so early in the king's reign proceeded more from precipitation and mistake than from any serious design of invading the privileges of parliament sir francis goodwin was chosen member for the county of bucks and his return as usual was made into chancery the chancellor pronouncing him an outlaw vacated his seat and issued writs for a new election sir john fortescue was chosen in his place by the county but the first act of the house was to reverse the chancellor's sentence and restore sir francis to his seat at the king's suggestion the lords desired a conference on the subject but were absolutely refused by the commons as the question entirely regarded their own privileges the commons however agreed to make a remonstrance to the king by the mouth of their speaker in which they maintained that though the returns were by form made into chancery yet the sole right of judging with regard to elections belonged to the house itself not to the chancellor james was not satisfied and ordered a conference between the house and the judges whose opinion in this case was opposite to that of the commons this conference he said he commanded as an absolute king an epithet we are apt to imagine not very grateful to english ears but one to which they had already been somewhat accustomed from the mouth of elizabeth he added that all their privileges were derived from his grant and hoped that they would not turn against him a sentiment which from her conduct it is certain that princess had also entertained and which was the reigning principle of her courtiers and ministers and the spring of all her administration the commons were in some perplexity their eyes were now opened and they saw the consequences of that power which had been assumed by the chancellor and to which their predecessors had in some instances blindly submitted by this course said a member the free election of the counties is taken away and none shall be chosen but such as shall please the king and council let us therefore with fortitude understanding and sincerity seek to maintain our privilege 
this cannot be construed any contempt in us but merely a maintenance of our common rights which our ancestors have left us and which it is just and fit for us to transmit to our posterity another said this may be called a quo warranto to seize all our liberties a chancellor added a third by this course may call a parliament consisting of what persons he pleases any suggestion by any person may be the cause of sending a new writ it is come to this plain question whether the chancery or parliament ought to have authority notwithstanding this watchful spirit of liberty which now appeared in the commons their deference for majesty was so great that they appointed a committee to confer with the judges before the king and council there the question of law began to appear in james's eyes a little more doubtful than he had hitherto imagined it and in order to extricate himself with some honour he proposed that both goodwin and fortescue should be set aside and a writ be issued by warrant of the house for a new election goodwin gave his consent and the commons embraced the expedient but in such a manner that while they showed their regard for the king they secured for the future the free possession of their seats and the right which they claimed of judging solely in their own elections and returns a power like this so essential to the exercise of all their other powers themselves so essential to public liberty cannot fairly be deemed an encroachment in the commons but must be regarded as an inherent privilege happily rescued from that ambiguity which the negligence of some former parliaments had thrown upon it at the same time the commons in the case of sir thomas shirley established their power of punishing as well the persons at whose suit any member is arrested as the officers who either arrest or detain him their asserting of this privilege admits of the same reflection about this period the minds of men throughout europe especially in england seem to have undergone a general but insensible revolution though letters had been revived in the preceding age they were chiefly cultivated by those of sedentary professions nor had they till now begun to spread themselves in any degree among men of the world arts both mechanical and liberal were every day receiving great improvements navigation had extended itself over the whole globe travelling was secure and agreeable and the general system of politics in europe was become more enlarged and comprehensive End of section forty seven chapter forty five part two recording by asterix Section 48 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by david hume volume one d section forty eight chapter forty five part three in consequence of this universal fermentation the ideas of men enlarged themselves on all sides and the several constituent parts of the gothic governments which seem to have lain long inactive began everywhere to operate and encroach on each other on the continent where the necessity of discipline had begotten standing armies the princes commonly established an unlimited authority and overpowered by force or intrigue the liberties of the people in england the love of freedom which unless checked flourishes extremely in all liberal natures acquired new force and was regulated by more enlarged views suitable to that cultivated understanding which became every day more common among men of birth and education 
a familiar acquaintance with the precious remains of antiquity excited in every generous breast a passion for a limited constitution and begat an emulation of those manly virtues which the greek and roman authors by such animating examples as well as pathetic expressions recommend to us the severe though popular government of elizabeth had confined this rising spirit within very narrow bounds but when a new and a foreign family succeeded to the throne and a prince less dreaded and less beloved symptoms immediately appeared of a more free and independent genius in the nation happily this prince possessed neither sufficient capacity to perceive the alteration nor sufficient art and vigour to check it in its early advances jealous of regal because conscious of little personal authority he had established within his own mind a speculative system of absolute government which few of his subjects he believed and none but traitors and rebels would make any scruple to admit on whichever side he cast his eye everything concurred to encourage his prejudices when he compared himself with the other hereditary sovereigns of europe he imagined that as he bore the same rank he was entitled to equal prerogatives not considering the innovations lately introduced by them and the military force by which their authority was supported in england that power almost unlimited which had been exercised for above a century especially during the late reign he ascribed solely to royal birth and title not to the prudence and spirit of the monarchs nor to the conjectures of the times even the opposition which he had struggled with in scotland encouraged him still further in his favourite notions while he there saw that the same resistance which opposed regal authority violated all law and order and made way either for the ravages of a barbarous nobility or for the more intolerable insolence of seditious preachers in his own person therefore he thought all legal power to be centred by an hereditary and a divine right and this opinion might have proved dangerous if not fatal to liberty had not the firmness of the persuasion and its seeming evidence induced him to trust solely to his right without making the smallest provision either of force or politics in order to support it such were the opposite dispositions of parliament and prince at the commencement of the scottish line dispositions just beginning to exist and to appear in the parliament but thoroughly established and openly avowed on the part of the prince the spirit and judgment of the house of commons appeared not only in defence of their own privileges but also in their endeavour though at this time in vain to free trade from those shackles which the high exerted prerogative and even in this respect the ill-judged tyranny of elizabeth had imposed upon it james had already of his own accord called in and annulled all the numerous patents for monopolies which had been granted by his predecessor and which extremely fettered every species of domestic industry but the exclusive company still remained another species of monopoly by which almost all foreign trade except that to france was brought into the hands of a few rapacious engrossers and all prospect of future improvement in commerce was forever sacrificed to a little temporary advantage of the sovereign these companies though arbitrarily erected had carried their privileges so far that almost all the commerce of england was centred in london and it appears that the customs of that port amounted to one hundred and ten thousand pounds a year while those of all the kingdom beside yielded only seventeen thousand nay the whole trade of london was confined to about two hundred citizens who were easily enabled by combining among themselves to fix whatever price they pleased both to the exports and imports of the nation the committee appointed to consider this enormous grievance 
one of the greatest which we read of in english story insist on it as a fact well known and avowed however contrary to present received opinion that shipping and seamen had insensibly decayed during all the preceding reign and though nothing be more common than complaints of the decay of trade even during the most flourishing periods yet is this a consequence which might naturally result from such arbitrary establishments at a time when the commerce of all the other nations of europe except that of scotland enjoyed full liberty and indulgence while the commons were thus attempting to give liberty to the trading part of the nation they also endeavoured to free the landed property from the burden of ward ships and to remove those remains of the feudal tenures under which the nation still laboured a just regard was shown to the crown in the conduct of this affair nor was the remedy sought for considered as a matter of right but merely of grace and favour the profit which the king reaped both from wards and from respite of homage was estimated and it was intended to compound for these prerogatives by a secure and independent revenue but after some debates in the house and some conferences with the lords the affair was found to contain more difficulties than could easily at that time be surmounted and it was not then brought to any conclusion the same fate attended an attempt of a like nature to free the nation from the burden of purveyance this prerogative had been much abused by the purveyors and the commons showed some intention to offer the king fifty thousand pounds a year for the abolition of it another affair of the utmost consequence was brought before the parliament where the commons showed a greater spirit of independence than any true judgment of national interest the union of the two kingdoms was zealously and even impatiently urged by the king he justly regarded it as the peculiar felicity of his reign that he had terminated the bloody animosities of these hostile nations and had reduced the whole island under one government enjoying tranquillity within itself and security from all foreign invasions he hoped that while his subjects of both kingdoms reflected on past disasters besides regarding his person as infinitely precious they would entertain the strongest desire of securing themselves against the return of like calamities by a thorough union of laws parliaments and privileges he considered not that this very reflection operated as yet in a contrary manner on men's prejudices and kept alive that mutual hatred between the nations which had been carried to the greatest extremities and required time to allay it the more urgent the king appeared in promoting so useful a measure the more backward was the english parliament in concurring with him while they ascribed his excessive zeal to that partiality in favour of his ancient subjects of which they thought that on other occasions they had reason to complain their complaisance for the king therefore carried them no further than to appoint forty-four english to meet with thirty-one scottish commissioners in order to deliberate concerning the terms of a union but without any power of making advances towards the establishment of it the same spirit of independence and perhaps not better judgment appeared in the house of commons when the question of supply was brought before them by some members attached to the court in vain was it urged that though the king received a supply which had been voted to elizabeth and which had not been collected before her death yet he found it burdened with a debt contracted by the queen equal to the full amount of it that peace was not yet thoroughly concluded with spain and that ireland was still expensive on his journey from scotland amidst such a concourse of people and on that of the queen and royal family he had expended considerable sums and that as the courtiers had looked for greater liberalities from the prince on his accession 
and had imposed on his generous nature so the prince in his turn would expect at the beginning some mark of duty and attachment from his people and some consideration of his necessities no impression was made on the house of commons by these topics and the majority appeared fully determined to refuse all supply the burden of government at that time lay surprisingly light upon the people and that very reason which to us at this distance may seem a motive of generosity was the real cause why the parliament was on all occasions so remarkably frugal and reserved they were not as yet accustomed to open their purses in so liberal a manner as their successors in order to supply the wants of their sovereign and the smallest demand however requisite appeared in their eyes unreasonable and exorbitant the commons seem also to have been desirous of reducing the crown to still further necessities by their refusing a bill sent down to them by the lords for entailing the crown lands forever on the king's heirs and successors the dissipation made by elizabeth had probably taught james the necessity of this law and shown them the advantage of refusing it in order to cover a disappointment with regard to supply which might bear a bad construction both at home and abroad james sent a message to the house in which he told them that he desired no supply and he was very forward in refusing what was never offered him soon after he prorogued the parliament not without discovering in his speech visible marks of dissatisfaction even so early in his reign he saw reason to make public complaints of the restless and encroaching spirit of the puritanical party and of the malevolence with which they endeavoured to inspire the commons nor were his complaints without foundation or the puritans without interest since the commons now finding themselves free from the arbitrary government of elizabeth made application for a conference with the lords and presented a petition to the king the purport of which was to procure in favour of the puritans a relaxation of the ecclesiastical laws the use of the surplus and of the cross in baptism is there chiefly complained of but the remedy seems to have been expected solely from the king's dispensing power in the papers which contain this application and petition we may also see proofs of the violent animosity of the commons against the catholics together with the intolerating spirit of that assembly this summer the peace with spain was finally concluded and was signed by the spanish ministers at london in the conferences previous to this treaty the nations were found to have so few claims on each other that except on account of the support given by england to the low country provinces the war might appear to have been continued more on account of personal animosity between philip and elizabeth than any contrariety of political interests between their subjects some articles in the treaty which seemed prejudicial to the dutch commonwealth were never executed by the king and as the spaniards made no complaints on that head it appeared that by secret agreement the king had expressly reserved the power of sending assistance to the hollanders the constable of castile came into england to ratify the peace and on the part of england the earl of hertford was sent into the low countries for the same purpose and the earl of nottingham high admiral into spain the train of the latter was numerous and splendid and the spaniards it is said were extremely surprised when they beheld the blooming countenances and graceful appearance of the english whom their bigotry inflamed by the priests had represented as so many monsters and infernal demons though england by means of her naval force was perfectly secure during the latter years of the spanish war james showed an impatience to put an end to hostilities and soon after his accession before any terms of peace were concerted or even proposed by spain he recalled all the letters of mark 
in this respect james's peace was more honourable than that which henry the fourth himself made with spain this latter prince stipulated not to assist the dutch and the supplies which he secretly sent them were in direct contravention to the treaty which had been granted by queen elizabeth archduke albert had made some advances of a like nature which invited the king to take this friendly step but what is remarkable in james's proclamation for that purpose he plainly supposes that as he had himself while king of scotland always lived in amity with spain peace was attached to his person and that merely by his accession to the crown of england without any articles of treaty or agreement he had ended the war between the kingdoms this ignorance of the law of nations may appear surprising in a prince who was thirty-six years of age and who had reigned from his infancy did we not consider that a king of scotland who lives in close friendship with england has few transactions to manage with foreign princes and has little opportunity of acquiring experience unhappily for james his timidity his prejudices his indolence his love of amusement particularly of hunting to which he was much addicted ever prevented him from making any progress in the knowledge or practice of foreign politics and in a little time diminished that regard which all the neighbouring nations had paid to england during the reign of his predecessor End of section forty eight chapter forty five part three recording by asterix Section 49 of Volume 1D of History of England From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. History of England From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by david hume volume one d section forty nine chapter forty six part one james i we are now to relate an event one of the most memorable that history has conveyed to posterity and containing at once a singular proof both of the strength and weakness of the human mind its widest departure from morals and most steady attachment to religious prejudices it is the gunpowder treason of which i speak a fact as certain as it appears incredible the roman catholics had expected great favour and indulgence on the accession of james both as he was descended from mary whose life they believed to have been sacrificed to their cause and as he himself in his early youth was imagined to have shown some partiality towards them which nothing they thought but interest and necessity had since restrained it is pretended that he had even entered into positive engagements to tolerate their religion as soon as he should mount the throne of england whether their credulity had interpreted in this sense some obliging expressions of the kings or that he had employed such an artifice in order to render them favourable to his title very soon they discovered their mistake and were at once surprised and enraged to find james on all occasions express his intention of strictly executing the laws enacted against them and of persevering in all the rigorous measures of elizabeth Cattesby, a gentleman of good parts and of an ancient family first thought of a most extraordinary method of revenge and he opened his intention to piercy a descendant of the illustrious house of northumberland in one of their conversations with regard to the distressed condition of the catholics having broken into a sally of passion and mentioned assassinating the king Cattesby took the opportunity of revealing to him a nobler and more extensive plan of treason which not only included a sure execution of vengeance but afforded some hopes of restoring the catholic religion in england in vain said he would you put an end to the king's life he has children who would succeed both to his crown and to his maxims of government in vain would you extinguish the whole royal family the nobility the gentry the parliament are all infected with the same heresy 
he has children who would succeed both to his crown and to his maxims of government in vain would you extinguish the whole royal family the nobility the gentry the parliament are all infected with the same heresy and could raise to the throne another prince and another family who besides their hatred to our religion would be animated with revenge for the tragical death of their predecessors to serve any good purpose we must destroy at one blow the king the royal family the lords the commons and bury all our enemies in one common ruin happily they are all assembled on the first meeting of the parliament and afford us the opportunity of glorious and useful vengeance great preparations will not be requisite a few of us combining may run a mine below the hall in which they meet and choosing the very moment when the king harangues both houses consign over to destruction these determined foes to all piety and religion meanwhile we ourselves standing aloof safe and unsuspected shall triumph in being the instruments of divine wrath and shall behold with pleasure those sacrilegious walls in which were passed the edicts for proscribing our church and butchering her children tossed into a thousand fragments while their impious inhabitants meditating perhaps still new persecutions against us pass from flames above to flames below there forever to endure the torments due to their offences piercy was charmed with the project of catesby and they agreed to communicate the matter to a few more and among the rest to thomas winter whom they sent over to flanders in quest of fox an officer in the spanish service with whose zeal and courage they were all thoroughly acquainted when they enlisted any new conspirator in order to bind him to secrecy they always together with an oath employed the communion the most sacred rite of their religion and it is remarkable and no one of these pious devotees ever entertained the least compunction with regard to the cruel massacre which they projected of whatever was great and eminent in the nation some of them only were startled by the reflection that of necessity many catholics must be present as spectators or attendants on the king or as having seats in the house of peers but tesmond a jesuit and garnet a superior of that order in england removed these scruples and showed them how the interests of religion required that the innocent should here be sacrificed with the guilty all this passed in the spring and summer of the year sixteen hundred and four when the conspirators also hired a house in piercy's name adjoining to that in which the parliament was to assemble towards the end of that year they began their operations that they might be less interrupted and give less suspicion to the neighbourhood they carried in store of provisions with them and never desisted from their labour obstinate in their purpose and confirmed by passion by principle and by mutual exhortation they little feared death in comparison of a disappointment and having provided arms together with the instruments of their labour they resolved there to perish in case of a discovery their perseverance advanced the work and they soon pierced the wall though three yards in thickness but on approaching the other side they were somewhat startled at hearing a noise which they knew not how to account for upon inquiry they found that it came from the vault below the house of lords that a magazine of coals had been kept there and that as the coals were selling off the vault would be let to the highest bidder the opportunity was immediately seized the place hired by piercy thirty-six barrels of powder lodged in it the whole covered with faggots and billets the doors of the cellar boldly flung open and everybody admitted as if it contained nothing dangerous confident of success they now began to look forward and to plan the remaining part of their project the king the queen prince henry were all expected to be present at the opening of parliament the duke by reason of his tender age would be absent and it was resolved that piercy should seize him or assassinate him the princess elizabeth a child likewise was kept at lord harrington's house in warwickshire and sir everard digby rookwood grant being let into the conspiracy engaged to assemble their friends on pretence of a hunting match and seizing the princess immediately to proclaim her queen so transported were they with rage against their adversaries and so charmed with the prospect of revenge that they forgot all care of their own safety and trusting to the general confusion which must result from so unexpected a blow 
they foresaw not that the fury of the people now unrestrained by any authority must have turned against them and would probably have satiated itself by a universal massacre of the catholics the day so long wished for now approached on which the parliament was appointed to assemble the dreadful secret though communicated to above twenty persons had been religiously kept during the space of near a year and a half no remorse no pity no fear of punishment no hope of reward has it yet induced any one conspirator either to abandon the enterprise or make a discovery of it the holy fury had extinguished in their breast every other motive and it was an indiscretion at last proceeding chiefly from these very bigoted prejudices and partialities which saved the nation ten days before the meeting of parliament lord monteagle a catholic son to lord morley received the following letter which had been delivered to his servant by an unknown hand my lord out of the love i bear to some of your friends i have a care of your preservation therefore i would advise you as you tender your life to devise some excuse to shift off your attendance at this parliament for god and man have concurred to punish the wickedness of this time and think not slightly of this advertisement but retire yourself into your country where you may expect the event in safety for though there may be no appearance of any stir yet i say they will receive a terrible blow to this parliament and yet they shall not see who hurts them this counsel is not to be contemned because it may do you good and can do you no harm for the danger is past as soon as you have burned the letter and i hope god will give you the grace to make good use of it unto whose holy protection i commend you monteagle knew not what to make of this letter and though inclined to think it a foolish attempt to frighten and ridicule him he judged it safest to carry it to lord salisbury secretary of state though salisbury too was inclined to pay little attention to it he thought proper to lay it before the king who came to town a few days after to the king it appeared not so light a matter and from the serious earnest style of the letter he conjectured that it implied something dangerous and important a terrible blow and yet the authors concealed a danger so sudden and yet so great these circumstances seemed all to denote some contrivance by gunpowder and it was thought advisable to inspect all the vaults before the houses of parliament this care belonged to the earl of suffolk lord chamberlain who purposely delayed the search till the day before the meeting of parliament he remarked those great piles of wooden faggots which lay in the vault under the upper house and he cast his eye upon fox who stood in a dark corner and passed himself for piercy's servant the daring and determined courage which so much distinguished this conspirator even among those heroes in villainy was fully painted in his countenance and was not passed unnoticed by the chamberlain such a quantity also of fuel for the use of one who lived so little in town as piercy appeared a little extraordinary and upon comparing all circumstances it was resolved that a more thorough inspection should be made about midnight sir thomas nevitt a justice of peace was sent with proper attendance and before the door of the vault finding fox who had just finished all his preparations he immediately seized him and turning over the faggots discovered the powder the matches and everything proper for setting fire to the train were taken in fox's pocket who finding his guilt now apparent and seeing no refuge but in boldness and despair expressed the utmost regret that he had lost the opportunity of firing the powder at once and of sweetening his own death by that of his enemies before the council he displayed the same intrepid firmness mixed even with scorn and disdain refusing to discover his accomplices and showed no concern but for the failure of the enterprise this obstinacy lasted two or three days but being confined to the tower left to reflect on his guilt and danger and the rack being just shown to him his courage fatigued with so long an effort and unsupported by hope or society at last failed him and he made a full discovery of all the conspirators Cattersby, pierce and the other criminals who were in london though they had heard of the alarm taken at a letter sent to monteagle though they had heard of the chamberlain's search yet were resolved to persist to the utmost and never abandon their hope of success but at last hearing that fox was arrested they hurried down to warwickshire where sir everard digby thinking himself assured that success had attended his confederates was already in arms in order to seize the princess elizabeth she had escaped into coventry 
and they were obliged to put themselves on their defence against the country, who were raised from all quarters and armed by the sheriff. The conspirators, with all their attendants, never exceeded the number of eighty persons, and being surrounded on every side, could no longer entertain hopes either of prevailing or escaping. Having therefore confessed themselves and received absolution, they boldly prepared for death and resolved to sell their lives as dear as possible to the assailants. But even this miserable consolation was denied them. Some of their powder took fire and disabled them for defence. The people rushed in upon them. Piercy and Cattersby were killed by one shot. Digby, Rookwood, Winter, and others, being taken prisoners, were tried, confessed their guilt, and died, as well as Garnet, by the hands of the executioner. Notwithstanding this horrid crime, the bigoted Catholics were so devoted to Garnet that they fancied miracles to be wrought by his blood, and in Spain he was regarded as a martyr. Neither had the desperate fortune of the conspirators urged them to this enterprise, nor had the former profligacy of their lives prepared them for so great a crime. Before that audacious attempt, their conduct seems in general to be liable to no reproach. Cattersby's character had entitled him to such regard that Rookwood and Digby were seduced by their implicit trust in his judgment, and they declared that, from the motive alone of friendship to him, they were ready on any occasion to have sacrificed their lives. Digby himself was as highly esteemed and beloved as any man in England, and he had been particularly honoured with the good opinion of Queen Elizabeth. It was bigoted zeal alone, the most absurd of prejudices masked with reason, the most criminal of passions covered with the appearance of duty, which seduced them into measures that were fatal to themselves, and had so nearly proved fatal to their country. The Lords Mordaunt and Stoughton, two Catholics, were fined, the former ten thousand pounds, the latter four thousand, by the Star Chamber, because their absence from Parliament had begotten a suspicion of their being acquainted with the conspiracy. The Earl of Northumberland was fined thirty thousand pounds, and detained several years prisoner in the Tower, because, not to mention other grounds of suspicion, he had admitted Piercy into the number of gentlemen pensioners without his taking the requisite oaths. The king, in a speech to the Parliament, observed that, though religion had engaged the conspirators in so criminal an attempt, yet ought we not to involve all the Roman Catholics in the same guilt, or suppose them equally disposed to commit such enormous barbarities. Many holy men, he said, and our ancestors, among the rest, had been seduced to concur with that church in her scholastic doctrines, who yet had never admitted her seditious principles concerning the Pope's power of dethroning kings or sanctifying assassination. The wrath of heaven is denounced against crimes, but innocent error may obtain its favour, and nothing can be more hateful than the uncharitableness of Puritans, who condemn alike to eternal torments even the most inoffensive partisans of popery. For his part, he added, that conspiracy, however atrocious, should never alter in the least his plan of government, while with one hand he punished guilt, with the other he would still support and protect innocence. After this speech he prorogued the Parliament till the 22nd of January. The moderation, and, I may say, magnanimity of the King, immediately after so narrow an escape, from a most detestable conspiracy, was nowise agreeable to his subjects. Their animosity against popery, even before this provocation, had risen to a great pitch, and it had perhaps been more prudent in James, by a little dissimulation, to have conformed himself to it. His theological learning, confirmed by disputation, has happily fixed his judgment in the Protestant faith, yet was his heart a little biased by the allurements of Rome, and he had been well pleased, if the making of some advances could have effected a union with that ancient mother church. He strove to abate the acrimony of his own subjects against the religion of their fathers. He became himself the object of their diffidence and aversion. Whatever measures he embraced, in Scotland to introduce prelacy, in England to enforce the authority of the established church and support its rites and ceremonies, were interpreted as so many steps towards popery, and were represented by the Puritans as symptoms of idolatry and superstition, ignorant of the consequences or unwilling to sacrifice to politics his inclination, which he called his conscience, he persevered in the same measures, and gave trust and preferment, almost indifferently, to his Catholic and Protestant subjects. And finding his person, as well as his title, less obnoxious to the Church of Rome than those of Elizabeth, 
he gradually abated the rigor of those laws which had been enacted against that church and which were so acceptable to his bigoted subjects but the effects of these dispositions on both sides became not very sensible till towards the conclusion of his reign at this time james seems to have possessed the affections even of his english subjects and in a tolerable degree their esteem and regard hitherto their complaints were chiefly levelled against his too great constancy in his early friendships a quality which had it been attended with more economy the wise would have excused and the candid would even perhaps have applauded his parts which were not despicable and his learning which was great being highly extolled by his courtiers and gownmen and not yet tired in the management of any delicate affairs for which he was unfit raised a high idea of him in the world nor was it always through flattery or insincerity that he received the title of the second solomon a report which was suddenly spread about the time of his being assassinated visibly struck a great consternation into all orders of men the commons also abated this session somewhat of their excessive frugality and granted him an aid payable in four years of three subsidies and six fifteenths which sir francis bacon said in the house might amount to about four hundred thousand pounds and for once the king and parliament parted in friendship and good humour the hatred which the catholics so visibly bore him gave him at this time an additional value in the eyes of his people the only considerable point in which the commons incurred his displeasure was by discovering their constant goodwill to the puritans in whose favour they desired a conference with the lords which was rejected the chief affair transacted next session was the intended union of the two kingdoms nothing could exceed the king's passion and zeal for this noble enterprise but the parliament's prejudice and reluctance against it there remained two excellent speeches in favour of the union which it would not be improper to compare together that of the king and that of sir francis bacon those who affect in everything such an extreme contempt for james will be surprised to find that his discourse both for good reasoning and elegant composition approaches very near that of a man who was undoubtedly at that time one of the greatest geniuses in europe a few trivial indiscretions and indecorums may be said to characterize the harangue of the monarch and mark it for his own and in general so open and avowed a declaration in favour of a measure while he had taken no care by any precaution or intrigue to ensure success may safely be pronounced an indiscretion but the art of managing parliaments by private interest or cabal being found hitherto of little use or necessity had not as yet become a part of english politics in the common course of affairs government could be conducted without their assistance and when their concurrence became necessary to the measures of the crown it was generally speaking except in times of great faction and discontent obtained without much difficulty end of section forty nine chapter forty six part one read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section fifty of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito crasto history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight by david hume volume one d section fifty chapter forty six part two the king's influence seems to have rendered the scottish parliament cordial in all the steps which they took towards the union though the advantages which scotland might hope from that measure were more considerable yet were the objections too with regard to that kingdom more striking and obvious the benefit which must have resulted to england both by accession of strength and security was a riot despicable and as the english were by far the greater nation and possessed the seat of government the objections either from the point of honour or from jealousy could not reasonably have any place among them the english parliament indeed seemed to have been swayed merely by the vulgar motive of national antipathy and they persisted so obstinately in their prejudices 
that all the efforts for a thorough union and incorporation ended only in the abolition of the hostile laws formerly enacted between the kingdoms some precipitate steps which the king a little after his accession had taken in order to promote his favorite project had been here observed to do more injury than service from his own authority he had assumed the title of king of great britain and had quartered the arms of scotland with those of england in all coins flags and ensigns he had also engaged the judges to make a declaration that all those who after the union of the crowns should be born in either kingdom were for that reason alone naturalized in both this was a nice question and according to the ideas of those times susceptible of subtle reasoning on both sides the king was the same the parliaments were different to render the people before the same we must suppose that the sovereign authority resided chiefly in the prince and that these popular assemblies were rather instituted to assist with money and advice than endowed with any controlling or active powers in the government it is evident says bacon in his pleadings on the subject that all other commonwealths monarchies only excepted do subsist by a law precedent for where authority is divided amongst many officers and they not perpetual but annual or temporary and not to receive their authority but by election and certain persons to have voices only in that election and the like these are busy and curious frames which of necessity do presuppose a law precedent written or unwritten to guide and direct them but in monarchies especially hereditary that is when several families or lineages of people do submit themselves to one line imperial or royal the submission is more natural and simple which afterwards by law subsequent is perfected and made formal but that is grounded upon nature it would seem from this reasoning that the idea of an hereditary limited monarchy though implicitly supposed in many public transactions had scarcely ever as yet been expressly formed by any english lawyer or politician except the obstinacy of the parliament with regard to the union and an attempt on the king's ecclesiastical jurisdiction most of their measures during this session were sufficiently respectful and obliging though they still discover a vigilant spirit and a careful attention towards national liberty the votes also of the commons show that the house contained a mixture of puritans who had acquired great authority among them and who together with religious prejudices were continually suggesting ideas more suitable to a popular than a monarchical form of government the natural appetite for rule made the commons lend a willing ear to every doctrine which tended to augment their own power and influence a petition was moved in the lower house for a more rigorous execution of the laws against popish recusants and an abatement towards protestant clergymen who scrupled to observe the ceremonies both these points were equally unacceptable to the king and he sent orders to the house to proceed no further in that matter the commons were inclined at first to consider these orders as a breach of privilege but they soon acquiesced when told that this measure of the king's was supported by many precedents during the reign of elizabeth had they been always disposed to make the precedents of that reign the rule of their conduct they needed never have had any quarrel with any of their monarchs the complaints of spanish depredations were very loud among the english merchants the lower house sent a message to the lords desiring a conference with them in order to their presenting a joint petition to the king on the subject the lords took some time to deliberate on this message because they said the matter was weighty and rare it probably occurred to them at first that the parliaments interposing in affairs of state would appear unusual and extraordinary and to show that in this sentiment they were not guided by court influence after they had deliberated they agreed to the conference the house of commons began now to feel themselves of such importance that on the motion of sir edmund sandys a member of great authority they entered for the first time an order for the regular keeping of their journals when all business was finished the king prorogued the parliament about this time there was an insurrection of the country people in northamptonshire headed by one reynolds a man of low condition they went about destroying enclosures but carefully avoided committing any other outrage this insurrection was easily suppressed 
and though great lenity was used towards the rioters, yet were some of the ringleaders punished. The chief cause of that trivial commotion seems to have been, or itself, far from trivial. The practice still continued in England, of disusing tillage and throwing the land into enclosures for the sake of pasture. By this means the kingdom was depopulated, at least prevented from increasing so much in people as might have been expected from the daily increase of industry and commerce. Next year presents us with nothing memorable. But in the spring of the subsequent, after a long negotiation, was concluded, by a truce of twelve years, that war which for near half a century had been carried on with such fury between Spain and the states of the United Provinces. Never contest seemed at first more unequal. Never contest was finished with more honor to the weaker party. On the side of Spain were numbers, riches, authority, discipline. On the side of the revolted provinces were found the attachment to liberty and the enthusiasm of religion. By her naval enterprises, the Republic maintained her armies, and, joining peaceful industry to military valor, she was enabled by her own force to support herself and gradually rely less on those neighboring princes, who, from jealousy to Spain, were at first prompted to encourage her revolt. Long had the pride of that monarchy prevailed over her interest and prevented her from hearkening to any terms of accommodation with her rebellious subjects. But finding all intercourse cut off between her provinces by the maritime force of the states, she at last agreed to treat with them as a free people, and solemnly to renounce all claim and pretension to their sovereignty. This chief point being gained, the treaty was easily brought to a conclusion under the joint mediation and guarantee of france and england all exterior appearances of honour were paid equally to both crowns but very different were the sentiments which the states as well as all europe entertained of the princes who wore them frugality and vigour the chief circumstances which procure regard among foreign nations shone out as conspicuously in henry as they were deficient in james to a contempt of the english monarchy Henry seems to have added a considerable degree of jealousy and aversion, which were sentiments altogether without foundation. James was just and fair in all transactions with his allies, but it appears from the memoirs of those times that each side deemed him partial towards their adversary, and fancied that he had entered into secret measures against them. So little equity have men in their judgments of their own affairs and so dangerous is that entire neutrality affected by the king of england the little concern which james took in foreign affairs renders the domestic occurrences particularly those of parliament the most interesting of his reign a new session was held this spring the king full of hopes of receiving supply the commons of circumscribing his prerogative the earl of salisbury now created treasurer on the death of the earl of dorset lay open the king's necessities first to the peers then to a committee of the lower house he insisted on the unavoidable expense incurred in supporting the navy and in suppressing a late insurrection in ireland he mentioned three numerous courts which the king was obliged to maintain for himself for the queen and for the prince of wales he observed that queen elizabeth though a single woman had received very large supplies in the years preceding her death which alone were expensive to her and he remarked that during her reign she had alienated many of the crown lands an expedient which though it supplied her present necessities without laying burdens on her people extremely multiplied the necessities of her successor from all these causes he thought it nowise strange that the king's income should fall short so great a sum as eighty one thousand pounds of his stated and regular expense without mentioning contingencies which ought always to be esteemed a fourth of the yearly charges and as the crown was now necessarily burdened with a great and urgent debt of three hundred thousand pounds he thence inferred the absolute necessity of an immediate and large supply from the people to all these reasons which james likewise urged in a speech addressed to both houses the commons remained inexorable but not to shock the king with an absolute refusal they granted him one subsidy and one fifteenth which would scarcely amount to a hundred thousand pounds and james received the mortification of discovering in vain all his wants and of begging aid of subjects who had no reasonable indulgence or consideration for him among the many causes of disgust and quarrel which now daily and unavoidably multiplied between prince and parliament 
this article of money is to be regarded as none of the least considerable after the discovery and conquest of the west indies gold and silver became every day more plentiful in england as well as in the rest of europe and the price of all commodities and provisions rose to a height beyond what had been known since the declension of the roman empire as the revenue of the crown rose not in proportion the prince was insensibly reduced to poverty amidst the general riches of his subjects and required additional funds in order to support the same magnificence and force which had been maintained by former monarchs but while money thus flowed into england we may observe that at the same time and probably from that very cause arts and industry of all kinds received a mighty increase and elegance in every enjoyment of life became better known and more cultivated among all ranks of people the king's servants both civil and military his courtiers his ministers demanded more ample supplies from the impoverished prince and were not contented with the same simplicity of living which had satisfied their ancestors the prince himself began to regard an increase of pomp and splendour as requisite to support the dignity of his character and to preserve the same superiority above his subjects which his predecessors had enjoyed some equality too and proportion to the other sovereigns in europe it was natural for him to desire and as they had universally enlarged their revenue and multiplied their taxes the king of england deemed it reasonable that his subjects who were generally as rich as theirs should bear with patience some additional burdens and impositions unhappily for the king those very riches with the increasing knowledge of the age bred opposite sentiments in his subjects and begetting a spirit of freedom and independence disposed them to pay little regard either to the entreaties or menaces of their sovereign while the barons possessed their former immense property and extensive jurisdictions they were apt at every disgust to endanger the monarch and throw the whole government into confusion but this confusion often in its turn proved favourable to the monarch and made the nation again submit to him in order to re-establish justice and tranquillity after the power of alienations as well as the increase of commerce had thrown the balance of property into the hands of the commons the situation of affairs and the dispositions of men became susceptible of a more irregular plan of liberty and the laws were not supported singly by the authority of the sovereign and though in that interval after the decline of the peers and before the people had yet experienced their force the princes assumed an exorbitant power and had almost annihilated the constitution under the weight of their prerogative as soon as the commons recovered from their lethargy they seemed to have been astonished at the danger and were resolved to secure liberty by firm barriers than their ancestors had hitherto provided for it had james possessed a very rigid frugality he might have warded off this crisis somewhat longer and waiting patiently for a favourable opportunity to increase and fix his revenue might have secured the extensive authority transmitted to him on the other hand had the commons been inclined to act with more generosity and kindness towards their prince they might probably have turned his necessities to good account and have bribed him to depart peaceably from the most dangerous articles of his prerogative but he was a foreigner and ignorant of the arts of popularity they were soured by religious prejudices and tenacious of their money and in this situation it is no wonder that during this whole reign we scarcely find an interval of mutual confidence and friendship between prince and parliament the king by his prerogative alone had some years before altered the rates of the customs and had established higher impositions on several kinds of merchandise this exercise of power will naturally to us appear arbitrary and illegal yet according to the principles and practices of that time it might admit of some apology the duties of tonnage and poundage were at first granted to the crown by a vote of parliament and for a limited time and as the grant frequently expired and was renewed there could not then arise any doubt concerning the origin of the king's right to levy these duties and this imposition like all others was plainly derived from the voluntary consent of the people but as henry v and all the succeeding sovereigns had the revenue conferred on them for life the prince so long in possession of these duties began gradually to consider them as his own proper right and inheritance and regarded the vote of parliament as a mere formality which rather expressed the acquiescence of the people in his prerogative than bestowed any new gift or revenue upon him the parliament when it was granted poundage to the crown had fixed no particular rates 
the imposition was given as a shilling in a pound or five per cent on all commodities it was left to the king himself and the privy council aided by the advice of such merchants as they should think proper to consult to fix the value of goods and thereby the rates of the customs and as that value had been settled before the discovery of the west indies it was become much inferior to the prices which almost all commodities bore in every market in europe and consequently the customs on many goods though supposed to be five per cent was in reality much inferior the king therefore was naturally led to think that rates which were now plainly false ought to be corrected that the valuation of commodities fixed by one act of the privy council might be amended by another that if his right to poundage were inherent in the crown he should also possess of himself the right of correcting its inequalities if this duty were granted by the people he should at least support the spirit of the law by fixing a new and juster valuation of all commodities but besides this reasoning which seems plausible if not solid the king was supported in that act of power by direct precedence some in the reign of mary some in the beginning of elizabeth both these princesses had without consent of parliament altered the rates of commodities and as their impositions had all along been submitted to without a murmur and still continued to be levied the king had no reason to apprehend that a further exertion of the same authority would give any occasion of complaint that less umbrage might be taken he was moderate in the new rates which he established the customs during his whole reign rose only from one hundred and twenty seven thousand pounds a year to one hundred and ninety thousand though besides the increase of the rates there was a sensible increase of commerce and industry during that period every commodity besides which might serve to the subsistence of the people or might be considered as a material of manufactures was exempted from the new impositions of james but all this caution could not prevent the complaints of the commons a spirit of liberty had now taken possession of the house the leading members men of an independent genius and large views began to regulate their opinions more by the future consequences which they foresaw than by the former precedents which were set before them and they less aspired at maintaining the ancient constitution than at establishing a new one and a freer and a better in their remonstrances to the king on this occasion they observed it to be a general opinion that the reasons of that practice might be extended much further even to the utter ruin of the ancient liberty of the kingdom and the subjects right of property in their lands and goods though expressly forbidden by the king to touch his prerogative they passed a bill abolishing these impositions which was rejected by the house of lords in another address to the king they objected to the practice of borrowing upon privy seals and desired that the subjects should not be forced to lend money to his majesty nor give a reason for their refusal some murmurs likewise were thrown out in the house against a new monopoly of the license of wines it must be confessed that forced loans and monopolies were established on many an ancient as well as recent precedents though diametrically opposite to all the principles of a free government end of section fifty chapter forty six part two read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 51 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume volume one d section fifty one chapter forty six part three the house likewise discovered some discontent against the king's proclamations that proclamations were not of equal force with laws yet he thought it a duty incumbent on him and a power inseparably annexed to the crown to restrain and prevent such mischiefs and inconveniences as he saw growing on the state against which no certain law was extant and which might tend to the great detriment of the subject if there should be no remedy provided till the meeting of a parliament and this prerogative he adds our progenitors have in all times used and enjoyed the intervals between sessions we may observe were frequently so long as to render it necessary for a prince to interpose by his prerogative 
the legality of this exertion was established by uniform and undisputed practice and was even acknowledged by lawyers who made however this difference between laws and proclamations that the authority of the former was perpetual that of the latter expired with the sovereign who emitted them but what the authority could be which bound the subject yet was different from the authority of laws and inferior to it seems inexplicable by any maxims of reason or politics and in this instance as in many others it is easy to see how inaccurate the english constitution was before the parliament was enabled by continued acquisitions or encroachments to establish it on fixed principles of liberty upon the settlements of the reformation that extensive branch of power which regards ecclesiastical matters being then without an owner seemed to belong to the first occupant and henry the eighth failed not immediately to seize it and to exert it even to the utmost degree of tyranny the possession of it was continued with edward and recovered by elizabeth and that ambitious princess was so remarkably jealous of this flower of a crown that she severely reprimanded the parliament if they ever presumed to intermeddle in these matters and they were so overawed by her authority as to submit and to ask pardon on these occasions but james's parliaments were much less obsequious they ventured to lift up their eyes and to consider their prerogative they there saw a large province of government possessed by the king alone and scarcely ever communicated with the parliament they were sensible that this province admitted not of any exact boundary or circumscription they had felt that the roman pontiff in former ages under pretence of religion was gradually making advances to usurp the whole civil power they dreaded still more dangerous consequences from the claims of their own sovereign who resided among them and who in many other respects possessed such unlimited authority they therefore deemed it absolutely necessary to circumscribe this branch of prerogative and accordingly in the preceding session they passed a bill against the establishment of any ecclesiastical canons without consent of parliament but the house of lords as is usual defended the barriers of the throne and rejected the bill in this session the commons after passing anew the same bill made remonstrances against the proceedings of the high commission court it required no great penetration to see the extreme danger to liberty arising in a regal government from such large discretionary powers as were exercised by that court but james refused compliance with the application of the commons he was probably sensible that besides the diminution of his authority many inconveniences must necessarily result from the abolishing of all discretionary power in every magistrate and that the laws were they ever so carefully framed and digested could not possibly provide against every contingency much less where they had not as yet attained a sufficient degree of accuracy and refinement but the business which chiefly occupied the commons during this session was the abolition of wardships and purveyance prerogatives which had been more or less touched on every session during the whole reign of james in this affair the commons employed the proper means which might entitle them to success they offered the king a settled revenue as an equivalent for the powers which he should part with and the king was willing to hearken to terms after much dispute he agreed to give up these prerogatives for two hundred thousand pounds a year which they agreed to confer upon him and nothing remained towards closing the bargain but that the commons should determine the funds by which this sum should be levied this session was far too advanced to bring so difficult a matter to a full conclusion and though the parliament met again towards the end of the year and resumed the question they were never able to terminate an affair upon which they seemed so intent the journals of that session are lost and as the historians of this reign are very negligent in relating parliamentary affairs of whose importance they were not sufficiently apprised we know not exact the reason of this failure it only appears that the king was extremely dissatisfied with the conduct of the parliament and soon after dissolved it this was his first parliament and it sat near seven years amidst all the attacks some more some less violent on royal prerogative the king displayed as openly as ever all his exalted notions of monarchy and the authority of princes even in a speech to the parliament where he begged for supply and where he should naturally have used every art to ingratiate himself with that assembly he expressed himself in these terms i conclude then 
the point touching the power of kings with this axiom of divinity that as to dispute what god may do is blasphemy but what god wills that divines may lawfully and do ordinarily dispute and discuss so is it a sedition in subjects to dispute what a king may do in the height of his power but just kings will ever be willing to declare what they will do if they will not incur the curse of god i will not be content that my power be disputed upon but i shall ever be willing to make the reason appear of my doings and rule my actions according to my laws notwithstanding the great extent of prerogative in that age these expressions would probably give some offence but we may observe that as the king's despotism was more speculative than practical so the independency of the commons was at this time the reverse and though strongly supported by their present situation as well as disposition was too new and recent to be as yet founded on systematical principles and opinions this year was distinguished by a memorable event which gave great alarm and concern in england the murder of the french monarch by the poniard of the fanatical ravaillac with his death the glory of the french monarchy suffered an eclipse for some years and as that kingdom fell under an administration weak and bigoted factious and disorderly the austrian greatness began anew to appear formidable to europe in england the antipathy to the catholics revived a little upon this tragical event and some of the laws which had formerly been enacted in order to keep these religionists in awe began now to be executed with greater rigour and severity sixteen hundred and eleven though james's timidity and indolence fixed him during most of his reign in a very prudent inattention to foreign affairs there happened this year an event in europe of such mighty consequence as to rouse him from his lethargy and summon up all his zeal and enterprise a professor of divinity named Worstius, the disciple of arminius was called from a german to a dutch university and as he differed from his britannic majesty in some nice questions concerning the intimate essence and secret decrees of god he was considered as a dangerous rival in scholastic fame and was at last obliged to yield to the legions of that royal doctor whose syllogisms he might have refuted or eluded if vigour was wanting in other incidents of james's reign here he behaved even with haughtiness and insolence and the states were obliged after several remonstrances to deprive worstius of his chair and to banish him their dominions the king carried no further his animosity against that professor though he had very charitably hinted to the states that as to the burning of worstius for his blasphemies and atheism he left them to their own christian wisdom but surely never heretic deserved better the flames it is to be remarked that at this period all over europe except in holland alone the practice of burning heretics still prevailed even in protestant countries and instances were not wanting in england during the reign of james to consider james in a more advantageous light we must take a view of him as the legislator of ireland and most of the institutions which he had framed for civilizing that kingdom being finished about this period it may not here be improper to give some account of them he frequently boasts of the management of ireland as his masterpiece and it will appear upon inquiry that his vanity in this particular was not altogether without foundation after the subjection of ireland by elizabeth the more difficult task still remained to civilize the inhabitants to reconcile them to laws and industry and to render their subjection durable and useful to the crown of england james proceeded in this work by a steady regular and well-concerted plan and in the space of nine years according to sir john davis he made greater advances towards the reformation of that kingdom than had been made in the four hundred and forty years which had elapsed since the conquest was first attempted it was previously necessary to abolish the irish customs which supplied the place of laws and which were calculated to keep that people forever in a state of barbarism and disorder by the brehon law or custom every crime however was punished not with death but by a fine or pecuniary mulct which was levied upon the criminal murder itself as among all the ancient barbarous nations was atoned for in this manner and each man according to his rank had a different rate or value affixed to him which if any one were willing to pay he needed not fear assassinating his enemy this rate was called his eric when sir william fitzwilliams being lord deputy told maguire that he was to send a sheriff into fermanagh which a little before had been made a county and subjected to the english law your sheriff said maguire 
shall be welcome to me. But let me know beforehand his eric or the price of his head, that if my people cut it off, I may levy the money upon the county. As for oppression, extortion, and other trespasses, so little were they regarded that no penalty was affixed to them, and no redress for such offences could ever be obtained. The customs of Gabal Kinder and Tanistry were attended with the same absurdity in the distribution of property. 1612. The land, by the custom of Gabal Kinder, was divided among all the males of the sept or family, both bastard and legitimate, and, after partition made, if any of the sept died, his portion was not shared out among his sons, but the chieftain, at his discretion, made a new partition of all the lands belonging to that sept, and gave every one his share. As no man, by reason of this custom, enjoyed the fixed property of any land, to build, to plant, to enclose, to cultivate, to improve, would have been so much lost labor. The chieftains and the tanis, though drawn from the principal families, were not hereditary, but were established by election, or more properly speaking, by force and violence. Their authority was almost absolute, and notwithstanding that certain lands were assigned to the office, its chief profit resulted from exactions, dues, assessments, for which there was no fixed law, and which were levied at pleasure. Hence rose that common byword among the Irish, that they dwelt westward of the law which dwelt beyond the river of the Barrow, meaning the country where the English inhabited, and which extended not beyond the compass of twenty miles, lying in the neighbourhood of Dublin. After abolishing these Irish customs, and substituting English law in their place, James, having taken all the natives under his protection, and declared them free citizens, proceeded to govern them by a regular administration, military as well as civil. A small army was maintained, its discipline inspected, and its pay transmitted from England, in order to keep the soldiers from preying upon the country, as had been usual in former reigns. When Odogarthic raised an insurrection, a reinforcement was sent over, and the flames of that rebellion were immediately extinguished. All minds being first quieted by a general indemnity, circuits were established, justice administered, oppression banished, and crimes and disorders of every kind severely punished. As the Irish had been universally engaged in the rebellion against Elizabeth, a resignation of all the rights which had been formally granted them to separate jurisdiction were rigorously exacted, and no authority but that of the king and the law was permitted throughout the kingdom. A resignation of all private estates was even required, and when they were restored, the proprietors received them under such conditions as might prevent for the future all tyranny and oppression over the common people. The value of the dues which the nobles usually claim from their vassals was estimated at a fixed sum, and all further arbitrary exactions prohibited under severe penalties. The whole province of Ulster, having fallen to the crown by the attainder of rebels, a company was established in London for planting new colonies in that fertile country. The property was divided into moderate shares, the largest not exceeding 2,000 acres. Tenants were brought over from England and Scotland. The Irish were removed from the hills and fastnesses and settled in the open country. Husbandry and the arts were taught them, a fixed habitation secured, plunder and robbery punished, and by these means, Ulster, from being the most wild and disorderly province of all Ireland, soon became the best cultivated and most civilized. Such were the arts by which James introduced humanity and justice among a people who had ever been buried in the most profound barbarism. Noble cares, much superior to the vain and criminal glory of conquest, but requiring ages of perseverance and attention to perfect what had been so happily begun. A laudable act of justice was about this time executed in England upon Lord Sunkabir, a Scottish nobleman, who had been guilty of the base assassination of Turner, a fencing master. The English nation, who were generally dissatisfied with the Scots, were enraged at this crime, equally mean and atrocious. But James appeased them, by preferring the severity of law to the intercession of the friends and family of the criminal. End of section 51, chapter 46, part 3, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 52 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. 
history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight by david hume volume one d section fifty two chapter forty seven part one james i this year the sudden death of henry prince of wales diffused a universal grief throughout the nation though youth and royal birth both of them strong allurements prepossess men mightily in favour of the early age of princes it is with peculiar fondness that historians mention henry and in every respect his merit seems to have been extraordinary he had not reached his eighteenth year and he had already possessed more dignity in his behaviour and commanded more respect than his father with all his age learning and experience neither his high fortune nor his youth has seduced him into any irregular pleasures business and ambition seem to have been his sole possession his inclinations as well as exercises were martial the french ambassador taking leave of him and asking his commands for france found him employed in the exercise of the pike tell your king said he in what occupation you left me engaged he had conceived great affection and esteem for the brave sir walter raleigh it was his saying sure no king but my father would keep such a bird in a cage he seems indeed to have nourished too violent a contempt for the king on account of his pedantry and pusillanimity and by that means struck in with the restless and martial spirit of the english nation the unhappy prepossession which men commonly entertain in favour of ambition courage enterprise and other warlike virtues engages generous natures who always love fame in such pursuits all destroy their own peace and that of the rest of mankind violent reports were propagated as if henry had been carried off by poison but the physicians on opening his body found no symptoms to confirm such an opinion the bold and criminal malignity of men's tongues and pens spared not even the king on the occasion but that prince's character seems rather to have failed in the extreme of facility and humanity than in that of cruelty and violence his indulgence to henry was so great and perhaps imprudent by giving him a large and independent settlement even in so early youth the marriage of princess elizabeth with frederick elector palatine was finished some time after the death of the prince and served to dissipate the grief which arose on that melancholy event but this marriage though celebrated with great joy and festivity proved itself an unhappy event to the king as well as to his son-in-law and had ill consequences on the reputation and fortunes of both the elector trusting to so great an alliance engaged in enterprises beyond his strength and the king not being able to support him in his distress lost entirely in the end of his life what remained of the affections and esteem of his own subjects except during sessions of parliament the history of this reign may more properly be called the history of the court than that of the nation an interesting object had for some years engaged the attention of the court it was a favourite and one beloved by james with so profuse and unlimited an affection as left no room for any rival or competitor about the end of the year sixteen hundred and nine robert carr a youth of twenty years of age and of a good family in scotland arrived in london after having passed some time in his travels all his natural accomplishments consisted in good looks all his acquired abilities in an easy air and graceful demeanour he had letters of recommendation to his countryman lord hay and that nobleman no sooner cast his eye upon him than he discovered talents sufficient to entitle him immediately to make a great figure in the government apprised of the king's passion for youth and beauty and exterior appearance he studied how matters might be so managed that his new object should make the strongest impression upon him without mentioning him at court he assigned him the office at a match of tilting of presenting to the king his buckler and device and hoped that he would attract the attention of the monarch fortune proved favourable to his design by an incident which bore at first a contrary aspect when carr was advancing to execute his office his unruly horse flung him and broke his leg in the king's presence james approached him with pity and concern love and affection arose on the side of his beauty and tender years and the prince ordered him immediately to be lodged in the palace and to be carefully attended he himself after the tilting paid him a visit in his chamber and frequently returned during his confinement the ignorance and simplicity of the boy finished the conquest begun by his exterior graces and accomplishments 
other princes have been fond of choosing their favourites from among the lower ranks of their subjects, and have reposed themselves on them with the more unreserved confidence and affection, because the object has been beholden to their bounty for every honour and acquisition. James was desirous that his favourites should also derive from him all his sense, experience and knowledge. Highly conceited of his own wisdom, he pleased himself with the fancy that his raw youth by his lessons and instructions would, in a little time, be equal to his sagest ministers, and be initiated into all the profound mysteries of government on which he set so high a value. And as this kind of creation was more perfectly on his own work than any other, he seems to have indulged an unlimited fondness for his minion, beyond even that which he bore to his own children. He soon knighted him, created him Viscount Rochester, gave him the garter, brought him into the Privy Council, and though at first, without assigning him any particular office, bestowed on him the supreme direction of all his business and political concerns. Agreeable to this rapid advancement in confidence and honour were the riches heaped upon the needy favourite, and while Salisbury and all the wisest ministers could scarcely find expedients sufficient to keep in motion the overburdened machine of government, James, with unsparing hand, loaded with treasures this insignificant and useless pageant. It is said that the king found his pupil so ill-educated as to be ignorant even of the lowest rudiments of the Latin tongue, and that the monarch, laying aside the sceptre, took the birch into his royal hand and instructed him in the principles of grammar. During the intervals of this noble occupation, affairs of state would be introduced, and the stripling by the ascendant which he had acquired was now enabled to repay on political what he had received in grammatical instruction. Such scenes and such incidents are the more ridiculous, though the less odious, as the passion of James seems not to have contained in it anything criminal or flagitious. History charges herself willingly with a relation of the great crimes, and still more with that of the great virtues of mankind. But she appears to fall from her dignity when necessitated to dwell on such frivolous events and ignoble personages. The favourite was not at first so intoxicated with advancement as not to be sensible of his own ignorance and inexperience. He had recourse to the assistance and advice of a friend, and he was more fortunate in his choice than is usual with such pampered minions. In Sir Thomas Overbury he met with a judicious and sincere counsellor, who, building all hopes of his own preferment on that of the young favourite, endeavoured to instil into him the principles of prudence and discretion. By zealously serving everybody, Carr was taught to abate the envy which might attend his sudden elevation. By showing a preference for the English, he learned to escape the prejudices which prevailed against his country. And so long as he was content to be ruled by Overbury's friendly counsels, he enjoyed, what is rare, the highest favour of the prince without being hated by the people. To complete the measure of courtly happiness, naught was wanting but a kind mistress, and where high fortune concurred with all the graces of youth and beauty, this circumstance could not be difficult to attain. But it was here that the favourite met with that rock on which all his fortunes were wrecked, and which plunged him for ever into an abyss of infamy, guilt, and misery. No sooner had James mounted the throne of England than he remembered his friendship for the unfortunate families of Howard and Devereux who had suffered for their attachment to the cause of Mary and to his own. Having restored young Essex to his blood and dignity, and conferred the titles of Suffolk and Northampton on two brothers of the House of Norfolk, he sought the further pleasure of uniting these families by the marriage of the Earl of Essex with the Lady Frances Howard, daughter of the Earl of Suffolk. She was only thirteen, he fourteen years of age, and it was thought proper, till both should attain the age of puberty, that he should go abroad and pass some times in his travels. He returned to England after four years' absence, and was pleased to find his countess in the full lustre of beauty, and possessed of the love and admiration of the whole court. But when the earl approached and claimed the privileges of her husband, he met with nothing but symptoms of aversion and disgust, and a flat refusal of any further familiarities. He applied to her parents, who constrained her to attend him into the country, and to partake of his bed, but nothing could overcome her rigid sullenness and obstinacy and still she rose from his side without having shared the nuptial pleasures. Disgusted with reiterated denials, he at last gave over the pursuit, and separating himself from her, thenceforth abandoned her conduct to her own will and discretion. Such cold and aversion in Lady Essex arose not without an attachment to another object. Her favourite had opened his addresses, 
and had been too successful in making impression on the tender heart of the young countess she imagined that so long as she refused the embraces of essex she never could be deemed his wife and that a separation and divorce might still open the way for a new marriage with her beloved rochester though their passion was so violent and their opportunities of intercourse so frequent that they had already indulged themselves in all the gratifications of love they still lamented their unhappy fate while the union between them was not entire and indissoluble and the lover as well as his mistress was impatient till their mutual ardour should be crowned by marriage so momentous an affair could not be concluded without consulting overbury with whom rochester was accustomed to share all his secrets while that faithful friend had considered his patron's attachment to the countess of essex merely as an affair of gallantry he had favoured his progress and it was partly owing to the ingenious and passionate letters which he dictated that rochester had met with such success in his addresses like an experienced courtier he thought that a conquest of this nature would throw a lustre on the young favourite and would tend still further to endear him to james who was charmed to hear the armours of his coat and listened with attention to every tale of gallantry but great was overbury's alarm when rochester mentioned his design of marrying the countess and he used every method to dissuade his friend from so foolish an attempt he represented how invidious how difficult an enterprise to procure her a divorce from her husband how dangerous how shameful to take into his own bed a profligate woman who being married to a young nobleman of the first rank had not scrupled to prostitute her character and to bestow favours on the object of a capricious and momentary passion and in the zeal of friendship he went so far as to threaten rochester that he would separate himself from him if he could so far forget his honour and his interest as to prosecute the intended marriage rochester had the weakness to reveal this conversation to the countess of essex and when her rage and fury broke out against overbury he had also the weakness to enter into her vindictive projects and to swear vengeance against his friend for the utmost instance which he could receive of his faithful friendship some contrivance was necessary for the execution of their purpose rochester addressed himself to the king and after complaining that his own indulgence to overbury had begotten in him a degree of arrogance which was extremely disagreeable he procured a commission for his embassy to russia which he represented as a retreat for his friend both profitable and honourable when consulted by overbury he earnestly dissuaded him from accepting this offer and took on himself the office of satisfying the king if he should be anywise displeased with the refusal to the king again he aggravated the insolence of overbury's conduct and obtained a warrant for committing him to the tower which james intended as a slight punishment for his disobedience the lieutenant of the tower was a creature of rochester's and had lately been put into the office for this very purpose he confined overbury so strictly that the unhappy prisoner was debarred the sight even of his nearest relations and no communication of any kind was allowed with him during near six months which he lived in prison this obstacle being removed the lovers pursued their purpose and the king himself forgetting the dignity of his character and his friendship for the family of essex entered zealously into the project of procuring the countess a divorce from her husband essex also embraced the opportunity of separating himself from a bad woman by whom he was hated and he was willing to favour their success by any honourable expedient the pretence for a divorce was his incapacity to fulfil the conjugal duties and he confessed that with regard to the countess he was conscious of such an infirmity though he was not sensible of it with regard to any other woman in her place too it is said a young virgin was substituted under a mask to undergo a legal inspection by a jury of matrons after such a trial seconded by court influence and supported by the ridiculous opinion of fascination or witchcraft the sentence of divorce was pronounced between the earl of essex and his countess and to crown the scene the king solicitous lest the lady should lose any rank by her new marriage bestowed on his minion the title of earl of somerset notwithstanding this success the countess of somerset was not satisfied till she could further satiate her revenge on overbury and she engaged her husband as well as her uncle the earl of northampton in the atrocious design of taking him off secretly by poison fruitless attempts were reiterated by weak poisons but at last they gave him one so sudden and violent that the symptoms were apparent to every one who approached him his interment was hurried on with the greatest precipitation and though a strong suspicion immediately prevailed in the public the full proof of the crime was not brought to light till some years after 
the fatal catastrophe of overbury increased or begot the suspicion that the prince of wales had been carried off by poison given him by somerset men considered not that the contrary inference was much juster if somerset was so great a novice in this detestable art that during the course of five months a man who was his prisoner and attended by none but his emissaries could not be dispatched but in so bungling a manner how could it be imagined that a young prince living in his own court surrounded by his own friends and domestics could be exposed to somerset's attempts and be taken off by so subtile a poison if such a one exist as could elude the skill of the most experienced physicians the ablest minister that james ever possessed the earl of salisbury was dead suffolk a man of slender capacity had succeeded him in his office and it was now his task to supply from an exhausted treasury the profusion of james and of his young favourite the title of baronet invented by salisbury was sold and two hundred patents of that species of knighthood were disposed of for so many thousand pounds each rank of nobility had also its price affixed to it privy seals were circulated to the amount of two hundred thousand pounds benevolences were exacted to the amount of fifty two thousand pounds and some monopolies of no great value were erected but all these expedients proved insufficient to supply the king's necessities even though he began to enter into some schemes for retrenching his expenses however small the hopes of success a new parliament must be summoned and this dangerous expedient for such it was now become once more be put to trial when the commons were assembled they discovered an extraordinary alarm on account of the rumour which was spread abroad concerning undertakers it was reported that several persons attached to the king had entered into a confederacy and having laid a regular plan for the new elections had distributed their interest all over england and had undertaken to secure a majority for the court so ignorant were the commons that they knew not this incident to be the first infallible symptom of any regular or established liberty had they been contented to follow the maxims of their predecessors who as the earl of salisbury said to the last parliament never but thrice in six hundred years refused a supply they needed not dread that the crown should ever interest itself in their elections formerly the kings even insisted that none of their household should be elected members and though the charter was afterwards declared void henry the sixth from his great favour to the city of york conferred a peculiar privilege on its citizens that they should be exempted from this trouble it is well known that in ancient times a seat in the house being considered as a burden attended neither with honour nor profit it was requisite for the counties and boroughs to pay fees to their representatives about this time a seat began to be regarded as an honour and the country gentlemen contended for it though the practice of levying wages for the parliament men was not altogether discontinued it was not till long after when liberty was thoroughly established and popular assemblies entered into every branch of public business that the members began to join profit to honour and the crown found it necessary to distribute among them all the considerable offices of the kingdom end of section fifty two chapter forty seven part one read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section fifty three of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito crasto history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight by david hume volume one d section fifty three chapter forty seven part two so little skill or so small means had the courtiers in james's reign for managing elections that this house of commons showed rather a strong spirit of liberty than the foregoing and instead of entering upon the business of supply as urged by the king who made them several liberal offers of grace they immediately resumed the subject which had been opened last parliament and disputed his majesty's power of levying new customs and impositions by the mere authority of his prerogative it is remarkable that in their debates on the subject the courtiers frequently pleaded as a precedent the example of all the other hereditary monarchs in europe and particularly mentioned the kings of france and spain nor was this reasoning received by the house either with surprise or indignation the members of the opposite party either contented themselves 
with denying the justness of the inference or they disputed the truth of the observation and a patriot member in particular sir roger owen even in arguing against the impositions frankly allowed that the king of england was endowed with as ample a power and prerogative as any prince in christendom the nations on the continent we may observe enjoyed still in that age some small remains of liberty and the english were possessed of little more the commons applied to the lords for a conference with regard to the new impositions a speech of neil bishop of lincoln reflected on the lower house begat some altercation with the peers and the king seized the opportunity of dissolving immediately with great indignation a parliament which had shown so firm a resolution of retrenching his prerogative without communicating in return the smallest supply to his necessities he carried his resentment so far as even to throw into prison some of the members who had been the most forward in their opposition to his measures in vain did he plead in excuse for this violence the example of elizabeth and other princes of the line of tudor as well as plantagenet the people and the parliament without abandoning for ever all their liberties and privileges could acquiesce in none of these precedents how ancient and frequent soever and were the authority of such precedents admitted the utmost that could be inferred is that the constitution of england was at that time an inconsistent fabric whose jarring and discordant parts must soon destroy each other and from the dissolution of the old beget some new form of civil government more uniform and consistent in the public and avowed conduct of the king and the house of commons throughout his whole reign there appears a sufficient cause of quarrel and mutual disgust yet are we not to imagine that this was the sole foundation of that jealousy which prevailed between them during debates in the house it often happened that a particular member more ardent and zealous than the rest would display the higher sentiments of liberty which the commons contented themselves to hear with silence and seeming approbation and the king informed of these harangues concluded the whole house to be infected with the same principles and to be engaged in a combination against his prerogative the king on the other hand though he valued himself extremely on his kingcraft and perhaps was not altogether incapable of dissimulation seems to have been very little endowed with the gift of secrecy but openly at his table in all companies inculcated those monarchical tenets which he had so strongly imbibed before a numerous audience he had expressed himself with great disparagement of the common law of england and had given the preference in the strongest terms to the civil law and for this indiscretion he found himself obliged to apologize in a speech to the former parliament as a specimen of his usual liberty of talk we may mention a story though it passed some time after which we meet with in the life of waller and which that poet used frequently to repeat when waller was young he had the curiosity to go to court and he stood in the circle and saw james dine where among other company there sat at table two bishops neil and andrews the king proposed aloud this question whether he might not take his subjects money when he needed it without all this formality of parliament neil replied god forbid you should not for you are the breath of our nostrils andrews declined answering and said he was not skilled in parliamentary cases but upon the king's urging him and saying he would admit of no evasion the bishop replied pleasantly why then i think your majesty may lawfully take my brother neil's money for he offers it the favourite had hitherto escaped the inquiry of justice but he had not escaped that still voice which can make itself be heard amidst all the hurry and flattery of a court and astonishes the criminal with a just representation of his most secret enormities conscious of the murder of his friend somerset received small consolation from the enjoyments of love or the utmost kindness and indulgence of his sovereign the graces of his youth gradually disappeared the gaiety of his manners was obscured his politeness and obliging behaviour were changed into sullenness and silence and the king whose affections had been engaged by these superficial accomplishments began to estrange himself from a man who no longer contributed to his amusement the sagacious courtiers observed the first symptoms of this disgust somerset's enemies seized the opportunity and offered a new minion to the king george villiers a youth of one and twenty younger brother of a good family returned at this time from his travels and was remarked for the advantages of a handsome person genteel air and fashionable apparel 
at a comedy he was purposely placed full in james's eye and immediately engaged the attention and in the same instant the affections of that monarch ashamed of his sudden attachment the king endeavoured but in vain to conceal the partiality which he felt for the handsome stranger and he employed all his profound politics to fix him in his service without seeming to desire it he declared his resolution not to confer any office on him unless entreated by the king and he pretended that it should only be in complaisance to her choice he would agree to admit him near his person the queen was immediately applied to but she well knowing the extreme to which the king carried these attachments refused at first to lend her countenance to this new passion it was not till entreated by abbot archbishop of canterbury a decent prelate and one much prejudiced against somerset that she would condescend to oblige her husband by asking his favour of him and the king thinking now that all appearances were fully saved no longer constrained his affection but immediately bestowed his office of cup-bearer on young villiers the whole court was thrown into parties between the two minions while some endeavoured to advance the rising fortunes of villiers others deemed it safer to adhere to the established credit of somerset the king himself divided between inclination and decorum increased the doubt and ambiguity of the courtiers and the stern jealousy of the old favourite who refused every advance of friendship from his rival begat perpetual quarrels between their several partisans but the discovery of somerset's guilt in the murder of overbury at last decided the controversy and exposed him to the ruin and infamy which he so well merited an apothecary's apprentice who had been employed in making up the poisons having retired to flushing began to talk very freely of the whole secret and the affair at last came to the ears of trumbull the king's envoy in the low countries by his means sir ralph winwood secretary of state was informed and he immediately carried the intelligence to james the king alarmed and astonished to find such enormous guilt in a man whom he had admitted into his bosom sent for sir edward coke chief justice and earnestly recommended to him the most rigorous and unbiased scrutiny this injunction was executed with great industry and severity the whole labyrinth of guilt was carefully unravelled the lesser criminals sir jervis elvis lieutenant of the tower franklin western mrs turner were first tried and condemned somerset and his countess were afterwards found guilty northampton's death a little before had saved him from a like fate it may not be unworthy of remark that coke in the trial of mrs turner told her that she was guilty of the seven deadly sins she was a whore a bawd a sorcerer a witch a papist a felon and a murderer and what may more surprise us bacon the attorney-general took care to observe that poisoning was a popish trick such were the bigoted prejudices which prevailed poisoning was not itself sufficiently odious if it were not represented as a branch of popery stove tells us that when the king came to newcastle on his first entry into england he gave liberty to all the prisoners except those who were confined for treason murder and papistry when one considers these circumstances that furious bigotry of the catholics which broke out in the gunpowder conspiracy appears the less surprising all the accomplices in overbury's murder received the punishment due to their crime but the king bestowed a pardon on the principals somerset and the countess it must be confessed that james's fortitude had been highly laudable had he persisted in his first intention of consigning over to severe justice all the criminals but let us still beware of blaming him too harshly if on the approach of the fatal hour he scrupled to deliver into the hands of the executioner persons whom he had once favoured with his most tender affections to soften the rigour of their fate after some years imprisonment he restored them to their liberty and conferred on them a pension with which they retired and languished out old age in infamy and obscurity their guilty loves were turned into the most deadly hatred and they passed many years together in the same house without any intercourse or correspondence with each other several historians in relating these events have insisted much on the dissimulation of james's behaviour when he delivered somerset into the hands of the chief justice on the insolent menaces of that criminal on his peremptory refusal to stand a trial and on the extreme anxiety of the king during the whole progress of this affair allowing all these circumstances to be true of which some are suspicious if not palpably false the great remains of tenderness which james still felt for somerset may perhaps be sufficient to account for them that favourite was high-spirited and resolute rather to perish than live under the infamy to which he was exposed james was sensible 
that the pardoning of so great a criminal which was of itself invidious would still become still more unpopular if his obstinate and stubborn behaviour on his trial should augment the public hatred against him at least the unreserved confidence in which the king had indulged his favourite for several years might render somerset master of so many secrets that it is impossible without further light to assign the particular reason of that superiority which it is said he appeared so much to assume the fall of somerset and his banishment from court opened the way for villiers to mount up at once to the full height of favour of honours and of riches had james's passion been governed by common rules of prudence the office of cup-bearer would have attached villiers to his person and might well have contented one of his age and family nor would any one who was not cynically austere have much censured the singularity of the king's choice in his friends and favourites but such advancement was far inferior to the fortune which he intended for his minion in the course of a few years he created him viscount villiers earl marquis and duke of buckingham knight of the garter master of the horse chief justice and heir warden of the sack ports master of the king's bench office steward of westminster constable of windsor and lord high admiral of england his mother obtained the title of countess of buckingham his brother was created viscount purbeck and a numerous train of needy relations were all pushed up into credit and authority and thus the fond prince while he meant to play the tutor to his favourite and to train him up in the rules of prudence and politics took an infallible method by loading him with premature and exorbitant honours to render him forever rash precipitate and insolent a young minion to gratify with pleasure a necessitous family to supply with riches were enterprises too great for the, the empty exchequer of james in order to obtain a little money the cautionary towns must be delivered up to the dutch a measure which has been severely blamed by almost all historians and i may venture to affirm that it has been censured much beyond its real weight and importance when queen elizabeth advanced money for the support of the infant republic besides the view of securing herself against the power and ambition of spain she still reserved the prospect of reimbursement and she got consigned into her hands the three important fortresses of flushing the Breel, and ramekins as pledges for the money due to her indulgent to the necessitous condition of the states she agreed that debt should bear no interest and she stipulated that if ever england should make a separate peace with spain she should pay the troops which garrisoned those fortresses after the truce was concluded between spain and the united provinces the states made an agreement with the king and the debt which then amounted to eight hundred thousand pounds should be discharged by yearly payments of forty thousand pounds and as five years had elapsed the debt was now reduced to six hundred thousand pounds and in fifteen years more if truce were renewed it would be finally extinguished but of this sum twenty six thousand pounds a year were expended on the pay of the garrisons the remaining alone accrued to the king and the states weighing these circumstances thought that they made james a very advantageous offer when they expressed their willingness on the surrender of the cautionary towns to pay him immediately two hundred and fifty thousand pounds and to incorporate the english garrisons in their army it occurred also to the king that even the payment of forty thousand pounds a year was precarious and depended on the accident that the truce should be renewed between spain and the republic if war broke out the maintenance of the garrisons lay upon england alone a burden very useless and too heavy for the slender revenues of that kingdom that even during the truce the dutch straitened by other expenses were far from being regular in their payments and the garrisons were at present in danger of mutinying for want of subsistence that the annual sum of fourteen thousand pounds the whole saving on the dutch payments amounted in fifteen years to no more than two hundred and ten thousand pounds whereas two hundred and fifty thousand pounds were offered immediately a larger sum and if money be computed at ten per cent the current interest more than double the sum to which england was entitled that if james waited till the whole debt were discharged the troops which composed the garrisons remained a burden upon him and could not be broken without receiving some consideration for their past service that the cautionary towns were only a temporary restraint upon the hollanders and in the present emergence the conjunction of interest between england and the republic was so intimate as to render all other ties superfluous and no reasonable measure for mutual support would be wanting from the dutch even though freed from the dependence of these garrisons that the exchequer of the republic was at present very low insomuch that they found a difficulty 
now that the aids of france were withdrawn to maintain themselves in that posture of defence which was requisite during the truce with spain and that the spaniards were perpetually insisting with the king on the restitution of these towns as belonging to their crown and no cordial alliance could ever be made with that nation while they remained in the hands of the english these reasons together with his urgent wants induced the king to accept of caron's offer and he evacuated the cautionary towns which held the states in a degree of subjection and which an ambitious and enterprising prince would have regarded as his most valuable possessions this is the date of the full liberty of the dutch commonwealth end of section fifty three chapter forty seven part two read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section fifty four of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito crasto history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen hundred and eighty eight by david hume volume one d section fifty four chapter forty seven part three when the crown of england devolved on james it might have been foreseen by the scottish nation that the independence of their kingdom the object for which their ancestors had shed so much blood would now be lost and that if both states persevered in maintaining separate laws and parliaments the weaker would more sensibly feel the subjection than if it had been totally subdued by force of arms but these views did not generally occur the glory of having given a sovereign to their powerful enemy the advantages of present peace and tranquillity the riches acquired from the munificence of their master these considerations secured their dutiful obedience to a prince who daily gave such sensible proofs of their friendship and partiality towards them never had the authority of any king who resided among them been so firmly established as was that of james even when absent and as the administration had been hitherto conducted with great order and tranquillity there had happened no occurrence to draw thither our attention but this summer the king was resolved to pay a visit to his native country in order to renew his ancient friendships and connections and to introduce that change of ecclesiastical discipline and government on which he was extremely intent the three chief points of this kind which james proposed to accomplish by his journey to scotland were the enlarging of episcopal authority the establishing of a few ceremonies in public worship and the fixing of a superiority in the civil above the ecclesiastical jurisdiction but it is an observation suggested by all history and by none more than by that of james and his successor that the religious spirit when it mingles with faction contains in it something supernatural and unaccountable and that in its operations upon society effects correspond less to their known causes than is found in any other circumstance of government a reflection which may at once afford a source of blame against such sovereigns as lightly innovate in so dangerous an article and of apology for such as being engaged in an enterprise of that nature are disappointed of the expected event and fail in their undertakings when the scottish nation was first seized with that zeal for reformation which though it caused such disturbance during the time had proved so salutary in the consequences the preachers assuming a character little inferior to the prophetic or apostolical disdained all subjection to the spiritual rulers of the church by whom their innovations were punished and opposed the revenues of the dignified clergy no longer considered as sacred were either appropriated by the present possessors or seized by the more powerful barons and what remained after mighty dilapidations was by act of parliament annexed to the crown the prelates however and abbots maintained their temporal jurisdictions and their seats in parliament and though laymen were sometimes endowed with ecclesiastical titles the church notwithstanding its frequent protestations to the contrary was still supposed to be represented by those spiritual lords in the states of the kingdom after many struggles the king even before his accession to the throne of england had acquired sufficient influence over the scottish clergy to extort from them an acknowledgment of the parliamentary jurisdiction of bishops though attended with many precautions in order to secure themselves against the spiritual encroachments of that order when king of england he engaged them though still with great reluctance on their part to advance a step further 
and to receive the bishops as perpetual presidents or moderators in their ecclesiastical synods reiterating their protestations against all spiritual jurisdiction of the prelates and all controlling power over the presbyters and by such gradual innovations the king flattered himself that he should quietly introduce episcopal authority but as his final scope was fully seen from the beginning every new advance gave fresh occasion of discontent and aggravated instead of softening the abhorrence entertained against the prelacy what rendered the king's aim more apparent were the endeavours which at the same time he used to introduce into scotland some of the ceremonies of the church of england the rest it was easily foreseen would soon follow the fire of devotion excited by novelty and inflamed by opposition had so possessed the minds of the scottish reformers that all rites and ornaments and even order of worship were disdainfully rejected as useless burdens retarding the imagination with its rapturous ecstasies and cramping the operations of that divine spirit by which they supposed themselves to be animated a mode of worship was established the most naked and most simple imaginable one that borrowed nothing from the senses but reposed itself entirely on the contemplation of that divine essence which discovers itself to the understanding only this species of devotion so worthy of the supreme being but so little suitable to human frailty was observed to occasion great disturbances in the breast and in many respects to confound all rational principles of conduct and behaviour the mind straining for these extraordinary raptures reaching them by short glances sinking again under its own weakness rejecting all exterior aid of pomp and ceremony was so occupied in this inward life that it fled from every intercourse of society and from every cheerful amusement which could soften or humanise the character it was obvious to all discerning eyes and had not escaped the king's that by the prevalence of fanaticism a gloomy and sullen disposition established itself among the people a spirit obstinate and dangerous independent and disorderly animated equally with a contempt of authority and a hatred to every other mode of religion particularly to the catholic in order to mellow these humours james endeavoured to infuse a small tincture of ceremony into the national worship and to introduce such rites as might in some degree occupy the mind and please the senses without departing too far from that simplicity by which the reformation was distinguished the finer arts too though still rude in these northern kingdoms were employed to adorn the churches and the king's chapel in which an organ was erected and some pictures and statues displayed was proposed as a model to the rest of the nation but music was grating to the prejudiced ears of the scottish clergy sculpture and painting appeared instruments of idolatry the surplus was a rag of popery and every motion or gesture prescribed by the liturgy was a step towards that spiritual babylon so much the object of their horror and aversion every thing was deemed impious but their own musical comments on the scriptures which they idolized and whose eastern prophetic style they employed in every common occurrence it will not be necessary to give a particular account of the ceremonies which the king was so intent to establish such institutions for a time are esteemed either too divine to have proceeded from any other being than the supreme creator of the universe or too diabolical to have been derived from any but an infernal demon but no sooner is the mode of the controversy past than they are universally discovered to be of so little importance as scarcely to be mentioned with decency amidst the ordinary course of human transactions it suffices here to remark that the rites introduced by james regarded the kneeling at the sacrament private communion private baptism confirmation of children and the observance of christmas and other festivals the acts establishing these ceremonies were afterwards known by the name of the articles of perth from the place where they were ratified by the assembly a conformity of discipline and worship between the churches of england and scotland which was james's aim he could never hope to establish but by first procuring an acknowledgment of his own authority in all spiritual causes and nothing could be more contrary to the practice as well as principles of presbyterian clergy the ecclesiastical courts possessed the power of pronouncing excommunication and that sentence besides the spiritual consequences supposed to follow from it was attended with immediate effects of the most important nature the person excommunicated was shunned by every one as profane and impious and his whole estate during his lifetime and all his movables forever were forfeited to the crown nor were the previous steps requisite before pronouncing the sentence formal or regular in proportion to the weight of it without accuser without summons without trial 
any ecclesiastical court however inferior sometimes pretended in a summary manner to denounce excommunication for any cause and against any person even though he lived not within the bounds of their jurisdiction and by this means the whole tyranny of the inquisition though without its order was introduced into the kingdom but the clergy were not content with the unlimited jurisdiction which they exercised in ecclesiastical matters they assumed a censorial power over every part of administration and in all their sermons and even prayers mingling politics with religion they inculcated the most seditious and most turbulent principles black minister of st andrews went so far in a sermon as to pronounce all kings the devil's children he gave the queen of england the appellation of atheist he said that the treachery of the king's heart was now fully discovered and in his prayers for the queen he used these words we must pray for her for the fashion's sake but we have no cause she will never do us any good when summoned before the privy council he refused to answer to a civil court for anything delivered from the pulpit even though the crime of which he was accused was of a civil nature the church adopted his cause they raised a sedition in edinburgh the king during some time was in the hands of the enraged populace and it was not without courage as well as dexterity that he was able to extricate himself a few days after a minister preaching in the principal church of that capital said that the king was possessed with a devil and that one devil being expelled seven worse had entered in his place to which he added that the subjects might lawfully rise and take the sword out of his hand scarcely even during the darkest night of papal superstition are there found such instances of priestly encroachments as the annals of scotland present to us during that period by these extravagant stretches of power and by the patient conduct of james the church began to lose ground even before the king's accession to the throne of england but no sooner had that event taken place than he made the scottish clergy sensible that he was become the sovereign of a great kingdom which he governed with great authority though formerly he would have thought himself happy to have made a fair partition with them of the civil and ecclesiastical authority he was now resolved to exert a supreme jurisdiction in church as well as state and to put an end to their seditious practices an assembly had been summoned at aberdeen but on account of his journey to london he prorogued it to the year following some of the clergy disavowing his ecclesiastical supremacy met at the same time first appointed notwithstanding his prohibition he threw them into prison such of them as submitted and acknowledged their error were pardoned the rest were brought to their trial they were condemned for high treason the king gave them their lives but banished them the kingdom six of them suffered this penalty the general assembly was afterwards induced to acknowledge the king's authority in summoning ecclesiastical courts and to submit to the jurisdiction and visitation of the bishops even their favourite sentence of excommunication was declared invalid unless confirmed by the ordinary the king recommended to the inferior courts the members whom they should elect to this assembly and everything was conducted in it with little appearance of choice and liberty by his own prerogative likewise which he seems to have stretched on this occasion the king erected a court of high commission in imitation of that which was established in england the bishops and a few of the clergy who had been summoned willingly acknowledged this court and it proceeded immediately upon business as if its authority had been grounded on the full consent of the whole legislature but james received the final blow for the time when he should himself pay a visit to scotland he proposed to the parliament which was then assembled that they should enact that whatever his majesty should determine in the external government of the church with the consent of the archbishops bishops and a competent number of the ministry should have the force of law what number should be deemed competent was not determined and their nomination was left entirely to the king so that his ecclesiastical authority had this bill passed would have been established in its full extent some of the clergy protested they apprehended they said that the purity of their church would by means of this new authority be polluted with all the rites and liturgy of the church of england james dreading clamour and opposition dropped the bill which had already passed the lords of articles and asserted that the inherent prerogative of the crown contained more power than was recognised by it some time after he called at st andrews a meeting of the bishops and thirty-six of the most eminent clergy he there declared his resolution of exerting his prerogative and of establishing by his own authority the few ceremonies which he had recommended to them they entreated him rather to summon a general assembly and to gain their assent an assembly was accordingly summoned to meet on the twenty fifth of november ensuing 
yet this assembly which met after the king's departure from scotland eluded all his applications and it was not till the subsequent year that he was able to procure a vote for receiving his ceremonies and through every step in this affair in the parliament as well as in all the general assemblies the nation betrayed the utmost reluctance to all these innovations and nothing but james's importunity and authority had extorted a seeming consent which was belied by the inward sentiments of all ranks of people even the few over whom religious prejudices were not prevalent though national honour sacrificed by a servile imitation of the modes of worship practised in england and every prudent man agreed in condemning the measures of the king who by an ill-timed zeal for insignificant ceremonies had betrayed though in an opposite manner equal narrowness of mind with the persons whom he treated with such contempt it was judged that had not these dangerous humours been irritated by opposition had they been allowed peaceably to evaporate they would at last have subsided within the limits of law and civil authority and that as all fanatical religions naturally circumscribe to very narrow bounds the numbers and riches of the ecclesiastics no sooner is their first fire spent than they lose their credit over the people and leave them under the natural and beneficent influence of their civil and moral obligations at the same time that james shocked in so violent a manner the religious principles of his scottish subjects he acted in opposition to those of his english he had observed in his progress through england that a judaical observance of the sunday chiefly by means of the puritans was every day gaining ground throughout the kingdom and that the people under colour of religion were contrary to former practice debarred such sports and recreations as contributed both to their health and their amusement festivals which in other nations and ages are partly dedicated to public worship partly to mirth and society were here totally appropriated to the offices of religion and served to nourish those sullen and gloomy contemplations to which the people were of themselves so unfortunately subject the king imagined that it would be easy to infuse cheerfulness into this dark spirit of devotion he issued a proclamation to allow and encourage after divine service all kinds of lawful games and exercises and by his authority he endeavoured to give sanction to a practice which his subjects regarded as the utmost instance of profaneness and impiety to show how rigid the english chiefly the puritans were become in this particular a bill was introduced into the house of commons in the eighteenth of the king for the more strict observance of the sunday which they affected to the sabbath one shepherd opposed this bill objected to the appellation of sabbath as puritanical defended dancing by the examples of david and seems even to have justified sports on that day for this profaneness he was expelled the house by the suggestion of mr pym the house of lords opposed so far the puritanical spirit of the commons that they proposed that the appellation of sabbath should be changed into that of the lord's day end of section fifty four chapter forty seven part three read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 55 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 55. Chapter forty eight, part one. James the first. At the time when Sir Walter Raleigh was first confined in the tower, his violent and haughty temper had rendered him the most unpopular man in England, and his condemnation was chiefly owing to that public odium under which he laboured. During the thirteen years' imprisonment which he suffered, the sentiments of the nation were much changed with regard to him. Men had leisure to reflect on the hardship, not to say injustice, of his sentence. They pitied his active and enterprising spirit, which languished in the rigours of confinement. They were struck with the extensive genius of the man, who, being educated amidst naval and military enterprises, had surpassed, in the pursuits of literature, even those of the most recluse and sedentary lives. And they admired his unbroken magnanimity, which, at his age, and under his circumstances, could engage him to undertake and execute so great a work as his history of the world. To increase these favourable dispositions, on which he built the hopes of recovering his liberty, he spread the report of a golden mine which he had discovered in Guyana, 
and which was sufficient, according to his representation, not only to enrich all the adventurers, but to afford immense treasures to the nation. The king gave little credit to these mighty promises, both because he believed that no such mine as the one described was anywhere in nature, and because he considered Raleigh as a man of desperate fortunes, whose business it was, by any means, to procure his freedom, and to reinstate himself in credit and authority. Thinking, however, that he had already undergone sufficient punishment, he released him from the tower, and when his vaunts of the golden mine had induced multitudes to engage with him, the king gave them permission to try the adventure, and, at their desire, he conferred on Raleigh authority over his fellow adventurers. Though strongly solicited, he still refused to grant him a pardon, which he deemed a natural consequence when he was entrusted with power and command. But James declared himself still diffident of Raleigh's intentions, and he meant, he said, to reserve the former sentence as a check upon his future behaviour. Raleigh well knew that it was far from the king's purpose to invade any of the Spanish settlements. He therefore firmly denied that Spain had planted any colonies on that part of the coast where his mine lay. When Gondomar, the ambassador of that nation, alarmed at his preparations, carried complaints to the king, Raleigh still protested the innocence of his intentions, and James assured Gondomar that he durst not form any hostile attempt, but should pay with his head for so audacious an enterprise. The minister, however, concluding that twelve armed vessels were not fitted out without some purpose of invasion, conveyed the intelligence to the court of Madrid, who immediately gave orders for arming and fortifying all their settlements, particularly those along the coast of Guyana. When the courage and avarice of the Spaniards and Portuguese had discovered so many new worlds, they were resolved to show themselves superior to the barbarous heathens whom they invaded, not only in arts and arms, but also in the justice of the quarrel. They applied to Alexander the Sixth, who then filled the papal chair, and he generously bestowed on the Spaniards the whole western, and on the Portuguese the whole eastern part of the globe. The more scrupulous Protestants, who acknowledged not the authority of the Roman pontiff, established the first discovery as the foundation of their title, and if a pirate or sea adventurer of their nation had but erected a stick or a stone on the coast as a memorial of his taking possession, they concluded the whole continent to belong to them, and thought themselves entitled to expel or exterminate, as usurpers, the ancient possessors and inhabitants. It was in this manner that Sir Walter Raleigh, about twenty-three years before, had acquired to the crown of England a claim to the continent of Guyana, a region as large as the half of Europe, and though he had immediately left the coast, yet he pretended that the English title to the whole remained certain and indefeasible. But it had happened in the meantime that the Spaniards, not knowing or not acknowledging this imaginary claim, had taken possession of a part of Guyana, had formed a settlement on the river Orinoco, had built a little town called St. Thomas, and were there working some mines of small value. To this place Raleigh directly bent his course, and remaining himself at the mouth of the river with five of the largest ships, he sent up the rest to St. Thomas, under the command of his son, and of Captain Chemis, a person entirely devoted to him. The Spaniards, who had expected this invasion, fired on the English at their landing, were repulsed, and pursued into the town. Young Raleigh, to encourage his men, called out, that this was the true mine, and none but fools looked for any other, and, advancing upon the Spaniards, received a shot, of which he immediately expired. This dismayed not Chemis and the others. They carried on the attack, got possession of the town, which they afterwards reduced to ashes, and found not in it any thing of value. Raleigh did not pretend that he had himself seen the mine which he had engaged so many people to go in quest of. It was Chemis, he said, who had formerly discovered it, and had brought him that lump of ore which promised such immense treasures. Yet Chemis, who owned that he was within two hours' march of the place, refused, on the most absurd pretenses, to take any effectual step towards finding it, and he returned immediately to Raleigh with the melancholy news of his son's death, and the ill success of the enterprise. Sensible to reproach, and dreading punishment for his behaviour, Chemis, in despair, retired into his cabin, and put an end to his own life. The other adventurers now concluded that they were deceived by Raleigh, that he never had known of any such mine as he pretended to go in search of, that his intention had ever been to plunder St. Thomas, and having encouraged his company by the spoils of that place, to have then proceeded to the invasion of the other Spanish settlements, that he expected to repair his ruined fortunes by such daring enterprises, and that he trusted to the money he should acquire for making his peace with England, or, if that view failed him, that he purposed to retire into some other country, where his riches would secure his retreat. The small acquisitions gained by the sack of St. Thomas 
discouraged Raleigh's companions from entering into these views, though there were many circumstances in the treaty and late transactions between the nations which might invite them to engage in such a piratical war against the Spaniards. When England made peace with Spain, the example of Henry the Fourth was imitated, who, at the Treaty of Vervons, finding a difficulty in adjusting all questions with regard to the Indian trade, had agreed to pass over that article in total silence. The Spaniards, having all along published severe edicts against this silence in their own favour, considered it as a tacit acquiescence of England in the established laws of Spain. The English, on the contrary, pretended that, as they had never been excluded by any treaty from commerce with any part of the King of Spain's dominions, it was still as lawful for them to trade with his settlements in either Indies as with his European territories. In consequence of this ambiguity, many adventurers from England sailed to the Spanish Indies, and met with severe punishment when caught. As they, on the other hand, often stole, and when superior in power, forced a trade with the inhabitants, and resisted, nay, sometimes plundered the Spanish governors. Violences of this nature, which have been carried to a great height on both sides, it was agreed to bury in total oblivion, because of the difficulty which was found in remedying them upon any fixed principles. But as there appeared a great difference between private adventurers in single ships, and a fleet acting under a royal commission, Raleigh's companions thought it safest to return immediately to England, and carry him along with them to answer for his conduct. It appears that he employed many artifices, first to engage them to attack the Spanish settlements, and failing of that, to make his escape into France. But all these proving unsuccessful, he was delivered into the king's hands, and strictly examined, as well as his fellow adventurers, before the Privy Council. The council, upon inquiry, found no difficulty in pronouncing that the former suspicions with regard to Raleigh's intentions had been well grounded, that he had abused the king in the representations which he had made of his projected adventure, that contrary to his instructions he had acted in an offensive and hostile manner against his majesty's allies, and that he had wilfully burned and destroyed a town belonging to the king of Spain. He might have been tried either by common law for this act of violence and piracy, or by martial law for breach of orders, but it was an established principle among lawyers that, as he lay under an actual attainder for high treason, he could not be brought to a new trial for any other crime. To satisfy, therefore, the court of Spain, which raised the loudest complaints against him, the king made use of that power which he had purposely reserved in his own hands, and signed the warrant for his execution upon his former sentence. Raleigh, finding his fate inevitable, collected all his courage, and though he had formerly made use of many mean artifices, such as feigning madness, sickness, and a variety of diseases, in order to protract his examination and procure his escape, he now resolved to act his part with bravery and resolution. "'Tis a sharp remedy, he said, but a sure one for all ills, when he felt the edge of the axe by which he was to be beheaded." His harangue to the people was calm and eloquent, and he endeavoured to revenge himself, and to load his enemies with the public hatred, by strong asseverations of facts, which, to say the least, may be esteemed very doubtful. With the utmost indifference, he laid his head upon the block, and received the fatal blow. And in his death there appeared the same great but ill-regulated mind, which, during his life, had displayed itself in all his conduct and behaviour. No measure of James's reign was attended with more public dissatisfaction than the punishment of Sir Walter Raleigh. To execute a sentence which was originally so hard, which had been so long suspended, and which seemed to have been tacitly pardoned, by conferring on him a new trust and commission, was deemed an instance of cruelty and injustice. To sacrifice to a concealed enemy of England the life of the only man in the nation who had a high reputation for valour and military experience, was regarded as meanness and indiscretion and the intimate connections which the king was now entering into with Spain, being universally distasteful, rendered this proof of his complacence still more invidious and unpopular. James had entertained an opinion, which was peculiar to himself, and which had been adopted by none of his predecessors, that any alliance below that of a great king was unworthy of a prince of Wales, and he never would allow any princess but a daughter of France or Spain to be mentioned as a match for his son. This instance of pride, which really implies meanness, as if he could receive honour from any alliance, was so well known that Spain had founded on it the hopes of governing, in the most important transactions, this monarch, so little celebrated for politics or prudence. During the life of Henry, the King of Spain had dropped some hints of bestowing on that prince his eldest daughter, whom he afterwards disposed of in marriage to the young King of France, Louis Thirteenth. At that time the views of the Spaniards were to engage James into a neutrality with regard to the succession of Cleves, which was disputed between the Protestant and Popish line. But the bait did not then take, 
and James, in consequence of his alliance with the Dutch, and with Henry the Fourth of France, marched four thousand men, under the command of Sir Edward Cecil, who joined these two powers, and put the Marquis of Brandenburg and the Palatine of Newburg in possession of that duchy. Gondomar was at this time the Spanish ambassador in England, a man whose flattery was the more artful, because covered with the appearance of frankness and sincerity, whose politics were the more dangerous, because disguised under the mask of mirth and pleasantry. He now made offer of the second daughter of Spain to Prince Charles, and, that he might render the temptation irresistible to the necessitous monarch, he gave hopes of an immense fortune which should attend the princess. The court of Spain, though determined to contract no alliance with the heretic, entered into negotiations with James, which they artfully protracted, and amidst every disappointment they still redoubled his hopes of success. The transactions in Germany, so important to the Austrian greatness, became every day a new motive for this duplicity of conduct. In that great revolution of manners which happened during the sixteenth and the seventeenth centuries, the only nations who had the honourable, though often melancholy, advantage of making an effort for their expiring privileges, were such as, together with the principles of civil liberty, were animated with a zeal for religious parties and opinions. Besides the irresistible force of standing armies, the European princes possessed this advantage, that they were descended from the ancient royal families, that they continued the same designations of magistrates, the same appearance of civil government, and restraining themselves by all the forms of legal administration, could insensibly impose the yoke on their unguarded subjects. Even the German nations, who formerly broke the Roman chains, and restored liberty to mankind, now lost their own liberty, and so with grief the absolute authority of their princes firmly established among them. In their circumstances, nothing but a pious zeal, which disregards all motives of human prudence, could have made them entertain hopes of preserving any longer those privileges which their ancestors, through so many ages, had transmitted to them. As the House of Austria, throughout all her extensive dominions, had ever made religion the pretense for her usurpations, she now met with resistance from a like principle, and the Catholic religion, as usual, had ranged itself on the side of monarchy, the Protestant on that of liberty. The states of Bohemia, having taken arms against the Emperor Matthias, continued their revolt against his successor, Ferdinand, and claimed the observance of all the edicts enacted in favour of the new religion, together with the restoration of their ancient laws and constitution. The neighbouring principalities, Silesia, Moravia, Lusatia, Austria, even the Kingdom of Hungary, took part in the quarrel, and throughout all these populous and martial provinces the spirit of discord and civil war had universally diffused itself. Ferdinand the Second, who possessed more vigour and greater abilities, though not more lenity and moderation, than are usual with the Austrian princes, strongly armed himself for the recovery of his authority, and besides employing the assistance of his subjects, who professed the ancient religion, he engaged on his side a powerful alliance of the neighbouring potentates. All the Catholic princes of the empire had embraced his defence, even Saxony, the most powerful of the Protestant. Poland had declared itself in his favour. And above all, the Spanish monarch, deeming his own interest closely connected with that of the younger branch of his family, prepared powerful succours from Italy and from the Low Countries, and he also advanced large sums for the support of Ferdinand and of the Catholic religion. End of section 55, chapter 48, part 1. Recording by Jesse Mills. Section 56 of Volume 1D of History of England From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sławek Księżycki. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 56, Chapter 48, Part 2. The states of Bohemia, alarmed at these mighty preparations, began also to solicit foreign assistance, and together with that support which they obtained from the Evangelical Union in Germany, they endeavoured to establish connections with greater princes. They cast their eyes on Frederick, Elector Palatine. They considered that, besides commanding no despicable force of his own, he was son-in-law to the King of England, and nephew to Prince Maurice, whose authority was become almost absolute in the United Provinces. 
they hoped that these princes moved by the connections of blood as well as by the tie of their common religion would interest themselves in all the fortunes of frederick and would promote his greatness they therefore made him a tender of their crown which they considered as elective and the young palatine stimulated by ambition without consulting either james or morris whose opposition he foresaw immediately accepted the offer and marched all his forces into bohemia in support of his new subjects the news of these events no sooner reached england than the whole kingdom was on fire to engage in the quarrel scarcely was the other greater with which all the states of europe in former ages flew to rescue the holy land from the dominion of infidels the nation was as yet sincerely attached to the blood of their monarchs and they considered their connection with the palatine who had married a daughter of england as very close and intimate and when they heard of catholics carrying on wars and persecutions against protestants they thought their own interests deeply concerned and regarded their neutrality as a base desertion of the cause of god and of his holy religion in such a quarrel they would gladly have marched to the opposite extremity of europe have plunged themselves into a chaos of german politics and have expended all the blood and treasure of the nation by maintaining a contest with the whole house of austria at the very time and in the very place in which it was the most potent and almost irresistible but james beside that his temper was too little enterprising for such vast undertakings was restrained by another motive which had a mighty influence over him he refused to patronize the revolt of subjects against their sovereign from the very first he denied to his son-in-law the title of king of bohemia he forbade him to be prayed for in the churches under that appellation and though he owned that he had nowise examined the pretensions privileges and constitution of the revolted states so exalted was his idea of the rights of kings that he concluded subjects must ever be in the wrong when they stood in opposition to those who had acquired or assumed that majestic title thus even in measures founded on true politics james intermixed so many narrow prejudices as diminished his authority and exposed him to the imputation of weakness and error meanwhile affairs everywhere hastened to a crisis ferdinand levied a great force under the command of the duke of bavaria and the count of bacoy and advanced upon his enemy in bohemia in the low countries spinola collected a veteran army of thirty thousand men when edmunds the king's resident at brussels made remonstrances to the archduke albert he was answered that the orders for this armament had been transmitted to spinola from madrid and that he alone knew the secret destination of it spinola again told the minister that his orders were still sealed but if edmunds would accompany him in his march to coblenz he would there open them and give him full satisfaction it was more easy to see his intentions than to prevent their success almost at one time it was known in england that frederick being defeated in the great and decisive battle of prague had fled with his family into holland and that spinola had invaded the palatinate and meeting with no resistance except from some princes of the union and from one english regiment of two thousand four hundred men commanded by the brave sir horace Ver, had in a little time reduced the greater part of that principality high were now the murmurs and complaints against the king's neutrality and inactive disposition the happiness and tranquillity of their own country became distasteful to the english when they reflected on the grievances and distresses of their protestant brethren in germany they considered not that their interposition in the wars of the continent though agreeable to religious zeal could not at that time be justified by any sound maxims of politics that however exorbitant the austrian greatness the danger was still too distant to give any just alarm to england that mighty resistance would yet to be made by so many potent and warlike princes and states in germany ere they would yield their neck to the yoke 
that France, now engaged to contract a double alliance with the Austrian family, must necessarily be soon roused from her lethargy and oppose the progress of so hated a rival that in the further advance of conquests even the interests of the two branches of that ambitious family must interfere and beget mutual jealousy and opposition that a land war carried on at such a distance would waste the blood and treasure of the english nation without any hopes of success that the sea war indeed might be both safe and successful against spain but would not affect the enemy in such vital parts as to make them stop their career of success in germany and abandon all their acquisitions and that the prospect of recovering the palatinate being at present desperate the affair was reduced to this simple question whether peace and commerce with spain or the uncertain hopes of plunder and of conquest in the indies were preferable a question which at the beginning of the king's reign had already been decided, and perhaps with reason, in favour of the former advantages. James might have defended his pacific measures by such plausible arguments, but these, though the chief, seem not to have been the sole motives which swayed him. He had entertained the notion that as his own justice and moderation had shone out so conspicuously throughout all these transactions, the whole house of austria though not awed by the power of england would willingly from mere respect to his virtue submit themselves to so equitable an arbitration he flattered himself that after he had formed an intimate connection with the spanish monarch by means of his son's marriage the restitution of the palatinate might be procured from the motive alone of friendship and personal attachment he perceived not that his inactive virtue, the more it was exalted, the greater disregard was it exposed to. He was not sensible that the Spanish match was itself attended with such difficulties that all his art of negotiation would scarcely be able to surmount them, much less that this match could in good policy be depended on as the means of procuring such extraordinary advantages. His unwarlike disposition, increased by age, riveted him still faster in his errors and determined him to seek the restoration of his son-in-law by remonstrances and entreaties by arguments and embassies rather than by blood and violence and the same defect of carriage which held him in awe of foreign nations made him likewise afraid of shocking the prejudices of his own subjects and kept him from openly avowing the measures which he was determined to pursue or perhaps he hoped to turn these prejudices to account and by their means engage his people to furnish him with supplies of which their excessive frugality had hitherto made him so sparing and reserved he first tried the expedient of a benevolence or free gift from individuals pretending the urgency of the case which would not admit of leisure for any other measure but the jealousy of liberty was now aroused and the nation regarded these pretended benevolences as real extortions contrary to law and dangerous to freedom however authorized by ancient precedent a parliament was found to be the only resource which could furnish any large supplies and wrists were accordingly issued for summoning that great council of the nation in this parliament there appeared at first nothing but duty and submission on the part of the commons and they seemed determined to sacrifice everything in order to maintain a good correspondence with their prince they would not allow no mention to be made of the new customs or impositions which had been so eagerly disputed in the former parliament the imprisonment of the members of that parliament was here by some complaint of but by the authority of the graver and more prudent part of the house that grievance was buried in oblivion and being informed that the king had remitted several considerable sums to the palatine the commons without a negative voted him two subsidies and that too at the very beginning of the session contrary to the maxims frequently adopted by their predecessors afterwards they proceeded but in a very temperate manner to the examination of grievances they found that patents had been granted to sir gilles mompesson and sir francois michel for licensing inns and alehouses 
that great sums of money had been exacted under pretext of these licenses and that such innkeepers as presumed to continue their businesses without satisfying the rapacity of the patentees had been severely punished by fine imprisonment and vexatious prosecutions the same persons had also procured a patent which they shared with sir edward villers brother to buckingham for the sole making of gold and silver thread and lace and had obtained very extraordinary powers for preventing any rivalship in these manufactures they were armed with authority to search for all goods which might interfere with their patent and even to punish at their own will and discretion the makers importers and vendors of such commodities many had grievously suffered by this exorbitant jurisdiction and the lace which had been manufactured by the patentees was universally found to be adulterated and to be composed more of copper than of the precious metals these grievances the commons represented to the king and they met with a very gracious and very cordial reception he seemed even thankful for the information given him and declared himself ashamed that such abuses unknowingly to him had crept into his administration i assure you said he had i before heard these things complained of i would have done the office of a just king and out of parliament have punished them as severely and peradventure more than you now intend to do a sentence was passed for the punishment of michel and compesson it was executed on the former the latter broke prison and escaped villers was at that time sent purposely on a foreign employment and his guilt being less enormous or less apparent than that of the others he was the more easily protected by the credit of his brother buckingham encouraged by this success the commons carried their scrutiny and still with a respectful hand into other abuses of importance the great seal was at that time in the hands of the celebrated bacon created viscount st albans a man universally admired for the greatness of his genius and beloved for the courteousness and humanity of his behaviour he was the great ornament of his age and nation and naught was wanting to render him the ornament of human nature itself but that strength of mind which might check his intemperate desire of preferment that could add nothing to his dignity and might restrain his profuse inclination to expense that could be requisite neither for his honour nor entertainment his want of economy and his indulgence to servants had involved him in necessities and in order to supply his prodigality he had been tempted to take bribes by the title of presence and that in a very open manner from suitors in chancery it appears that it had been usual for former chancellors to take presents and it is pretended that bacon who followed the same dangerous practice had still in the seat of justice preserved the integrity of a judge and had given just decrees against those very persons from whom he had received the wages of incuity complaints rose the louder on that account and at last reached the house of commons who sent up an impeachment against him to the peers the chancellor conscious of guilt deprecated the vengeance of his judges and endeavoured by a general avowal to escape the confusion of a stricter inquiry the lords insisted on a particular confession of all his corruptions he acknowledged twenty-eight articles and was sentenced to pay a fine of forty thousand pounds to be imprisoned in the tower during the king's pleasure to be forever incapable of any office place or employment and never again to sit in parliament or come within the verge of the court this dreadful sentence dreadful to a man of nice sensibility to honour he survived five years and being released in a little time from the tower his genius yet unbroken supported itself amidst involved circumstances and a depressed spirit and shone out in literary productions which have made his guilt or weaknesses be forgotten or overlooked by posterity in consideration of his great merit the king remitted his fine as well as all the other parts of his sentence conferred on him a large pension of one thousand eight hundred pounds a year and employed every expedient to alleviate the weight of his age and misfortunes 
and that great philosopher at last acknowledged with regret that he had too long neglected the true ambition of a fine genius and by plunging into business and affairs which require much less capacity but greater firmness of mind than the pursuits of learning had exposed himself to such grievous calamities the commons had entertained the idea that they were the great patrons of the people and that the redress of all grievances must proceed from them and to this principle they were chiefly beholden for the regard and consideration of the public in the execution of this office they now kept their ears open to complaints of every kind and they carried their researches into many grievances which though of no great importance could not be touched on without sensibly affecting the king and his ministers the prerogative seemed every moment to be invaded the king's authority in every article was disputed and james who was willing to correct the abuses of his power would not submit to have his power itself questioned and denied after the house therefore had sitten near six months and had as yet brought no considerable business to a full conclusion the king resolved under pretence of the advanced season to interrupt their proceedings and he sent them word that he was determined in a little time to adjourn them till next winter the commons made application to the lords and desired them to join in a petition for delaying the adjournment which was refused by the upper house the king regarded this project of a joint petition as an attempt to force him from his measures he thanked the peers for their refusal to concur in it and told them that if it were their desire he would delay the adjournment but would not so far comply with the request of the lower house and thus in these great national affairs the same peevishness which in private altercations often raises a quarrel from the smallest beginnings produced a mutual coldness and disgust between the king and the commons end of section fifty six chapter forty eight part two recording by Sławek Księżycki. Section 57 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 57, Chapter 48, Part 3. During the recess of Parliament, the King used every measure to render himself popular with the nation, and to appease the rising ill-humour of their representatives. He had voluntarily offered the Parliament to circumscribe his own prerogative, and to abrogate, for the future, his power of granting monopolies. He now recalled all the patents of that kind, and redressed every article of grievance, to the number of thirty-seven, which had ever been complained of in the House of Commons. But he gained not the end which he proposed. The disgust which had appeared at parting could not so suddenly be dispelled. He had likewise been so imprudent as to commit to prison Sir Edwin Sandys, without any known cause, besides his activity and vigour in discharging his duty as Member of Parliament. And above all, the transactions in Germany were sufficient, when joined to the King's cautions, negotiations, and delays, to inflame that jealousy of honour and religion which prevailed throughout the nation. This summer the ban of the Empire had been published against the Elector Palatine, and the execution of it was committed to the Duke of Bavaria. The Upper Palatinate was, in a little time, conquered by that prince, and measures were taken in the Empire for bestowing on him the electoral dignity of which the Palatine was then despoiled. Frederick now lived with his numerous family, in poverty and distress, either in Holland or at Sedan, with his uncle the Duke of Boulogne, and throughout all the new conquests, in both the Palatinates, as well as in Bohemia, Austria and Lusatia, the progress of the Austrian arms was attended with rigours and severities, exercised against the professors of the reformed religion. The zeal of the commons immediately moved them, upon their assembling, to take all these transactions into consideration. They framed a remonstrance, which they intended to carry to the king. They represented that the enormous growth of the Austrian power threatened the liberties of Europe, that the progress of the Catholic religion in England bred the most melancholy apprehensions, lest it should again acquire an ascendant in the kingdom that the indulgence of his majesty towards the professors of that religion had encouraged their insolence and temerity, 
that the uncontrolled conquests made by the Austrian family in Germany raised mighty expectations in the English papists, but above all that the prospect of the Spanish match elevated them so far as to hope for an entire toleration, if not the final re-establishment of their religion. The commons therefore entreated his majesty that he would immediately undertake the defence of the Palatinate, and maintain it by force of arms, that he would turn his sword against Spain, whose armies and treasures were the chief support of the Catholic interest in Europe, that he would enter into no negotiation for the marriage of his son, but with a Protestant princess, that the children of Popish recusants should be taken from their parents, and be committed to the care of Protestant teachers and schoolmasters, and that the fines and confiscations to which the Catholics were by law liable should be levied with the utmost severity. By this bold step, unprecedented in England for many years, and scarcely ever heard of in peaceable times, the commons attacked at once all the king's favourite maxims of government, his cautious and pacific measures, his lenity towards the Romish religion, and his attachment to the Spanish alliance, from which he promised himself such mighty advantages. But what most disgusted him was their seeming invasion of his prerogative, and their pretending, under colour of advice, to direct his conduct in such points as had ever been acknowledged to belong solely to the management and direction of the sovereign. He was at that time absent at Newmarket, but as soon as he heard of the intended remonstrance of the Commons, he wrote a letter to the Speaker, in which he sharply rebuked the House for openly debating matters far above their reach and capacity, and he strictly forbade them to meddle with anything that regarded his government, or deep matters of state, and especially not to touch on his son's marriage with the daughter of Spain, nor to attack the honour of that king, or any other of his friends and confederates. In order the more to intimidate them, he mentioned the imprisonment of Sir Edwin Sandys, and though he denied that the confinement of that member had been owing to any offence committed in the house, he plainly told them that he thought himself fully entitled to punish every misdemeanour in Parliament, as well during its sitting as after its dissolution, and that he intended thenceforward to chastise any man whose insolent behaviour there should minister occasion of offence. This violent letter, in which the king, though he here imitated former precedents, may be thought not to have acted altogether on the defensive, had the effect which might naturally have been expected from it. The commons were inflamed, not terrified. Secure of their own popularity, and of the bent of the nation towards a war with the Catholics abroad, and the persecution of popery at home, they little dreaded the menaces of a prince who was unsupported by military force, and whose gentle temper would, of itself, so soon disarm his severity. In a new remonstrance, therefore, they still insisted on their former remonstrance and advice, and they maintained, though in respectful terms, that they were entitled to interpose with their counsel in all matters of government, that to possess entire freedom of speech in their debates on public business was their ancient and undoubted right, and an inheritance transmitted to them from their ancestors, and that if any member abused this liberty it belonged to the House alone, who were witnesses of his offence, to inflict a proper censure upon him. So vigorous an answer was nowise calculated to appease the King. It is said, when the approach of the committee who were to present it was notified to him, he ordered twelve chairs to be brought, for that there were so many kings a-coming. His answer was prompt and sharp. He told the House that their remonstrance was more like a denunciation of war than an address of dutiful subjects, that their pretension to inquire into all state affairs, without exception, was such a plenipotence as none of their ancestors, even during the reign of the weakest princes, had ever pretended to that public transactions depended on a complication of views and intelligence, with which they were entirely unacquainted, that they could not better show their wisdom, as well as duty, than by keeping within their proper sphere, and that in any business which depended on his prerogative they had no title to interpose with their advice, except when he was pleased to desire it, and he concluded with these memorable words, And though we cannot allow of your style, in mentioning your ancient and undoubted right and inheritance, but would rather have wished that ye had said that your privileges were derived from the grace and permission of our ancestors and us, for the most of them grew from precedence, which shows rather a toleration than inheritance, yet we are pleased to give you our royal assurance that as long as you contain yourselves within the limits of your duty, we will be as careful to maintain and preserve your lawful liberties and privileges as ever any of our predecessors were, nay, as to preserve our own royal prerogative. This open pretension of the King's naturally gave great alarm to the House of Commons. They saw their title to every privilege, if not plainly denied, yet considered at least as precarious. It might be fortified by abuse, and they had already abused it. They thought proper, therefore, immediately to oppose pretension to pretension. They framed a protestation in which they repeated all their former claims for freedom of speech, and an unbounded authority to interpose with their advice and counsel, and they asserted, 
that the liberties, franchises, privileges, and jurisdictions of Parliament are the ancient and undoubted birthright and inheritance of the subjects of England. The King, informed of these increasing heats and jealousies in the House, hurried to town. He sent immediately for the journals of the Commons, and, with his own hand, before the Council, he tore out this protestation, and ordered his reasons to be inserted in the Council book. He was doubly displeased, he said, with the protestation of the lower house, on account of the manner of framing it, as well as of the matter which it contained. It was tumultuously voted, at a late hour, and in a thin house, and it was expressed in such general and ambiguous terms as might serve for a foundation to the most enormous claims, and to the most unwarrantable usurpations upon his prerogative. The meeting of the house might have proved dangerous after so violent a breach. It was no longer possible, while men were in such a temper, to finish any business. The king, therefore, prorogued the Parliament, and soon after dissolved it by proclamation, in which he also made an apology to the public for his whole conduct. The leading members of the House, Sir Edward Coke and Sir Robert Phillips, were committed to the Tower, Selden Pym and Mallory to other prisons. As a lighter punishment, Sir Dudley Diggs, Sir Thomas Crew, Sir Nathaniel Rich, Sir James Perrot, joined in commission with others, were sent to Ireland, in order to execute some business. The King at that time enjoyed, at least exercised, the prerogative of employing any man, even without his consent, in any branch of public service. Sir John Savile, a powerful man in the House of Commons, and a zealous opponent of the court, was made comptroller of the household, a privy councillor, and soon after a baron. This event is memorable, as being the first instance, perhaps, in the whole history of England, of any king's advancing a man on account of parliamentary interest, and of opposition to his measures. However irregular this practice, it will be regarded by political reasoners as one of the most early and most infallible symptoms of a regular established liberty. The king having thus, with so rash and indiscreet a hand, torn off that sacred veil which had hitherto covered the English constitution, and which threw an obscurity upon it so advantageous to royal prerogative, every man began to indulge himself in political reasonings and inquiries, and the same factions which commenced in Parliament were propagated throughout the nation. In vain did James, by reiterated proclamations, forbid the discoursing of state affairs. Such proclamations, if they had any effect, served rather to inflame the curiosity of the public, and in every company or society the late transactions became the subject of argument and debate. All history, said the partisans of the court, as well as the history of England, justify the king's position with regard to the origin of popular privileges, and every reasonable man must allow that, as monarchy is the most simple form of government, it must first have occurred to rude and uninstructed mankind. The other complicated and artificial additions were the successive invention of sovereigns and legislators, or, if they were obtruded on the prince by seditious subjects, their origin must appear, on that very account, still more precarious and unfavourable. In England, the authority of the king, in all the exterior forms of government, and in the common style of law, appears totally absolute and sovereign nor does the real spirit of the Constitution, as it has ever discovered itself in practice, fall much short of these appearances. The Parliament is created by his will. By his will it is dissolved. It is his will alone, though at the desire of both houses, which gives authority to laws. To all foreign nations the majesty of the monarch seems to merit sole attention and regard, and no subject who has exposed himself to royal indignation can hope to live with safety in the kingdom, nor can he even leave it, according to law, without the consent of his master. If a magistrate, environed with such power and splendour, should consider his authority as sacred, and regard himself as the anointed of heaven, his pretensions may bear a very favourable construction. Or, allowing them to be merely pious frauds, we need not be surprised that the same stratagem which was practised by Minos, Numa, and the most celebrated legislators of antiquity, should now, in these restless and inquisitive times, be employed by the King of England. Subjects are not raised above that quality, though assembled in Parliament the same humble respect and deference is still due to their prince. Though he indulges them in the privilege of laying before him their domestic grievances, with which they are supposed to be best acquainted, this warrants not their bold intrusion into every province of government, and, to all judicious examiners, it must appear, that the lines of duty are as much transgressed by a more independent and less respectful exercise of acknowledged powers, as by the usurpation of such as are new and unusual. The lovers of liberty throughout the nation reasoned after a different manner. It is in vain, said they, that the king traces up the English government to its first origin, in order to represent the privileges of Parliament as dependent and precarious. Prescription, and the practice of so many ages, must, long ere this time, have given a sanction to these assemblies, even though they had been derived from an origin no more dignified than that which he assigns them. 
If the written records of the English nation, as asserted, represent parliaments to have arisen from the consent of monarchs, the principles of human nature, when we trace government a step higher, must show us that monarchs themselves owe all their authority to the voluntary submission of the people. But in fact, no age can be shown when the English government was altogether an unmixed monarchy, and if the privileges of the nation have, at any period, been overpowered by violent eruptions of foreign force or domestic usurpation, the generous spirit of the people has ever seized the first opportunity of re-establishing the ancient government and constitution. Though in the style of the laws, and in the usual forms of administration, royal authority may be represented as sacred and supreme, whatever is essential to the exercise of sovereign and legislative power must still be regarded as equally divine and inviolable. Or, if any distinction be made in this respect, the preference is surely due to those national councils, by whose interposition the exorbitances of tyrannical power are restrained, and that sacred liberty is preserved, which heroic spirits in all ages have deemed more precious than life itself. Nor is it sufficient to say that the mild and equitable administration of James affords little occasion, or no occasion, of complaint. How moderate soever the exercise of his prerogative, how exact soever his observance of the laws and constitution, if he founds his authority on arbitrary and dangerous principles, it is requisite to watch him with the same care, and to oppose him with the same vigour, as if he had indulged in all the excesses of cruelty and tyranny. Amid these disputes, the wise and moderate in the nation endeavoured to preserve, as much as possible, an equitable neutrality between the opposite parties, and the more they reflected on the course of public affairs, the greater difficulty they found in fixing just sentiments with regard to them. On the one hand, they regarded the very rise of parties as a happy prognostic of the establishment of liberty. Nor could they ever expect to enjoy, in a mixed government, so invaluable a blessing, without suffering that inconvenience which, in such governments, has ever attended it. But when they considered, on the other hand, the necessary aims and pursuits of both parties, they were struck with apprehension of the consequences, and could discover no feasible plan of accommodation between them. From long practice, the Crown was now possessed of so exorbitant a prerogative that it was not sufficient for liberty to remain on the defensive, or endeavour to secure the little ground which was left her. It was become necessary to carry on an offensive war, and to circumscribe, within more narrow as well as more exact bounds, the authority of the sovereign. Upon such provocation it could not but happen that the prince, however just and moderate, would endeavour to repress his opponents, and as he stood upon the very brink of arbitrary power, it was to be feared that he would, hastily and unknowingly, pass those limits which were not precisely marked by the constitution. The turbulent government of England, ever fluctuating between privilege and prerogative, would afford a variety of precedents, which might be pleaded on both sides. In such delicate questions the people must be divided. The arms of the state were still in their hands. A civil war must ensue. A civil war where no party, or both parties, would justly bear the blame, and where the good and virtuous would scarcely know what vows to form. Were it not that liberty, so necessary to the perfection of human society, would be sufficient to bias their affections towards the side of its defenders. End of section fifty seven, chapter forty eight, part three. Recording by Jason Mills. Section fifty eight, volume one D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Underhill. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 58, Chapter 49, Part 1. James the First. To wrest the Palatinate from the hands of the Emperor and the Duke of Bavaria must always have been regarded as a difficult task for the power of England, conducted by so unwarlike a prince as James. It was plainly impossible why the breach subsisted between him and the Commons. The King's negotiations, therefore, had they been managed with ever so great dexterity, must now carry less weight with them and it was easy to elude all his applications. When Lord Digby, his ambassador to the emperor, had desired a cessation of hostilities, he was referred to the Duke of Bavaria, who commanded the Austrian armies. The Duke of Bavaria told him that it was entirely superfluous to form any treaty for that purpose. 
Hostilities are already ceased, said he, and I doubt not but I shall be able to prevent their revival by keeping firm possessions of the Palatinate till a final agreement shall be concluded between the contending parties. Notwithstanding this insult, James endeavored to resume with the emperor a treaty of accommodation, and he opened the negotiations at Brussels under the mediation of Archduke Albert and after his death, which happened about this time, under that of the Infanta, when the conferences were entered upon, it was found that the powers of these princes to determine in the controversy were not sufficient or satisfactory. Schwarzenberg, the imperial minister, was expected at London, and it was hoped that he would bring more ample authority. His commission referred entirely to the negotiation at Brussels. It was not difficult for the king to perceive that his applications were neglected by the emperor, but as he had no choice of any other expedient, and it seemed the interest of his son-in-law to keep alive his pretensions, he was still content to follow Ferdinand through all his shifts and evasions. Nor was he entirely discouraged, even when the imperial diet at Ratzeban, by the influence, or rather authority, of the emperor, though contrary to the protestation of Saxony, and of all the Protestant princes and cities, had transferred the electoral dignity from the Palatine to the Duke of Bavaria. Meanwhile, the efforts made by Frederick for the recovery of his dominions were vigorous. Three armies were levied in Germany by his authority, under three commanders, Duke Christian of Brunswick, the Prince of baden durlach and Count Mansfeld. The two former generals were defeated by Count Tilly and the Imperialists. The third, though much inferior in force to his enemies, still maintained the war, but with no equal supplies of money, either from the Palatine or the King of England. It was chiefly by pillage and free quarters in the Palatinate that he subsisted his army. As the Austrians were regularly paid, they were kept in more exact discipline, and James justly became apprehensive less so unequal a contest, besides ravaging the Palatine's hereditary dominions, would end in the total alienation of the people's affections from their ancient sovereign, by whom they were plundered, and in an attachment to their new masters, by whom they were protected. He persuaded, therefore, his son-in-law to disarm, under color of duty and submission to the emperor, and, accordingly, Mansfeld was dismissed from the Palatine's service, and that famous general withdrew his army into the Low Countries, and there received a commission from the states of the United Provinces. To show how little account was made of James's negotiations abroad, there is a pleasantry mentioned by all historians, which, for that reason, shall have place here. In a farce, acted at Brussels, a courier was introduced carrying the doleful news that the Palatinate would soon be wrested from the house of Austria. So powerful were the suckers which, from all quarters, were hastening to the relief of the despoiled elector. The king of Denmark had agreed to contribute to his assistance a hundred thousand pickled herrings, the Dutch a hundred thousand butter boxes, and the king of England a hundred thousand ambassadors. On other occasions he was painted with a scabbard, but without a sword or with a sword which nobody could draw, though several were pulling at it. It was not from his negotiations with the Emperor or the Duke of Bavaria that James expected any success in his project of restoring the Palatine. His eyes were entirely turned toward Spain, and if he could effect his son's marriage with the Infanta, he doubted not but that, after so intimate a conjunction, this other point could easily be obtained. The negotiations of that court being commonly dilatory, it was not easy for a prince of so little penetration in business to distinguish whether the difficulties which occurred were real or affected, and he was surprised, after negotiating five years on so simple a demand, that he was not more advanced than at the beginning. A dispensation from Rome was requisite for the marriage of the Infanta with a Protestant prince, and the king of Spain, having undertaken to procure that dispensation, had thereby acquired the means of retarding at pleasure, or of forwarding the marriage, 
and at the same time of concealing entirely his artifices from the court of England. In order to remove all obstacles, James dispatched Digby, soon after created Earl of Bristol, as his ambassador to Philip the Fourth, who had lately succeeded his father in the crown of Spain. He secretly employed Gage as his agent at Rome, and finding that the difference of religion was the principal, if not the sole difficulty, which retarded the marriage, he resolved to soften that objection as much as possible. He issued public orders for discharging all popish recusants who were imprisoned, and it was daily apprehended that he would forbid, for the future, the execution of the penal laws enacted against them. For this step, so opposite to the rigid spirit of his subjects, he took care to apologize, and he even endeavored to ascribe it to his great zeal for the reformed religion. He had been making applications, he said, to all foreign princes, for some indulgence to the distressed Protestants, and he was still answered by objections derived from the severity of the English laws against Catholics. It might indeed occur to him that if the extremity of religious zeal were ever to abate among Christian sects, one of them must begin, and nothing would be more honorable for England than to have led the way in sentiments so wise and moderate. Not only the religious Puritans murmured at this tolerating measure of the king, the lovers of civil liberty were alarmed at so important an exertion of prerogative. But, among other dangerous articles of authority, the kings of England were at that time possessed of the dispensing power, at least were at the constant practice of exercising it. Besides, though the royal prerogative in civil matters was then extensive, the princes, during some late reigns, had been accustomed to assume a still greater and ecclesiastical, and the king failed not to represent the toleration of Catholics as a measure entirely of that nature. By James' concession in favor of the Catholics, he attained his end. The same religious motives which had hitherto rendered the court of Madrid insincere in all the steps taken with regard to the marriage were now the chief cause of promoting it. By its means, it was there hoped the English Catholics would for the future enjoy ease and indulgence, and the Infanta would be the happy instrument of procuring to the church some tranquillity, after the many severe persecutions which it has hitherto undergone. The Earl of Bristol, a minister of vigilance and penetration, and who had formerly opposed all alliance with Catholics, was now fully convinced of the sincerity of Spain and he was ready to congratulate the king on the entire completion of his views and projects. A daughter of Spain, whom he represents as extremely accomplished, would soon, he said, arrive in England, and bring with her an immense fortune of two millions of pieces of eight, or six hundred thousand pounds sterling, a sum four times greater than Spain had ever before given with any princess, and almost equal to all the money which the Parliament, during the whole course of this reign, had hitherto granted the king. But what was of more importance to James's honor and happiness, Bristol considered this match as an infallible prognostic of the Palatine's restoration. Nor would Philip, he thought, ever have bestowed his sister and so large a fortune, under the prospect of entering next day into a war with England. So exact was his intelligence, that the most secret counsels of the Spaniards, he boasts, had never escaped him, and he had found that they had all along considered the marriage of the Infanta and the restitution of the Palatinate as measures closely connected, or altogether inseparable. However little calculated James' characters to extort so vast a concession, however improper the measures which he had pursued for attaining that end, the ambassador could not withstand the plain evidence of facts by which Philip now demonstrated his sincerity. Perhaps, too, like a wise man, he considered, that reasons of state, which are supposed solely to influence the council of monarchs, are not always the motives which there predominate. That the milder views of gratitude, honor, friendship, generosity, are frequently able, among princes as well as private persons, to counterbalance these selfish considerations that the justice and moderation of James had been so conspicuous in all these transactions, his reliance on Spain, his confidence in her friendship, 
that he had at last obtained the cordial alliance of that nation so celebrated for honor and fidelity or if politics must still be supposed the ruling motive of all public measures the maritime power of england was so considerable and the spanish dominion so divided as might well induce the council of philip to think that a sincere friendship with the masters of the sea could not be purchased by too great concessions and as james during so many years had been allured and seduced by hopes and protestations his people enraged by delays and disappointments it would probably occur that there was now no medium left between the most inveterate hatred and the most intimate alliance between the nations not to mention that as a new spirit began about this time to animate the councils of france the friendship of england became every day more necessary to the greatness and security of the spanish monarch all measures being therefore agreed on between the parties not was wanting but the dispensation from rome which might be considered as a mere formality the king justified by success now exulted in his pacific counsels and boasted of his superior sagacity and penetration when all these flattering prospects were blasted by the temerity of a man whom he had fondly exalted from a private condition to be the bane of himself of his family and of his people ever since the fall of somerset buckingham had governed with an uncontrolled sway both the court and nation and could james's eyes have been opened he had now full opportunity of observing how unfit his favorite was for the high station to which he was raised some accomplishments of a courtier he possessed of every talent of a minister he was utterly destitute headlong in his passions and incapable equally of prudence and of dissimulation sincere from violence rather than candor expensive from profusion more than generosity a warm friend a furious enemy but without any choice or discernment neither with these qualities he had early and quickly mounted to the highest rank and partook at once of the insolence which attends a fortune newly acquired and the impetuosity which belongs to the persons born in high stations and unacquainted with opposition among those who had experienced the arrogance of this overgrown favorite the prince of wales himself had not been entirely spared and a great coldness if not an enmity had for that reason taken place between them buckingham desirous of an opportunity which might connect him with the prince and overcome his aversion and at the same time envious of the great credit acquired by bristol in the spanish negotiation bethought himself of an expedient by which he might at once gratify both these inclinations he represented to charles that persons of his exalted station were peculiarly unfortunate in their marriage the chief circumstance of his life and commonly received into their arms a bride unknown to them to whom they were unknown not endeared by sympathy not obliged by service wooed by treaties alone by negotiations by political interests that however accomplished the infanta she must still consider herself as a melancholy victim of state and could not but think with aversion of that day when she was to enter the bed of a stranger and passing into a foreign country and a new family but adieu forever to her father's house and to her native land that it was in the prince's power to soften all these rigors and lay such an obligation on her as would attach the most indifferent temper as would warm the coldest affections that his journey to madrid would be an unexpected gallantry which would equal all the fictions of spanish romance and suiting the amorous and enterprising character of that nation must immediately introduce him to the princess under the agreeable character of a devoted lover and daring adventurer that the negotiations with regard to the palatinate which had hitherto languished in the hands of ministers would quickly he terminated by so illustrious an agent seconded by the mediation and entreaties of the grateful infanta that spanish generosity moved by that unexampled trust and confidence would make concessions beyond what could be expected from the political views and considerations and that he would quickly return to the king with the glory of having re-established the unhappy palatine by the same enterprise which procured him the affections and the person of the spanish princess 
the mind of the young prince replete with candour was inflamed by these generous and romantic ideas suggested by buckingham he agreed to make application to the king for his approbation they chose the moment of his kindest and most jovial humour and more by the earnestness which they expressed than by the force of their reasons they obtained a hasty and unguarded consent to their undertaking and having engaged his promise to keep their purpose secret they left him in order to make preparations for their journey no sooner was the king alone than his temper more cautious than sanguine suggested very different views of the matter and represented every difficulty and danger which could occur he reflected that however the world might pardon this sally of youth in the prince they would never forgive himself who at his years and after his experience could entrust only his son the heir of his crown the prop of his age to the discretion of foreigners without so much as providing the frail security of a safe conduct in his favour that if the spanish monarch were sincere in his professions a few months must finish the treaty of marriage and bring the infant into england if he were not sincere the folly was still more egregious of committing the prince into his hands that philip when possessed of so invaluable a pledge might well rise in his demands and impose harder conditions of treaty and that the temerity of the enterprise was so apparent that the event how prosperous soever could not justify it and if disastrous it would render himself infamous to his people and ridiculous to all posterity tormented with these reflections as soon as the prince and buckingham returned for their dispatches he informed them of all the reasons which had determined him to change his resolution and he begged them to desist from so foolish an adventure the prince received the disappointment with sorrowful submission and silent tears buckingham presumed to speak in an imperious tone which he had ever experienced to be prevalent over his too easy master he told the king that nobody for the future would believe anything he said when he retracted so soon the promise so solemnly given that he plainly discerned this change of resolution to proceed from another breach of his word and communicating the matter to some rascal who had furnished him with those pitiful reasons which he had alleged and he doubted not but he should hereafter know who his counsellor had been and that if he receded from what he had promised it would be such a disobligation to the prince who had now set his heart upon the journey after his majesty's approbation that he could never forget it nor forgive any man who had been the cause of it the king with great earnestness fortified by many oaths made his apology by denying that he had communicated the matter to any and finding himself assailed as well by the boisterous importunities of buckingham as by the warm entreaties of his son whose applications had hitherto on other occasions been always dutiful never earnest he had again the weakness to assent to their purposed journey it was agreed that sir francis coddington alone the prince's secretary and end mine porter gentlemen of his bedchamber should accompany them and the former being at that time in the antechamber he was immediately called in by the king's orders james told coddington that he had always been an honest man and therefore he was now to trust him in an affair of the highest importance which he was not upon his life to disclose to any man whatever coddington added he here is baby charles and steny these ridiculous appellations he usually gave to the prince in buckingham who have a great mind to go post into spain and fetch home the infanta they will have but two more in their company and have chosen you for one what think you of the journey sir francis who was a prudent man and had resided some years in spain as the king's agent was struck with all the obvious objections to such an enterprise and scrupled not to declare them the king threw himself upon his bed and cried i told you this before and fell into a new passion and new lamentations complaining that he was undone and should lose baby charles the prince showed by his countenance that he was extremely dissatisfied with coddington's discourse but buckingham broke into an open passion against him the king he told him asked him only of the journey and of the manner of travelling particulars of which he might be a competent judge 
having gone the road so often by post, but that he, without being called to it, had the presumption to give his advice upon matters of state, and against his master, which he should repent as long as he lived. A thousand other reproaches he added, which put the poor king into a new agony on behalf of his servant, who, he foresaw, would suffer for answering him honestly. Upon which he said with some emotion, Nay, by God, Steny, you are much to blame for using him so. He answered me directly to the question which I asked him, and very honestly and wisely. And yet, you know, he said no more than I told you before he was called in. However, after all this passion on both sides, James renewed his consent, and proper directions were given to the journey. Nor was he now at any loss to discover that the whole intrigue was originally contrived by Buckingham, as well as pursued violently by his spirit and impetuosity. These circumstances, which so well characterize the persons, seem to have been related by Coddington to Lord Clarendon, from whom they are here transcribed, and though minute, are not undeserving of a place in history. The Prince of Buckingham, with their two attendants, and Sir Richard Graham, master of horse to Buckingham, passed disguised and undiscovered through France, and they even ventured into a court ball at Paris, where Charles saw the Princess Henrietta, whom he afterwards espoused, and who was at that time in the bloom of youth and beauty. In eleven days after the departure from London, they arrived at Madrid, and surprised everybody by a step so unusual among great princes. The Spanish monarch immediately paid Charles a visit, expressed the utmost gratitude for the confidence reposed in him, and made warm protestations of a correspondent confidence and friendship. By the most studied civilities he showed the respect which he bore to his royal guest. He gave him a golden key which opened all his apartments, that the prince might, without any introduction, have access to him at all hours. He took the left hand of him on every occasion, except in the apartments assigned to Charles. For there, he said, the prince was at home. Charles was introduced into the palace with the same pomp and ceremony that attends the king of Spain on their coronation. The council received public orders to obey him as the king himself. End of section 59, chapter 49, part 1. Section 59 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 59, Chapter 49, Part 2. Oliveros, too, though a grandee of Spain, who had the right of being covered before his own king, would not put on his hat in the prince's presence. All the prisons of Spain were thrown open, and all the prisoners received their freedom, as if the event the most honorable and most fortunate had happened to the monarchy and every sumptuary law with regard to apparel was suspended during Charles's residence in Spain. The Infanta, however, was only shown to her lover in public, the Spanish ideas of decency being so strict as not to allow of any further intercourse till the arrival of the dispensation. The point of honor was carried so far by that generous people, that no attempt was made, on account of the advantage which they had acquired, of imposing any harder conditions of treaty. Their pious zeal only prompted them, on one occasion, to desire more concessions in the religious articles. But, upon the opposition of Bristol, accompanied with some reproaches, they immediately desisted. The Pope, however, hearing of the Prince's arrival in Madrid, taxed some new clauses to the dispensation and it became necessary to transmit the articles to London, that the king might ratify them. This treaty, which was made public, consisted of several articles, chiefly regarding the exercise of the Catholic religion by the Infanta and her household. 
nothing could reasonably be found fault with except one article in which the king promised that the children should be educated by the princess till ten years of age this condition could not be insisted upon but with a view of seasoning their minds with the catholic principles and though so tender an age seemed a sufficient security against theological prejudices yet the same reason which made the pope insert that article should have induced the king to reject it besides the public treaty there were separate articles privately sworn to by the king in which he promised to suspend the penal laws enacted against catholics to procure a repeal of them in parliament and to grant a toleration for the exercise of the Catholic religion in private houses. Great murmurs, we may believe, would have arisen against these articles, had they been made known to the public. Since we find it to have been imputed as an enormous crime to the prince that, having received about this time a very civil letter from the Pope, he was induced to return a very civil answer. Meanwhile, Gregory the Fifteenth, who granted the dispensation, died, and Urban the Eighth was chosen in his place. Upon this event, the nuncio refused to deliver the dispensation till it should be renewed by Urban, and that crafty pontiff delayed sending a new dispensation in hopes that, during the prince's residence in Spain, some expedient might be fallen upon to effect his conversion. The king of England, as well as the prince, became impatient. On the first hint, Charles obtained permission to return, and Philip graced his departure with all the circumstances of elaborate civility and respect which had attended his reception. He even erected a pillar on the spot where they took leave of each other, as a monument of mutual friendship. And the prince, having sworn to the observance of all the articles, entered on his journey, and embarked on board the English fleet at St. Andero. The character of Charles, composed of decency, reserve, modesty, sobriety, virtue so agreeable to the manners of the Spaniards, the unparalleled confidence which he had reposed in their nation, the romantic gallantry which he had practised towards the princess, all these circumstances, joined to his youth and advantageous figure, had endeared him to the whole court of Madrid and had impressed the most favourable ideas of him. But in the same proportion that the prince was beloved and esteemed, was Buckingham despised and hated. His behaviour, composed of English familiarity and French vivacity, his sallies of passion, his indecent freedoms with the prince, his dissolute pleasures, his arrogant, impetuous temper, which he neither could nor cared to disguise, Qualities like these could, most of them, be esteemed nowhere, but to the Spaniards were the objects of peculiar aversion. They could not conceal their surprise that such a youth could intrude into a negotiation, now conducted to a period by so accomplished a minister as Bristol, and could assume to himself all the merit of it. They lamented the infanta's fate, who must be approached by a man whose temerity seemed to respect no laws, divine or human and when they observed that he had the imprudence to insult the conde duke of olivarez their prime minister every one who was ambitious of paying court to the spanish became desirous of showing a contempt for the english favourite the duke of muckingham told olivarez that his own attachment to the spanish nation and to the king of spain was extreme that he would contribute to every measure which should cement the friendship between england and them and that his peculiar ambition would be to facilitate the prince's marriage with the infanta but he added with a sincerity equally insolent and indiscreet with regard to you sir in particular you must not consider me as your friend but must ever expect from me all possible enmity and opposition the conde duke replied with a becoming dignity that he very willingly accepted of what was proffered him and on these terms the favourites parted. Buckingham, sensible how odious he was become to the Spaniards, and dreading the influence which that nation would naturally acquire after the arrival of the Infanta, resolved to employ all his credit in order to prevent their marriage. By what arguments he could engage the prince to offer such an insult to the Spanish nation, from whom he had met with such generous treatment, 
by what colors he could disguise the ingratitude and imprudence of such a measure these are totally unknown to us we may only conjecture that the many unavoidable causes of delay which had so long prevented the arrival of the dispensation had afforded to buckingham a pretense for throwing on the spaniards the imputation of insincerity in the whole treaty it also appears that his impetuous and domineering character had acquired what it ever after maintained a total ascendant over the gentle and modest temper of charles and when the prince left madrid he was firmly determined notwithstanding all his professions to break off the treaty with spain it is not likely that buckingham prevailed so easily with james to abandon a project which during so many years had been the object of all his wishes and which he had now unexpectedly conducted to a happy period a rupture with spain the loss of two millions were prospects little agreeable to this pacific and indigent monarch but finding his only son bent against a match which had always been opposed by his people and his parliament he yielded to difficulties which he had not courage or strength of mind sufficient to overcome the prince therefore and buckingham on their arrival at london assumed entirely the direction of the negotiation and it was their business to seek for pretenses by which they could give a colour to their intended breach of treaty though the restitution of the palatinate had ever been considered by james as a natural or necessary consequence of the spanish alliance he had always forbidden his ministers to insist on it as a preliminary article to the conclusion of the marriage treaty he considered that this principality was now in the hands of the emperor and the duke of bavaria and that it was no longer in the king of spain's power by a single stroke of his pen to restore it to its ancient master the strict alliance of spain with these princes would engage philip he thought to soften so disagreeable a demand by every art of negotiation and many articles must of necessity be adjusted before such an important point could be effected it was sufficient in james's opinion if the sincerity of the spanish court could for the present be ascertained and dreading further delays of the marriage so long wished for he was resolved to trust the palatine's full restoration to the event of future councils and deliberations this whole system of negotiation buckingham now reversed and he overturned every supposition upon which the treaty had hitherto been conducted after many fruitless artifices were employed to delay or prevent the espousals bristol received positive orders not to deliver the proxy which had been left in his hands or to finish the marriage till security were given for the full restitution of the palatinate philip understood this language he had been acquainted with the disgust received by buckingham and deeming him a man capable of sacrificing to his own ungovernable passions the greatest interests of his master and of his country his had expected that the unbounded credit of that favourite would be employed to embroil the two nations determined however to throw the blame of the rupture entirely on the english he delivered into bristol's hand a written promise by which he bound himself to procure the restoration of the palatinate either by persuasion or by every other possible means and when he found that this concession gave no satisfaction he ordered the infanta to lay aside the title of princess of wales which she bore after the arrival of the dispensation from rome and to drop the study of the english language any thinking that such rash counsels as now governed the court of england would not stop at the breach of the marriage treaty he ordered preparations for war immediately to be made throughout all his dominions thus james having by means inexplicable from the ordinary rules of politics conducted so near an honourable period the marriage of his son and the restoration of his son-in-law failed at last of his purpose by means equally unaccountable but though the expedients already used by buckingham were sufficiently inglorious both for himself and for the nation it was necessary for him ere he could fully effect his purpose to employ artifices still more dishonourable the king having broken with spain was obliged to concert new measures and without the assistance of parliament no effectual step of any kind could be taken 
the benevolence which during the interval had been rigorously exacted for recovering the palatinate though levied for no popular an end had procured to the king less money than ill-will from his subjects whatever discouragements therefore he might receive from his ill agreement with former parliaments there was a necessity of summoning once more this assembly and it might be hoped that the spanish alliance which gave such umbrage being abandoned the commons would now be better satisfied with the king's administration in his speech to the houses james dropped some hints of his cause of compliance against spain and he graciously condescended to ask the advice of parliament which he had ever before rejected with regard to the conduct of so important so affair as his son's marriage buckingham delivered to a committee of lords and commons a long narrative which he pretended to be true and complete of every step taken in the negotiations with philip but partly by the suppression of some facts partly by the false colouring laid on others this narrative was calculated entirely to mislead the parliament and to throw on the court of spain the reproach of artifice and insincerity he said that after many years negotiation the king found not himself any nearer his purpose and that bristol had never brought the treaty beyond general professions and declarations that the prince doubting the good intentions of spain resolved at last to take a journey to madrid and put the matter to the utmost trial that he there found such artificial dealing as made him conclude all the steps taken toward the marriage to be false and deceitful that the restitution of the palatinate which had ever been regarded by the king as an essential preliminary was not seriously intended by spain and that after enduring much bad usage the prince was obliged to return to england without any hopes either of obtaining the infanta or of restoring the elector palatine this narrative which considering the importance of the occasion and the solemnity of that assembly to which it was delivered deserves great blame was yet vouched for truth by the prince of wales who was present and the king himself lent it indirectly his authority by telling the parliament that it was by his orders buckingham laid the whole affair before them the conduct of these princes is difficult fully to excuse it is in vain to plead the youth and inexperience of charles unless his inexperience and youth as is probable if not certain really led him into error and made him swallow all the falsities of buckingham and though the king was here hurried from his own measures by the impetuosity of others nothing should have induced him to prostitute his character and seemed to vouch the impostures at least false colourings of his favourite of which he had so good reason to entertain a suspicion buckingham's narrative however artfully disguised contains so many contradictory circumstances as were sufficient to open the eyes of all reasonable men but it concurred so well with the passions and prejudices of the parliament that no scruple was made of immediately adopting it charmed with having obtained at length the opportunity so long wished for of going to war with papists they little thought of future consequences but immediately advised the king to break off both treaties with spain as well that which regarded the marriage as that for the restitution of the palatinate the people ever greedy of war till they suffer by it displayed their triumph at these violent measures by public bonfires and rejoicings and by insults on the spanish ministers buckingham was now the favourite of the public and of the parliament sir edward coke in the house of commons called him the saviour of the nation every place resounded with his praises and he himself intoxicated by a popularity which he enjoyed so little time and which he so ill deserved violated all duty to his indulgent master and entered into cables with the puritanical members who had ever opposed the royal authority he even encouraged schemes for abolishing the orders of bishops and selling the dean and chapter lands in order to defray the expenses of a spanish war and the king though he still entertained projects for temporizing and for forming an accommodation with spain was so borne down by the torrent of popular prejudices conducted and increased by buckingham that he was at last obliged in a speech to parliament to declare in favour of hostile measures if they would engage to support him 
doubts of their sincerity in this respect doubts which the event showed not to be ill-grounded had probably been one cause of his former pacific and dilatory measures in his speech on this occasion the king began with lamenting his own unhappiness that having so long valued himself on the epithet of the pacific monarch he should now in his old age be obliged to exchange the blessing of peace for the inevitable calamities of war he represented to them the immense and continued expense requisite for military armaments and besides supplies from time to time as they should become necessary he demanded a vote of six subsidies and twelve fifteenths as a proper stock before the commencement of hostilities he told them of his intolerable debts cheaply contracted by the sums remitted to the palatine but he added that he did not insist on any supply for his own relief and that it was sufficient for him if the honor and security of the public were provided for to remove all suspicion he who had ever strenuously maintained his prerogative and who had even extended it into some points esteemed doubtful now made an imprudent concession of which the consequences might have proved fatal to royal authority he voluntarily offered that the money voted should be paid to a committee of parliament and should be issued by them without being entrusted to his management the commons willingly accepted of this concession so unusual in an english monarch they voted him only three subsidies and three fifteenths and they took no notice of his complaints and they took no notice of the complaints which he made of his own wants and necessities advantage was also taken of the present good agreement between the king and parliament in order to pass the bill against monopolies which had formerly been encouraged by the king but which had failed by the rupture between him and the last house of commons this bill was conceived in such terms as to render it merely declaratory and all monopolies were condemned as contrary to law and to the known liberties of the people it was there supposed that every subject of england had entire power to dispose of his own actions provided he did no injury to any of his fellow subjects and that no prerogative of the king no power of any magistrate nothing but the authority alone of laws could restrain that unlimited freedom the full prosecution of this noble principle into all its natural consequences has at last through many contests produced that singular and happy government which we enjoy at present the house of commons also corroborated by a new precedent the important power of impeachment which two years before they had exercised in the case of chancellor bacon and which had lain dormant for near two centuries except when they served as instruments of royal vengeance the earl of middlesex had been raised by buckingham's interest from the rank of a london merchant to be treasurer of england and by his activity and address seemed not unworthy of that preferment but as he incurred the displeasures of his patron by scrupling or refusing some demands of money during the prince's residence in spain that favorite vowed revenge and employed all his credit among the commons to procure an impeachment of the treasurer the king was extremely dissatisfied with this measure and prophesied to the prince and duke that they would live to have their fill of parliamentary prosecutions in a speech to the parliament he endeavored to apologize for middlesex and to soften the accusation against him the charge however was still maintained by the commons and the treasurer was found guilty by the peers though the misdemeanors proved against him were neither numerous nor important the accepting of two presents of five hundred pounds apiece for passing two patents was the article of greatest weight his sentence was to be fined fifty thousand pounds for the king's use and to suffer all the other penalties formerly inflicted upon bacon the fine was afterwards remitted by the prince when he mounted the throne this session an address was also made very disagreeable to the king craving the severe execution of the laws against catholics his answer was gracious and condescending though he declared against persecution as being an improper measure for the suppression of any religion according to the received maxim that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church he also condemned an entire indulgence of the catholics and seemed to represent a middle course as the most humane and most politic 
he went so far as even to affirm with an oath that he never had entertained any thoughts of granting a toleration to these religionists the liberty of exercising their worship in private houses which he had secretly agreed to in the spanish treaty did not appear to him deserving that name and it was probably by means of this explication he thought that he had saved his honour and as buckingham in this narrative confessed that the king had agreed to a temporary suspension of the penal laws against the catholics which he distinguished from a toleration a term at that time extremely odious james naturally deemed his meaning to be sufficiently explained and feared not any reproach of falsehood or duplicity on account of this asseveration after all these transactions the parliament was prorogued by the king who let fall some hints though in gentle terms of the sense which he entertained of their unkindness in not supplying his necessities end of section fifty nine chapter forty nine part two Section 60 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 60 chapter forty nine part three james unable to resist so strong a combination as that of his people his parliament his son and his favourite had been compelled to embrace measures for which from temper as well as judgment he had ever entertained a most settled aversion though he dissembled his resentment he began to estrangle himself from buckingham to whom he ascribed all those violent counsels and whom he considered as the author both of the prince's journey to spain and of the breach of the marriage treaty the arrival of bristol he impatiently longed for and it was by the assistance of that minister whose wisdom he respected and whose views he approved that he hoped in time to extricate himself from his present difficulties during the prince's abode in spain that able negotiator had ever opposed though unsuccessfully to the impetuous measures suggested by buckingham his own wise and well-tempered counsels after charles's departure he still upon the first appearance of a change of resolution interposed his advice and strenuously insisted on the sincerity of the spaniards in the conduct of the treaty as well as the advantages which england much reap from the completion of it enraged to find that his successful labours should be rendered abortive by the levities and caprices of an insolent minion he would understand no hints and nothing but express orders from his master could engage him to make that demand which he was sensible must put a final period to the treaty he was not therefore surprised to hear that buckingham had declared himself his open enemy and on all occasions had thrown out many violent reflections against him nothing could be of greater consequence to buckingham than to keep bristol at a distance both from the king and the parliament lest the power of truth enforced by so well informed a speaker should open scenes which were but suspected by the former and of which the latter had as yet entertained no manner of jealousy he applied therefore to james whose weakness disguised to himself under the appearance of finesse and dissimulation was now become absolutely incurable a warrant for sending bristol to the tower was issued immediately upon his arrival in england and though he was soon released from confinement yet orders were carried him from the king to retire to his country seat and to abstain from all attendance in parliament he obeyed but loudly demanded an opportunity of justifying himself and of laying his whole conduct before his master on all occasions he protested his innocence and threw on his enemy the blame of every miscarriage buckingham and at his instigation the prince declared that they would be reconciled to bristol if he would but acknowledge his errors and ill conduct but the spirited nobleman jealous of his honour refused to buy favour at so high a price 
James had the equity to say that the insisting on that condition was a strain of unexampled tyranny, but Buckingham scrupled not to assert, with his usual presumption, that neither the king, the prince, nor himself were as yet satisfied of Bristol's innocence. While the attachment of the prince to Buckingham, while the timidity of James, or the shame of changing his favorite, kept the whole court in awe, the Spanish ambassador in Oyosa endeavored to open the king's eyes, and to cure his fears by instilling greater fears into him. He privately slipped into his hand a paper, and gave him a signal to read it alone. He there told him that he was as much a prisoner at London as ever Francis I was at Madrid that the prince and Buckingham had conspired together, and had the whole court at their devotion, that cables among the popular leaders in Parliament were carrying on, to the extreme prejudice of his authority, that the project was to confine him to some of his hunting seats, and to commit the whole administration to Charles, and that it was necessary for him, by one vigorous effort, to vindicate his authority, and to punish those who had so long and so much abused his friendship and beneficence. What credit James gave to this representation does not appear. He only discovered some faint symptoms, which he instantly retracted, of dissatisfaction with Buckingham. All his public measures, and all the alliances into which he entered, were founded on the system of enmity to the Austrian family, and of war to be carried on for the recovery of the Palatinate. The state of the United Provinces were at this time governed by Maurice and that aspiring prince, sensible that his credit would languish during peace, had, on the expiration of the twelve years' truce, renewed the war with the Spanish monarchy. His great capacity in the military art would have compensated the inferiority of his forces, had not the Spanish armies been commanded by Spinola, a general equally renowned for conduct, and more celebrated for enterprise and activity. In such a situation, nothing could be more welcome to the Republic than the prospect of a rupture between James and the Catholic King, and they flattered themselves, as well from the natural union of interests between them and England, as from the influence of the present conjuncture, that powerful succors would soon march to their relief. Accordingly, an army of six thousand men was levied in England, and sent over to Holland, commanded by four young noblemen. Essex, Oxford, Southampton, and Willoughby, who were ambitious of distinguishing themselves in so popular a cause, and of acquiring military experience under so renowned a captain as Maurice. It might reasonably have been expected that, as religious zeal had made the recovery of the Palatinate appear a point of such vast importance in England, the same effect must have been produced in France by the force merely of political views and considerations while that principality remained in the hands of the house of austria the french dominions were surrounded on all sides by the possessions of that ambitious family and might be invaded by superior forces from every quarter it concerned the king of france therefore to prevent the peaceable establishment of the emperor in his new conquests and both by the situation and greater power of his state he was much better enabled than James to give succor to the distressed Palatine. Notwithstanding the sensible experience which James might have acquired of this unsurmountable antipathy entertained by his subjects against an alliance with Catholics, he still persevered in the opinion that his son would be degraded by receiving into his bed a princess of less than royal extraction. After the rupture, therefore, with Spain, nothing remained but an alliance with France and to that court he immediately applied himself. The same allurements had not here place, which had so long entangled him in the Spanish negotiation. The portion promised was much inferior, and the peaceable restoration of the Palatine could not thence be expected. But James was afraid lest his son should be altogether disappointed of a bride, and therefore, as soon as the French king demanded, for the honor of his crown, the same terms which had been granted to the Spanish, he was prevailed with to comply. And as the prince, during his abode in Spain, had given a verbal promise to allow the infanta the education of her children till the age of thirteen, this article was here inserted into the treaty, and to that imprudence is generally imputed the present distressed condition of his posterity. 
the court of england however it must be confessed always pretended even in the memorials to the french court that all the favorable conditions granted to the catholics were inserted in the marriage treaty merely to please the pope and that their strict execution was by an agreement with france secretly dispensed with as much as the conclusion of the marriage treaty was acceptable to the king as much were all the military enterprises disagreeable both from the extreme difficulty of the undertaking in which he was engaged and from his own incapacity for such a scene of action during the spanish negotiation heidelberg and mannheim had been taken by the imperial forces and frankendale though the garrison was entirely english was closely besieged by them after reiterated remonstrances from james spain interposed and procured a suspension of arms during eighteen months but as frankendale was the only place of frederick's ancient dominions which was still in his hands ferdinand desirous of withdrawing his forces from the palatinate and of leaving that state in security was unwilling that so important a fortress should remain in the possession of the enemy to compromise all differences it was agreed to sequestrate it into the hands of the infanta as a neutral person upon condition that after the expiration of the truce it should be delivered to frederick though peace should not at that time be concluded between him and ferdinand after the unexpected rupture with spain the infanta when james demanded the execution of the treaty offered him peaceable possession of frankendale and even promised a safe conduct for the garrison to the spanish netherlands but there was some territory of the empire interposed between her state and the palatinate and for passage over that territory no terms were stipulated by this chicane which certainly had not been employed if amity with spain had been preserved the palatine was totally dispossessed of his patrimonial dominions the english nation however and james's warlike council were not discouraged it was still determined to reconquer the palatinate a state lying in the midst of germany possessed entirely by the emperor and duke of bavaria surrounded by potent enemies and cut off from all communication with england count mansfeld was taken into pay and an english army of twelve thousand foot and two hundred horse was levied by a general press throughout the kingdom during the negotiation with france vast promises had been made though in general terms by the french ministry not only that a free passage should be granted to the english troops but that powerful succors should also join them in their march towards the palatinate in england all these professions were hastily interpreted to be positive engagements the troops under manfeldt's command were embarked at dover but upon sailing over to clay found no orders yet arrived for their admission after waiting in vain during some time they were obliged to sail towards zealand where it had also been neglected to concert proper measures for their disembarkation and some scruples arose among the states on account of the scarcity of provisions meanwhile a pestilential distemper crept in among the english forces so long cooped up in narrow vessels half the army died while on board and the other half weakened by sickness appeared too small a body to march into the palatinate and thus ended this ill-concerted and fruitless expedition the only disaster which happened to england during the prosperous and pacific reign of james that reign was now drawing towards a conclusion with peace so successfully cultivated and so passionately loved by this monarch his life also terminated this spring he was seized with a tertian ague and when encouraged by his courtiers with the common proverb that such a distemper during that season was health for a king he replied that the proverb was meant of a young king after some fits he found himself extremely weakened and sent for the prince whom he extorted to bear a tender affection for his wife but to preserve a constancy in religion to protect the church of england and to extend his care toward the unhappy family of the palatine with decency and courage he prepared himself for his end and he expired on the twenty seventh of march after a reign over england of twenty-two years and some days and in the fifty-ninth year of his age 
his reign over Scotland was almost of equal duration with his life. In all history, it would be difficult to find a reign less illustrious, yet more unspotted and unblemished, than that of James in both kingdoms. No prince, so little enterprising and so inoffensive, was ever so much exposed to the opposite extremes of calumny and flattery, of satire and panegyric, and the factions which began in his time, being still continued, have made his character be as much disputed to this day as is commonly that of princes who are our contemporaries. Many virtues, however, it must be owned, he was possessed of, but scarcely any of them pure or free from the contagion of the neighboring vices. His generosity bordered on profusion, his learning on pedantry, his pacific disposition on pusillanimity, his wisdom on cunning, his friendship on light fancy and boyish fondness. While he imagined that he was only maintaining his own authority, he may, perhaps, be suspected, in a few of his actions, and still more of his pretensions, to have somewhat encroached on the liberties of his people, while he endeavored, by an exact neutrality, to acquire the goodwill of all his neighbors, he was able to preserve fully the esteem and regard of none. His capacity was considerable but fitter to discourse on general maxims than to conduct any intricate business. His intentions were just, but more adapted to the conduct of private life than to the government of kingdoms. Awkward in his person and ungainly in his manners, he was ill-qualified to command respect. Partial and undiscerning in his affections, he was little fitted to acquire general love. Of a feeble temper more than of a frail judgment, exposed to our ridicule from his vanity but exempt from our hatred by his freedom from pride and arrogance and upon the whole it may be pronounced of his character that all his qualities were sullied with weakness and embellished by humanity of political courage he certainly was destitute and thence chiefly is derived the strong prejudice which prevails against his personal bravery an inference however which must be owned, from general experience, to be extremely fallacious. He was only once married, to Anne of Denmark, who died on the 3rd of March, 1619, in the 45th year of her age, a woman eminent neither for her vices nor her virtues. She loved shows and expensive amusements, but possessed little taste in her pleasures. A great comet appeared about the time of her death, and the vulgar esteemed it the prognostic of that event. So considerable in their eyes are even the most insignificant princes. He left only one son, Charles, then in the twenty-fifth year of his age, and one daughter, Elizabeth, married to the elector Palatine. She was aged twenty-nine years. Those alone remained of six legitimate children born to him. He never had any illegitimate, and he never discovered any tendency even the smallest, toward a passion for any mistress. The archbishops of Canterbury during this reign were Whitgift, who died in 1604, Bancroft in 1610, Abbott, who survived the king, the chancellors, Lord Ellismore, who resigned in 1617, Bacon was first Lord Keeper till 1619, then was created chancellor, and was displaced in 1621. Williams, Bishop of Lincoln, was created Lord Keeper in his place. The high treasurers were the Earl of Dorset, who died in 1609, the Earl of Salisbury in 1612, the Earl of Suffolk, fined and displaced for bribery in 1618. Lord Mandeville resigned in 1621, the Earl of Middlesex, displaced in 1624. The Earl of Marlborough succeeded. The Lord Admirals were the Earl of Nottingham, who resigned in 1618, the Earl, afterward Duke of Buckingham. The Secretaries of State were the Earl of Salisbury, Sir Ralph Winwood, Nanton, Calvert, Lord Conway, Sir Albertus Morton. The number of the House of Lords in the first Parliament of this reign were 78 temporal peers. The numbers in the first Parliament of Charles were 97. Consequently, James, during that period, created nineteen new peerages above those that expired. 
The House of Commons, in the first Parliament of this reign, consisted of 467 members. It appears that four boroughs revived their charters, which they had formerly neglected. And as the first Parliament of Charles consisted of 494 members, we may infer that James created ten new boroughs. End of section 60, chapter 49, part 3. Section 61 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume volume one d section sixty one appendix to the reign of james i part one it may not be improper at this period to make a pause and to take a survey of the state of the kingdom with regard to government manners finances arms trade learning where a just notion is not formed of these particulars history can be little instructive and often will not be intelligible. We may safely pronounce that the English government, at the accession of the Scottish line, was much more arbitrary than it is at present, the prerogative less limited, the liberties of the subject less accurately defined and secured. Without mentioning other particulars, the courts alone of High Commission and Star Chamber were sufficient to lay the whole kingdom at the mercy of the prince. The Court of High Commission had been erected by Elizabeth in consequence of an Act of Parliament passed in the beginning of her reign. By this Act it was thought proper, during the great revolution of religion, to arm the sovereign with full powers in order to discourage and suppress opposition. All appeals from the inferior ecclesiastical courts were carried before the High Commission, and, of consequence, the whole life and doctrine of the clergy lay directly under its inspection every breach of the act of uniformity every refusal of the ceremonies was cognizable in this court and during the reign of elizabeth had been punished by deprivation by fine confiscation and imprisonment james contented himself with the gentler penalty of deprivation nor was that punishment inflicted with rigor on every offender archbishop spotswood tells us that fee was informed by bancroft the primate several years after the king's accession that not above forty-five clergymen had then been deprived all the catholics too were liable to be punished by this court if they exercised any act of their religion or sent abroad their children or other relatives to receive that education which they could not procure them in their own country popish priests were thrown into prison and might be delivered over to the law which punished them with death though that severity had been sparingly exercised by elizabeth and never almost by james in a word that liberty of conscience which we so highly and so justly value at present was totally suppressed and no exercise of any religion but the established was permitted throughout the kingdom any word or writing which tended towards heresy or schism was punishable by the high commissioners or any three of them they alone were judges what expression had that tendency they proceeded not by information but upon rumour suspicion or according to their discretion they administered an oath by which the party cited before them was bound to answer any question which should be propounded to him whoever refused this oath though he pleaded ever so justly that he might thereby be brought to accuse himself or his dearest friend was punishable by imprisonment and in short an inquisitional tribunal with all its terrors and iniquities was erected in the kingdom full discretionary powers were bestowed with regard to the inquiry trial sentence and penalty inflicted excepting only that corporal punishments were restrained by that patent of the prince 
which erected the court not by the act of parliament which empowered him by reason of the uncertain limits which separate ecclesiastical from civil causes all accusations of adultery and incest were tried by the court of high commission and every complaint of wives against their husbands was there examined and discussed on like pretenses every cause which regarded conscience that is every cause could have been brought under their jurisdiction but there was a sufficient reason why the king would not be solicitous to stretch the jurisdiction of this court the star chamber possessed the same authority in civil matters and in methods of proceeding were equally arbitrary and unlimited the origin of this court was derived from the most remote antiquity though it is pretended that its powers had first been carried to the greatest height by henry the seventh in all times however it is confessed it enjoyed authority and at no time was its authority circumscribed or method of proceeding directed by any law or statute we have already or shall have sufficient occasion during the course of this history to mention the dispensing power the power of imprisonment of exacting loans and benevolences of pressing and quartering soldiers of altering the customs of erecting monopolies these branches of power if not directly opposite to the principles of all free government must at least be acknowledged dangerous to freedom in a monarchical constitution where an eternal jealousy must be preserved against the sovereign and no discretionary powers must ever be entrusted to him by which the property or personal liberty of any subject can be affected the kings of england however had almost constantly exercised these powers and if on any occasion the prince had been obliged to submit to laws enacted against them he had ever in practice eluded these laws and returned to the same arbitrary administration during almost three centuries before the accession of james the regal authority in these particulars had never once been called in question we may also observe that the principles in general which prevailed during that age were so favorable to the monarchy that they bestowed on it an authority almost absolute and unlimited sacred and indefeasible the meetings of parliament were so precarious their sessions so short compared to the vacations that when men's eyes were turned upwards in search of sovereign power the prince alone was apt to strike them as the only permanent magistrate invested with the whole majesty and authority of the state the great complacence too of parliaments during so long a period had extremely degraded and obscured those assemblies and as all instances of opposition to prerogative must have been drawn from a remote age they were unknown to a great many and had the less authority even with those men who were acquainted with them these examples besides of liberty had commonly in ancient times been accompanied with such circumstances of violence convulsion civil war and disorder that they presented but a disagreeable idea to the inquisitive part of the people and afforded small inducement to renew such dismal scenes by a great many therefore monarchy simple and unmixed was conceived to be the government of england and those popular assemblies were supposed to form only the ornament of the fabric without being in any degree essential to its being and existence the prerogative of the crown was represented by lawyers as something real and durable like those eternal essences of the schools which no time or force could alter the sanction of religion was by divines called in aid and the monarch of heaven was supposed to be interested in supporting the authority of his earthly vicegerent. and though it is pretended that these doctrines were more openly inculcated and more strenuously insisted on during the reign of the stuarts they were not then invented and were found by the court to be more necessary at that period by reason of the opposite doctrines which began to be promulgated by the puritanical party in consequence of these exalted ideas of kingly authority the prerogative 
besides the articles of jurisdiction founded on precedent was by many supposed to possess an inexhaustible fund of latent powers which might be exerted on any emergence in every government necessity when real supersedes all laws and levels all limitations but in the english government convenience alone was conceived to authorize any extraordinary act of regal power and to render it obligatory on the people hence the strict obedience required to proclamations during all periods of the english history and if james had incurred blame on account of his edicts it is only because he too frequently issued them at a time when they began to be less regarded not because he first assumed or extended to an unusual degree that exercise of authority of his maxims in a parallel case the following is a pretty remarkable instance queen elizabeth had appointed commissioners for the inspection of prisons and had bestowed on them full discretionary powers to adjust all differences between prisoners and their creditors to compound debts and to give liberty to such debtors as they found honest and insolvent from the uncertain undefined nature of the english constitution doubts sprang up in many that this commission was contrary to law and it was represented in that light to james he forbore therefore renewing the commission till the fifteenth of his reign when complaints rose so high with regard to the abuses practised in prisons that he thought himself obliged to overcome his scruples and to appoint new commissioners invested with the same discretionary powers which elizabeth had formerly conferred upon the whole we must conceive that monarchy on the accession of the house of stuart was possessed of a very extensive authority an authority in the judgment of all not exactly limited in the judgment of some not limitable but at the same time this authority was founded merely on the opinion of the people influenced by ancient precedent and example it was not supported either by money or by force of arms and for this reason we need not wonder that the princes of that line were so extremely jealous of their prerogative being sensible that when these claims were ravished from them they possessed no influence by which they could maintain their dignity or support the laws by the changes which have since been introduced the liberty and independence of individuals has been rendered much more full entire and secure that of the public more uncertain and precarious and it seems a necessary though perhaps a melancholy truth that in every government the magistrate must either possess a large revenue and a military force or enjoy some discretionary powers in order to execute the laws and support his own authority we have had occasion to remark in so many instances the bigotry which prevailed in that age that we can look for no toleration among the different sects two arians under the title of heretics were punished by fire during this period and no other reign since the reformation had been free from the like barbarities stowe says that these arians were offered their pardon at the stake if they would merit it by a recantation a madman who called himself the holy ghost was without any indulgence for his frenzy condemned to the same punishment twenty pounds a month could by law be levied on every one who frequented not the established worship this rigorous law however had one indulgent clause that the fines exacted should not exceed two-thirds of the yearly income of the person it had been usual for elizabeth to allow those penalties to run on for several years and to levy them all at once to the utter ruin of such catholics as had incurred her displeasure james was more humane in this as in every other respect the puritans formed a sect which secretly lurked in the church but pretended not to any separate worship or discipline an attempt of that kind would have been universally regarded as the most unpardonable enormity and had the king been disposed to grant the puritans a full toleration for a separate exercise of their religion it is certain from the spirit of the times that this sect itself 
would have despised and hated him for it, and would have reproached him with lukewarmness and indifference to the cause of religion. They maintained that they themselves were the only pure church, that their principles and practices ought to be established by law, and that no other ought to be tolerated. It may be questioned, therefore, whether the administration at this time could with propriety deserve the appellation of persecutors with regard to the Puritans. Such of the clergy, indeed, as refused to comply with the legal ceremonies, were deprived of their livings, and sometimes in Elizabeth's reign were otherwise punished. And ought any man to accept an office or benefice in an establishment while he declines compliance with the fixed and known rules of that establishment? But Puritans were never punished for frequenting separate congregations because there were none such in the kingdom, and no Protestant ever assumed or pretended to the right of erecting them. The greatest well-wishers of the Puritanical sect would have condemned a practice which, in that age, was universally, by statesmen and ecclesiastics, philosophers, and zealots, regarded as subversive of civil society. Even so great a reasoner as Lord Bacon thought that uniformity in religion was absolutely necessary to the support of government, and that no toleration could with safety be given to sectaries. Nothing but the imputation of idolatry, which was thrown on the Catholic religion, could justify in the eyes of the Puritans themselves the schism made by the Huguenots and other Protestants who lived in Popish countries. In all former ages, not wholly excepting even those of Greece and Rome, religious sects and heresies and schisms had been esteemed dangerous, if not pernicious, to civil government, and were regarded as the source of faction and private combination and opposition to the laws. The magistrate, therefore, applied himself directly to the cure of this evil, as of every other, and very naturally attempted by penal statutes to suppress those separate communities and punish the obstinate innovators. But it was found by fatal experience, and after spilling an ocean of blood in those theological quarrels, that the evil was of a peculiar nature and was both inflamed by violent remedies and diffused itself more rapidly throughout the whole society. Hence, though late, arose the paradoxical principle and salutary practice of toleration. The liberty of the press was incompatible with such maxims and such principles of government as then prevailed, and was therefore quite unknown in that age. Besides employing the two terrible courts of Star Chamber and High Commission, whose powers were unlimited, Queen Elizabeth exerted her authority by restraints upon the press. She passed a decree in her court of Star Chamber, that is, by her own will and pleasure, forbidding any book to be printed in any place but in London, Oxford, and Cambridge, and another in which she prohibited, under severe penalties, the publishing of any book or pamphlet against the form or meaning of any restraint or ordinance contained or to be contained in any statute or laws of this realm or in any injunction made or set forth by her majesty or her privy council or against the true sense or meaning of any letters patent commissions or prohibitions under the great seal of england james extended the same penalties to the importing of such books from abroad and to render these edicts more effectual, he afterwards inhibited the printing of any book without a license from the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, or the Vice-Chancellor of one of the universities, or some person appointed by them. In tracing the coherence among the systems of modern theology, we may observe that the doctrine of absolute decrees has ever been intimately connected with the enthusiastic spirit as that doctrine affords the highest subject of joy, triumph, and security to the supposed elect, and exalts them by infinite degrees above the rest of mankind. All the first reformers adopted these principles, and the Jansenists too, a fanatical sect in France, not to mention the Mohammedans in Asia, have ever embraced them. 
as the Lutheran establishments were subjected to Episcopal jurisdiction, their enthusiastic genius gradually decayed, and men had leisure to perceive the absurdity of supposing God to punish by infinite torments what he himself from all eternity had unchangeably decreed. The king, though at this time his Calvinistic education had riveted him in the doctrine of absolute decrees, yet being a zealous partisan of episcopacy, was insensibly engaged towards the end of his reign to favor the milder theology of Arminius. Even in so great a doctor, the genius of the religion prevailed over its speculative tenets, and with him the whole clergy gradually dropped the more rigid principles of absolute reprobation and unconditional decrees. Some noise was at first made about these innovations, but being drowned in the fury of factions and civil wars which ensued, the scholastic arguments made an insignificant figure amidst those violent disputes about civil and ecclesiastical power with which the nation was agitated. At the Restoration, the Church, though she still retained her old subscriptions and articles of faith, was found to have totally changed her speculative doctrines, and to have embraced tenets more suitable to the genius of her discipline and worship, without it being possible to assign the precise period in which the alteration was produced. It may be worth observing that James, from his great desire to promote controversial divinity, erected a college at Chelsea for the entertainment of twenty persons who should be entirely employed in refuting the Papists and Puritans. All the efforts of the great Bacon could not procure an establishment for the cultivation of natural philosophy. Even to this day no society has been instituted for the polishing and fixing of our language. The only encouragement which the sovereign in England has ever given to anything that has the appearance of science was this short-lived establishment of James, an institution quite superfluous considering the unhappy propension which at that time so universally possessed the nation for polemical theology. End of section 61. Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 1. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 62 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 62. Appendix of the Reign of James I, Part Two. The manners of the nation were agreeable to the monarchical government which prevailed, and contained not that strange mixture which at present distinguishes England from all other countries. Such violent extremes were then unknown of industry and debauchery, frugality and profusion, civility and rusticity, fanaticism and skepticism. Candor, sincerity, modesty are the only qualities which the English of that age possessed in common with the present. High pride of family then prevailed, and it was by a dignity and stateliness of behavior that the gentry and nobility distinguished themselves from the common people. Great riches acquired by commerce were more rare and had not as yet been able to confound all ranks of men, and render money the chief foundation of distinction. Much ceremony took place in the common intercourse of life, and little familiarity was indulged by the great. The advantages which result from opulence are so solid and real, that those who are possessed of them need not dread the near approaches of their inferiors. The distinctions of birth and title being more empty and imaginary, soon vanish upon familiar access and acquaintance the expenses of the great consisted in pomp and show and a numerous retinue rather than in convenience and true pleasure the earl of nottingham in his embassy to spain was attended by five hundred persons 
and the earl of hertford in that to brussels carried three hundred gentlemen along with him lord bacon has remarked that the english nobility in his time maintained a larger retinue of servants than the nobility of any other nation except perhaps the polanders civil honors which now hold the first place were at that time subordinate to the military the young gentry and nobility were fond of distinguishing themselves by arms the fury of duels too prevailed more than at any time before or since and this was the turn that the romantic chivalry for which the nation was formerly so renowned had lately taken liberty of commerce between the sexes was indulged but without any licentiousness of manners the court was very little an exception to this observation james had rather entertained an aversion and contempt for the females nor were those young courtiers of whom he was so fond able to break through the established manners of the nation the first sedan chair seen in england was in this reign and was used by the duke of buckingham to the great indignation of the people who exclaimed that he was employing his fellow creatures to do the service of beasts the country life prevails at present in england beyond any cultivated nation in europe but it was then much more generally embraced by all the gentry the increase of arts pleasures and social commerce was just beginning to produce an inclination for the softer and more civilized life of the city james discouraged as much as possible this alteration of manners he was wont to be very earnest as lord bacon tells us with the country gentlemen to go from london to their country seats and sometimes he would say thus to them gentlemen at london you are like ships in a sea which show like nothing but in your country villages you are like ships in a river which look like great things he was not content with reproof and exhortation as queen elizabeth had perceived with regret the increase of london and had restrained all new buildings by proclamation james who found these edicts were not exactly obeyed frequently renewed them though a strict execution seems still to have been wanting he also issued reiterated proclamations in imitation of his predecessor containing severe menaces against the gentry who lived in town this policy is contrary to that which has ever been practised by all princes who studied the increase of their authority to allure the nobility to court to engage them in expensive pleasures or employments which dissipate their fortunes to increase their subjection to ministers by attendance to weaken their authority in the provinces by absence these have been the common arts of arbitrary government but james besides that he had certainly laid no plan for extending his powers had no money to support a splendid court or bestow on a numerous retinue of gentry and nobility he thought too that by their living together they became more sensible of their own strength and were apt to indulge too curious researches into the matters of government to remedy the present evil he was desirous of dispersing them into their country seats where he hoped they would bear a more submissive reverence to his authority and receive less support from each other but the contrary effect soon followed the riches amassed during their residence at home rendered them independent the influence acquired by hospitality made them formidable they would not be led by the court they could not be driven and thus the system of the english government received a total and a sudden alteration in the course of less than forty years the first rise of commerce and the arts had contributed in preceding reigns to scatter those immense fortunes of the barons which rendered them so formidable both to king and people the further progress of these advantages began during this reign to ruin the small proprietors of land and by both events the gentry or that rank which composed the house of commons enlarged their power and authority the early improvements in luxury were seized by the greater nobles whose fortunes placing them above frugality or even calculation were soon dissipated in expensive pleasures these improvements reached at last all men of property and those of slender fortunes who at that time were often men of family 
imitating those of a rank immediately above them, reduced themselves to poverty. Their lands coming to sale swelled the estates of those who possessed riches sufficient for the fashionable expenses, but who were not exempted from some care and attention to their domestic economy. The gentry also of that age were engaged in no expense except that of country hospitality. No taxes were levied, no wars waged, no attendance at court expected, no bribery or profusion required at elections. Could human nature ever reach happiness, the condition of the English gentry, under so mild and benign a prince, might merit that appellation. The amount of the king's revenue, as it stood in 1617, is thus stated. Of crown lands, 80,000 pounds a year, by customs and new impositions, near 190,000, by wards and other various branches of revenue, besides purveyance, 180,000, the whole amounting to 450,000. The king's ordinary disbursements, by the same account, are said to exceed this sum by 36,000 pounds. All the extraordinary sums which James had raised by subsidies, loans, sale of lands, sale of the title of baronet, money paid by the states and by the king of France, benevolences, etc., were in the whole about two millions two hundred thousand pounds, of which the sale of lands afforded seven hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds. The extraordinary disbursements of the king amounted to two million, besides above four hundred thousand pounds given in presents. Upon the whole, a sufficient reason appears, partly from necessary expenses, partly for want of a rigid economy, why the king, even early in his reign, was deeply involved in debt, and found great difficulty to support his government. Farmers, not commissioners, levied the customs. It seems indeed requisite that the former method should always be tried before the latter, though a preferable one. When men's own interest is concerned, they fall upon a hundred expedients to prevent frauds in the merchants, and these the public may afterwards imitate in establishing proper rules for its officers. The customs were supposed to amount to five percent of the value, and were levied upon exports as well as imports. Nay, the imposition upon exports by James additions is said to amount, in some few instances, to twenty-five per cent. This practice, so hurtful to industry, prevails still in France, Spain, and most countries of Europe. The customs in 1604 yielded 127,000 pounds a year. They rose to 190,000 towards the end of the reign. Interest during this reign was at 10% till 1624, and then it was reduced to 8. This high interest is an indication of the great profits and small progress of commerce. The extraordinary supplies granted by Parliament during this whole reign amounted not to more than 630,000 pounds, which divided among 21 years makes 30,000 pounds a year. I do not include those supplies amounting to 300,000 pounds, which were given to the king by his last parliament. These were paid into their own commissioners, and the expenses of the Spanish war were much more than sufficient to exhaust them. The distressed family of the Palatine was a great burden on James during part of his reign. The king, it is pretended, possessed not frugality proportioned to the extreme narrowness of his revenue. Splendid equipages, however, he did not affect, nor costly furniture, nor a luxurious table, nor a prodigal mistress. His buildings, too, were not sumptuous, though the banqueting house must not be forgotten as a monument which does honor to his reign. Hunting was his chief amusement, the cheapest pleasure in which a king can indulge himself. His expenses were the effects of liberality rather than luxury. One day, it is said, while he was standing amidst some of his courtiers, a porter passed by loaded with money, which he was carrying to the treasury. The king observed that Rich, afterwards Earl of Holland, one of his handsome, agreeable favorites, whispered something to one standing near him. Upon inquiry, he found that Rich had said, How happy would that money make me! 
Without hesitation, James bestowed it all upon him, though it amounted to three thousand pounds. He added, You think yourself very happy in obtaining so large a sum, but I am more happy in having an opportunity of obliging a worthy man whom I love. The generosity of James was more the result of a benign humor or light fancy than of reason or judgment. The objects of it were such as could render themselves agreeable to him in his loose hours, not such as were endowed with great merit, or who possessed talents or popularity which could strengthen his interest with the public. The same advantage we may remark over the people which the crown formerly reaped from that interval between the fall of the peers and the rise of the commons, was now possessed by the people against the crown during the continuance of a like interval. The sovereign had already lost that independent revenue by which he could subsist without regular supplies from Parliament, and he had not yet acquired the means of influencing those assemblies. The effect of this situation, which commenced with the accession of the House of Stuart, soon rose to a great height and were more or less propagated throughout all the reigns of that unhappy family. Subsidies and fifteenths are frequently mentioned by historians, but neither the amount of these taxes nor the method of levying them have been well explained. It appears that the fifteenths formerly corresponded to the name and were that proportionable part of the movables. But a valuation having been made in the reign of Edward the Third, that valuation was always adhered to, and each town paid unalterably a particular sum which the inhabitants themselves assessed upon their fellow citizens. The same tax in corporate towns was called a tenth, because there it was at first a tenth of the movables. The whole amount of a tenth and a fifteenth throughout the kingdom, or a fifteenth as it is often more concisely called, was about twenty-nine thousand pounds. The amount of a subsidy was not invariable, like that of a fifteenth, in the eighth of elizabeth a subsidy amounted to one hundred and twenty thousand pounds in the fortieth it was not above seventy eight thousand it afterwards fell to seventy thousand and was continually decreasing the reason is easily collected from the method of levying it we may learn that the subsidy bills that one subsidy was given for four shillings in a pound on land two shillings and an eight pence on movables throughout the counties a considerable tax had it been strictly levied but this was only the ancient state of a subsidy during the reign of james there was not paid the twentieth part of that sum the tax was so far personal that a man paid only in the county where he lived though he should possess estates in other counties and the assessors formed a loose estimation of his property and rated him accordingly. To preserve, however, some rule in the estimation, it seems to have been the practice to keep an eye to former assessments and to rate every man according as his ancestors or men of such an estimated property were accustomed to pay. This was a sufficient reason why subsidies could not increase, notwithstanding the great increase of money and rise of rents but there was an evident reason why they continually decreased. The favor, as it is natural to suppose, ran always against the crown, especially during the latter end of Elizabeth, when subsidies became numerous and frequent, and the sums levied were considerable compared to former supplies. The assessors, though accustomed to have an eye on ancient estimations, were not bound to observe any such rule, but might rate anew any person according to his present income when rents fell or parts of an estate were sold off the proprietor was sure to represent these losses and obtain a diminution of his subsidy but where rents rose or new lands were purchased he kept his own secret and paid no more than formerly the advantage therefore of every change was taken against the crown and the crown could obtain the advantage of none and to make the matter worse, the alterations which happened in property during this age were in general unfavorable to the crown. The small proprietors, or twenty-pound men, went continually to decay, and when their estates were swallowed up by a greater, the new purchaser increased not his subsidy. 
so loose indeed is the whole method of rating subsidies that the wonder was not how the tax should continually diminish but how it yielded any revenue at all it became at last so unequal and uncertain that the parliament was obliged to change it into a land tax the price of corn during this reign and that of other necessaries of life was no lower or was rather higher than at present by a proclamation of james establishing public magazines whenever wheat fell below thirty-two shillings a quarter rye below eighteen barley below sixteen the commissioners were empowered to purchase corn for the magazines these prices then are to be regarded as low though they would rather pass for high by our present estimation the usual bread of the poor was at this time made of barley the best wool during the quarter part of james reign was at least thirty-three shillings a tod at present it is not above two-thirds of that value though it is to be presumed that our exports in woolen goods are somewhat increased the finer manufacturers too by the progress of arts and industry have rather diminished in price notwithstanding the great increase in money in shakespeare the hostess tells falstaff that the shirts she bought him were holland at eight shillings a yard a high price in this day even supposing what is not probable that the best holland at that time was equal in goodness to the best that can now be purchased in like manner a yard of velvet about the middle of elizabeth's reign was valued at two and twenty shillings it appears from dr birch's life of prince henry that the prince by contract with his butcher paid near a groat a pound throughout the year for all the beef and mutton used in his family besides we must consider that the general turn of that age which no laws could prevent was the converting of arable land into pasture a certain proof that the latter was found more profitable and consequently that all butcher's meat as well as bread was rather higher than at present we have a regulation of the market which regard to poultry and some other articles very early in charles the first reign and the prices are high a turkey cock four shillings and sixpence a turkey hen three shillings a pheasant cock six a pheasant hen five a partridge one shilling a goose two a capon two and sixpence a pullet one and sixpence a rabbit eight pence a dozen of pigeons six shillings we must consider that london at present is more than three times more populous than it was at that time a circumstance which much increases the price of poultry and of everything that cannot conveniently be brought from a distance not to mention that these regulations by authority are always calculated to diminish never to increase the market prices the contractors for victualling the navy were allowed by government eight pence a day for the diet of each man when in harbour seven and a half penny when at sea which would suffice at present the chief difference in expense between that age and the present consists in the imaginary wants of men which have since extremely multiplied these are the principal reasons why james revenue would go no further than the same money in our time though the difference is not near so great as is usually imagined end of section sixty two appendix of the reign of james i part two Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 63 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D. Section 63. Appendix to the Reign of James I. Part 3. The public was entirely free from the danger and expense of a standing army. 
while james was vaunting his divine vicegerency and boasting of his high prerogative he possessed not so much as a single regiment of guards to maintain his extensive claims a sufficient proof that he sincerely believed his pretensions to be well grounded and a strong presumption that they were at least built on what were then deemed plausible arguments the militia of england amounting to one hundred and sixty thousand men was the sole defence of the kingdom it is pretended that they were kept in good order during his reign the city of london procured officers who had served abroad and who taught the trained bands their exercises in artillery garden a practice which had been discontinued since fifteen eighty eight all the counties of england in emulation of the capital were fond of showing a well-ordered and well-appointed militia it appeared that the natural propensity of men towards military shows and exercises will go far with a little attention in the sovereign towards exciting and supporting this spirit in any nation the very boys at this time in mimicry of their elders enlisted themselves voluntarily into companies elected officers and practised the discipline of which the models were every day exposed to their view sir edward harwood in a memorial composed at the beginning of the subsequent reign says that england was so unprovided with horses fit for war that two thousand men could not possibly be mounted throughout the whole kingdom at present the breed of horses is so much improved that almost all those which are employed either in the plough wagon or coach would be fit for that purpose the disorders of ireland obliged james to keep up some forces there and put him to great expense the common pay of a private man in the infantry was eight pence a day a lieutenant two shillings an ensign eighteen pence the armies in europe were not near so numerous during that age and the private men we may observe were drawn from a better rank than at present and approaching nearer to that of the officers in the year fifteen eighty three there was a general review made of all the men in england capable of bearing arms and these were found to amount to one million one hundred and seventy two thousand men according to raleigh it is impossible to warrant the exactness of this computation or rather we may fairly presume it to be somewhat inaccurate but if it approached near the truth england was probably since that time increased in populousness the growth of london in riches and beauty as well as in number of inhabitants has been prodigious from sixteen hundred it doubled every forty years and consequently in sixteen eighty it contained four times as many inhabitants as at the beginning of the century it has ever been the centre of all the trade in the kingdom and almost the only town that affords society and amusement the affection which the english bear to a country life makes the provincial towns to be little frequented by the gentry nothing but the allurements of the capital which is favoured by the residence of the king and by being the seat of government and of all the courts of justice can prevail over their passion for their rural villas london at this time was almost entirely built of wood and in every respect was certainly a very ugly city the earl of arundel first introduced the general practice of brick buildings the navy of england was esteemed formidable in elizabeth's time and yet it consisted only of thirty-three ships besides pinnaces and the largest of these would not equal one-fourth rates at present raleigh advises never to build a ship of war above six hundred tons james was not negligent of the navy in five years preceding sixteen twenty three he built ten new ships and expended fifty thousand pounds a year on the fleet by raleigh's account in his discourse of the first invention of shipping the fleet in the twenty-fourth of the queen consisted only of thirteen ships and was augmented afterwards eleven he probably reckoned 
some to be pinnaces, which Coke called ships, besides the value of thirty-six thousand pounds in timber, which he annually gave from the royal forests. The largest ship that ever had come from the English docks was built during this reign. She was only one thousand four hundred tons, and carried sixty-four guns. The merchant ships, in cases of necessity, were instantly converted into ships of war. The king affirmed to the Parliament that the navy had never before been in so good a condition. Every session of Parliament during this reign we meet with grievous lamentations concerning the decay of trade and the growth of popery. Such violent propensity have men to complain of the present times and to entertain discontent against their fortune and condition. The king himself was deceived by these popular complaints and was at a loss to account for the total want of money which he heard so much exaggerated. It may, however, be affirmed that during no preceding period of English history was there a more sensible increase than during the reign of this monarch, of all the advantages which distinguish a flourishing people. Not only the peace which he maintained was favorable to industry and commerce, his turn of mind inclined him to promote the peaceful arts, and trade being as yet in its infancy, all additions to it must have been the more evident to every eye which was not blinded by melancholy prejudices. By an account which seems judicious and accurate, it appears that all the seamen employed in the merchant service amounted to ten thousand men, which probably exceeds not the fifth part of their present number. Sir Thomas Overbury says that the Dutch possessed three times more shipping than the English, but that their ships were of inferior burden to those of the latter. Sir William Monson computed the English naval power to be little or nothing inferior to the Dutch, which is surely an exaggeration. The Dutch at this time traded to England with six hundred ships, England to Holland with sixty only. A catalogue of the manufacturers for which the English were then eminent would appear very contemptible in comparison of those which flourish among them at present. Almost all the more elaborate and curious arts were only cultivated abroad, particularly in Italy, Holland, and the Netherlands. Shipbuilding and the founding of iron cannon were the sole in which the English excelled. They seem, indeed, to have possessed alone the secret of the latter, and great complaints were made every parliament against the exportation of English ordnance. Nine-tenths of the commerce of the kingdom consisted in woolen goods. Wool, however, was allowed to be exported till the nineteenth of the king. Its exportation was then forbidden by proclamation, though that edict was never strictly executed. Most of the cloth was exported raw, and was dyed and dressed by the Dutch, who gained, it is pretended, seven hundred thousand pounds a year by this manufacture. A proclamation issued by the king against exporting cloth in that condition had succeeded so ill during one year, by the refusal of the Dutch to buy the dress cloth, that great murmurs arose against it, and this measure was retracted by the king, and complained of by the nation, as if it had been the most impolitic in the world. It seems indeed to have been premature. In so little credit was the fine English cloth even at home, that the king was obliged to seek expedients by which he might engage the people of fashion to wear it. The manufacture of fine linen was totally unknown in the kingdom. The company of merchant adventurers, by their patent, possessed the sole commerce of woolen goods, though the staple commodity of the kingdom. An attempt made during the reign of Elizabeth to lay open this important trade had been attended with bad consequences for a time by a conspiracy of the merchant adventurers not to make any purchases of cloth, and the queen immediately restored them their patent. It was the groundless fear of a like accident that enslaved the nation to the more exclusive companies which confined so much every branch of commerce and industry. The Parliament, however, annulled in the third of the king 
the patent of the Spanish company, and the trade to Spain, which was at first very insignificant, soon became the most considerable in the kingdom. It is strange that they were not thence encouraged to abolish all the other companies, and that they went no further than obliging them to enlarge their bottom and to facilitate the admission of new adventurers. A board of trade was erected by the king in 1622. One of the reasons assigned in the commission is to remedy the low price of wool which begat complaints of the decay of the woolen manufactory. It is more probable, however, that this fall of prices proceeded from the increase of wool. The king likewise recommends it to the commissioners to inquire and examine whether a greater freedom of trade and an exemption from the restraint of exclusive companies would not be beneficial. Men were then fettered by their own prejudices, and the king was justly afraid of embracing a bold measure whose consequences might be uncertain. The digesting of a navigation act of a like nature with the famous one executed afterwards by the Republican Parliament is likewise recommended to the commissioners. The arbitrary powers then commonly assumed by the Privy Council appear evidently through the whole tenor of the commission. The silk manufacture had no footing in England, but by James' direction mulberry trees were planted and silkworms introduced. The climate seems unfavorable to the success of this project. The planting of hops increased much in England during this reign. Greenland is thought to have been discovered about this period, and the whale fishery was carried on with success. But the industry of the Dutch, in spite of all opposition, soon deprived the English of this source of riches. A company was erected for the discovery of the Northwest Passage, and many fruitless attempts were made for that purpose. In such noble projects, despair ought never to be admitted, to the absolute impossibility of success be fully ascertained. The passage to the East Indies had been opened to the English during the reign of Elizabeth, but the trade to those parts was not entirely established till this reign, when the East India Company received a new patent, enlarged their stock to one million five hundred thousand pounds, and fitted out several ships on these adventures. In 1609 they built a vessel of twelve hundred tons, the largest merchant ship that England had ever known. She was unfortunate and perished by shipwreck. In 1611, a large ship of the company, assisted by a pinnace, maintained five several engagements with a squadron of Portuguese and gained a complete victory over forces much superior. During the following years, the Dutch company was guilty of great injuries towards the English in expelling many of their factors and destroying their settlements, but these violences were resented with a proper spirit by the court of England. A naval force was equipped under the Earl of Oxford and lay in wait for the return of the Dutch East India fleet. By reason of crossed winds, Oxford failed of his purpose and the Dutch escaped. Some time after, one rich ship was taken by Vice Admiral Merwin and it was stipulated by the Dutch to pay 70,000 pounds to the English company in consideration of the losses which that company had sustained. But neither this stipulation, nor the fear of reprisals, nor the sense of that friendship which subsisted between England and the States, could restrain the avity of the Dutch company, or render them equitable in their proceedings towards their allies. Impatient to have sole possession of the spice trade, which the English then shared with them, they assumed a jurisdiction over a factory of the latter in the island of Amboyna. On very improbable and even absurd pretenses, seized all the factors with their families and put them to death with the most inhuman tortures. This dismal news arrived in England at the time when James, by the prejudices of his subjects and the intrigues of his favorite, were constrained to make a breach with Spain and he was obliged, after some remonstrances, to acquiesce in this indignity from a state whose alliance was now become necessary to him. It is remarkable that the nation, almost without a murmur, submitted to this injury from their Protestant confederates, 
an injury which, besides the horrid enormity of the action, was of much deeper importance to the national interest than all those which they were so impatient to resent from the House of Austria. The exports of England from Christmas 1612 to Christmas 1613 are computed at two million four hundred and eighty seven thousand four hundred and thirty five pounds the imports at two million one hundred and forty one thousand one hundred and fifty one so that the balance in favour of england was three hundred and forty six thousand two hundred and eighty four but in sixteen twenty two the exports were two million three hundred and twenty thousand four hundred and thirty six pounds the imports two million six hundred and nineteen thousand three hundred and fifteen which makes a balance of two hundred and ninety eight thousand eight hundred and seventy nine pounds against england the coinage of england from fifteen ninety nine to sixteen nineteen amounted to four millions seven hundred and seventy nine thousand three hundred and fourteen pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence a proof that the balance in the main was considerably in favour of the kingdom as the annual imports and exports together rose to near five millions and the customs never yielded so much as two hundred thousand pounds a year of which tonnage made a part it appears that the new rates affixed by james did not on the whole amount to one shilling in the pound and consequently were still inferior to the intention of the original grant of parliament the east india company usually carried out a third of their cargo in commodities the trade to turkey was one of the most gainful to the nation it appears that copper halfpence and farthings began to be coined in this reign tradesmen had commonly carried on their retail businesses chiefly by means of leaden tokens the small silver penny was soon lost and at this time was nowhere to be found what chiefly renders the reign of james memorable is the commencement of the english colonies in america colonies established on the noblest footing that has been known in any age or nation the spaniards being the first discoverers of the new world immediately took possession of the precious mines which they found there and by the allurement of great riches they were tempted to depopulate their own country as well as that which they conquered and added the vice of sloth to those of avity and barbarity which had attended their adventures in those renowned enterprises that fine coast was entirely neglected which reaches from st augustine to cape breton and which lies in all the temperate climates is watered by noble rivers and offers a fertile soil but nothing more to the industrious planter peopled gradually from england by the necessitous and indigent who at home increased neither wealth nor populousness the colonies which were planted along that track have promoted the navigation encouraged the industry and even perhaps multiplied the inhabitants of their mother country the spirit of independency which was reviving in england here shone forth in its full lustre and received new accession from the aspiring character of those who being discontented with the established church and monarchy had sought for freedom amidst those savage deserts end of section sixty three appendix to the reign of james i part three recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington Section 64 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 64 appendix to the reign of james i part four queen elizabeth had done little more than given a name to the continent of virginia and after her planting one feeble colony which quickly decayed that country was entirely abandoned but when peace put an end to the military enterprises against spain 
and left ambitious spirits no hopes of making any longer such rapid advances towards honor and fortune the nation began to second the pacific intentions of its monarch and to seek a surer though slower expedient for acquiring riches and glory in 1606 newport carried over a colony and began a settlement which the company erected by patent for that purpose in london and bristol took care to supply with yearly recruits of provisions utensils and new inhabitants about 1609 argall discovered a more direct and shorter passage to virginia and left the track of the ancient navigators who had first directed their course southwards to the tropics sailed westwards by means of the trade winds and then turned northwards till they reached the english settlements the same year five hundred persons under sir thomas gates and sir george somers were embarked for virginia somers ships meeting with a tempest was driven into the bermudas and laid the foundation of a settlement in those islands lord delware afterwards undertook the government of the english colonies but notwithstanding all his care seconded by supplies from james and by money raised from the first lottery ever known in the kingdom such difficulties attended the settlement of these countries that in sixteen fourteen there were not alive more than four hundred men of all that had been sent thither after supplying themselves with provisions more immediately necessary for the support of life the new planters began the cultivating of tobacco and james notwithstanding his antipathy to that drug which he affirmed to be pernicious to men's morals as well as their health gave them permission to enter it in england and he inhibited by proclamation all importation of it from spain by degrees new colonies were established in that continent and gave new names to the places where they settled leaving that of virginia to the province first planted the island of barbados was also planted in this reign speculative reasoners during that age raised many objections to the planning of those remote colonies and foretold that after draining their mother country of inhabitants they would soon shake off her yoke and erect an independent government in america but time has shown that the views entertained by those who encouraged such generous undertakings were more just and solid a mild government and a great naval force have preserved and may still preserve during some time the dominion of england over her colonies and such advantages have commerce and navigation reaped from these establishments that more than a fourth of the english shipping is at present computed to be employed in carrying on the traffic with the american settlements agriculture was anciently very imperfect in england the sudden transitions so often mentioned by historians from the lowest to the highest price of grain and the prodigious inequality of its value in different years are sufficient proofs that the produce depended entirely on the seasons and that art had as yet done nothing to fence against the injuries of the heavens during this reign considerable improvements were made as in most arts so in this the most beneficial of any a numerous catalogue might be formed of books and pamphlets treating of husbandry which were written about this time the nation however was still dependent on foreigners for daily bread and though its exportation of grain forms a considerable branch of its commerce notwithstanding its probable increase of people there was in that period a regular importation from the baltic as well as from france and if it ever stopped the bad consequences were sensibly felt by the nation sir walter raleigh in his observations computes that two millions went out at one time for corn it was not till the fifth of elizabeth that the exportation of corn had been allowed in england and camden observes that agriculture from that moment received new life and vigour the endeavours of james or more properly speaking those of the nation for promoting trade were attended with greater success than those for the encouragement of learning though the age was by no means destitute of eminent writers a very bad taste in general prevailed during that period and the monarch himself was not a little infected with it 
on the origin of letters among the Greeks, the genius of poets and orators, as might naturally be expected, was distinguished by an amiable simplicity, which whatever rudeness may sometimes attend it, is so fitted to express the genuine movements of nature and passion, that the compositions possessed of it must ever appear valuable to the discerning part of mankind. The glaring figures of discourse, the pointed antithesis, the unnatural conceit, the jingle of words, such false ornaments were not employed by early writers, not because they were rejected, but because they scarcely ever occurred to them. An easy, unforced strain of sentiments runs through their compositions, though at the same time we may observe that amidst the most elegant simplicity of thought and expression, one is sometimes surprised to meet with a poor conceit which had presented itself unsought for, and which the author had not acquired critical observation enough to condemn. A bad taste seizes with avidity these frivolous beauties, and even perhaps a good taste, ere surfeited by them, they multiply every day more and more in the fashionable compositions. Nature and good sense are neglected, labored ornaments studied and admired, and a total degeneracy of style and language prepares the way for barbarism and ignorance. Hence the Asiatic manner was found to depart so much from the simple purity of Athens, hence that tinsel eloquence which is observable in many of the Roman writers, from which Cicero himself is not wholly exempted, and which so much prevails in Ovid, Seneca, Lucian, Martial, and the Plinies. On the revival of letters, when the judgment of the public is yet raw and unformed, this false glitter catches the eye, and leaves no room, either in eloquence or poetry, for the durable beauties of solid sense and lively passion. The reigning genius is then diametrically opposite to that which prevails on the first origins of arts. The Italian writers, it is evident, even the most celebrated, have not reached the proper simplicity of thought and composition, and in Petrarch, Tasso, Guarneri, frivolous witticisms and forced conceits are but too predominant. The period during which letters were cultivated in Italy was so short as scarcely to allow leisure for correcting this adulterated relish. The more early French writers are liable to the same reproach. Fouetour, Balzac, even Corneille have too much affected those ambitious ornaments of which the Italians in general and least pure of the ancients supplied them with so many models. And it was not till late that observation and reflection gave rise to a more natural turn of thought and composition among that elegant people. A like character may be extended to the first English writers, such as flourished during the reigns of Elizabeth and James, and even till long afterwards. Learning, on its revival in this island, was attired in the same unnatural garb which it wore at the time of its decay among the Greek and Romans. And what may be regarded as a misfortune, the English writers were possessed of great genius before they were endowed with any degree of taste, and by that means gave a kind of sanction to those forced turns and sentiments which they so much affected. Their distorted conceptions and expressions are attended with such vigor of mind that we admire the imagination which produced them, as much as we blame the want of judgment which gave them admittance. To enter into an exact criticism of the writers of that age would exceed our present purpose. A short character of the most eminent delivered with the same freedom which history exercises over kings and ministers may not be improper. The national prepossessions which prevail will perhaps render the former liberty not the least perilous for the author. If Shakespeare be considered as a man, born in a rude age, and educated in the lowest manner, without any instruction either from the world or from books, he may be regarded as a prodigy. If represented as a poet, capable of furnishing a proper entertainment to a refined or intelligent audience, we must abate much of this eulogy. In his compositions, we regret that many irregularities and even absurdities should so frequently disfigure 
the animated and passionate scenes intermixed with them and at the same time we perhaps admire the more those beauties on account of their being surrounded with such deformities a striking peculiarity of sentiment adapted to a singular character he frequently hits as it were by inspiration but a reasonable propriety of thought he cannot for any time uphold nervous and picturesque expressions as well as descriptions abound in him but it is in vain we look either for purity or simplicity of diction his total ignorance of all theatrical art and conduct however material a defect yet as it affects the spectator rather than the reader we can more easily excuse than that want of taste which often prevails in his productions and which gives way only by intervals to the irradiations of genius a great and fertile genius he certainly possessed and one enriched equally with a tragic and comic vein but he ought to be cited as a proof how dangerous it is to rely on these advantages alone for attaining an excellence in the finer arts and there may even remain a suspicion that we overrate if possible the greatness of his genius in the same manner as bodies often appear more gigantic on account of their being disproportioned and misshapen he died in sixteen sixteen aged fifty-three years johnson possessed all the learning which was wanting to shakespeare and wanted all the genius of which the other was possessed both of them were equally deficient in taste and elegance in harmony and correctness a servile copyist of the ancients johnson translated into bad english the beautiful passages of greek and roman authors without accommodating them to the manners of his age and country his merit has been totally eclipsed by that of shakespeare whose rude genius prevailed over the rude art of his contemporary the english theatre has ever taken a strong tincture of shakespeare's spirit and character and thence it has proceeded that the nation has undergone from all its neighbours the reproach of barbarism from which its valuable productions in some other part of learning would otherwise have exempted it johnson had a pension of a hundred marks from the king which charles afterwards augmented to a hundred pounds he died in sixteen thirty seven aged sixty three fairfax has translated tasso with an elegance and ease and at the same time with an exactness which for that age are surprising each line in the original is faithfully rendered by a correspondent line in the translation harrington's translation of ariosto is not likewise without its merit it is to be regretted that these poets should have imitated the italians in their stanza which has a prolixity and uniformity in it that displeases in long performances they had otherwise as well as spencer who went before them contributed much to the polishing and refining of the english versification in dunn's satires when carefully inspected there appear some flashes of wit and ingenuity but these totally suffocated and buried by the harshest and most uncouth expression that is anywhere to be met with if the poetry of the english was so rude and imperfect during that age we may reasonably expect that their prose would be liable to still greater objections though the latter appears the more easy as it is the more natural method of composition it has ever in practice been found the more rare and difficult and there scarcely is an instance in any language that it has reached a degree of perfection before the refinement of poetical numbers and expression english prose during the reign of james was written with little regard to the rules of grammar and with a total disregard to the elegance and harmony of the period stuffed with latin sentences and quotations it likewise imitated those inventions which however forcible and graceful in the ancient languages are entirely contrary to the idiom of english i shall indeed venture to affirm that whatever uncouth phrases and expressions occur in old books they are chiefly owing to the unformed taste of the author and that the language spoken in the courts of elizabeth and james was very little different 
from that which we meet with at present in good company of this opinion the little scraps of speeches which are found in the parliamentary journals and which carry all air so opposite to the laboured rations seem to be a sufficient proof and there want not productions of that age which being written by men who were not authors by profession retain a very natural manner and may give us some idea of the language which prevailed among the men of the world i shall particularly mention sir john davis's discovery throgmorton's essex's and neville's letters in a more early period cavendish's life of cardinal wolseley the pieces that remain of bishop gardiner's and anne boleyn's letter to the king differ little or nothing from the language of our time the great glory of literature in this island during the reign of james was lord bacon most of his performances were composed in latin though he possessed neither the elegance of that nor of his native tongue if we consider the variety of talents displayed by this man as a public speaker a man of business a wit a courtier a companion an author a philosopher he is justly the object of great admiration if we consider him merely as an author and philosopher the light in which we view him at present though very estimable he was yet inferior to his contemporary galileo perhaps even to kepler bacon pointed out at a distance the road to true philosophy galileo both pointed it out to others and made himself considerable advances in it the englishman was ignorant of geometry the florentine revived that science excelled in it and was the first that applied it together with experiment to natural philosophy the former rejected with the most positive disdain the system of copernicus the latter fortified it with new proofs derived both from reason and the senses bacon's style is stiff and rigid his wit though often brilliant is also often unnatural and far-fetched and he seems to be the original of those pointed similes and long-spun allegories which so much distinguish the english authors galileo is a lively and agreeable though somewhat a prolix writer but italy not united in any single government and perhaps satiated with that literary glory which it has possessed both in ancient and modern times has too much neglected the renown which it has acquired by giving birth to so great a man that national spirit which prevails among the english and which forms their great happiness is the cause why they bestow on all their eminent writers and on bacon among the rest such praises and acclamations as may often appear partial and excessive he died in sixteen twenty six in the sixty sixth year of his life if the reader of raleigh's history can have the patience to wade through the jewish and rabbinical learning which composed the half of the volume he will find when he comes to the greek and roman story that his pains were not unrewarded raleigh is the best model of that ancient style which some writers would affect to revive at present he was beheaded in sixteen eighteen aged sixty six years camden's history of queen elizabeth may be esteemed good composition both for style and matter it is written with simplicity of expression very rare in that age and with a regard to truth it would not perhaps be too much to affirm that it is among the best historical productions which have yet been composed by an englishman it is well known that the english have not much excelled in that kind of literature he died in sixteen twenty three aged seventy three years we shall mention the king himself at the end of these english writers because that is his place when considered as an author it may safely be affirmed that the mediocrity of james talents in literature joined to the great change in national taste is one cause of that contempt under which his memory labors and which is often carried by party writers to a great extreme it is remarkable how different from ours were the sentiments of the ancients with regard to learning of the first twenty roman emperors counting from caesar to severus about half were authors 
and though few of them seem to have been eminent in that profession it is always remarked to their praise that by their example they encouraged literature not to mention germanicus and his daughter agrippina persons so nearly allied to the throne the greater part of the classic writers whose works remain were men of the highest quality as every human advantage is attended with inconveniences the change of men's ideas in this particular may probably be ascribed to the invention of printing which has rendered books so common that even men of slender fortune can have access to them that james was but a middling writer may be allowed that he was a contemptible one can by no means be admitted whoever will read his basilicon doron particularly the two last books the true law of free monarchies his answer to cardinal perrin and almost all his speeches and messages to parliament will confess him to have possessed no mean genius if he wrote concerning witches and apparitions who in that age did not admit the reality of these fictitious beings if he has composed a contemporary of the revelations and proved the pope to be antichrist may not a similar reproach be extended to the famous napier and even to newton at a time when learning was much more advanced than during the reign of james from the grossness of its superstitions we may infer the ignorance of an age but never should pronounce concerning the folly of an individual from his admitting popular errors consecrated by the appearance of religion such a superiority do the pursuits of literature possess above every other occupation that even he who obtains but a mediocrity in them merits the preeminence above those that excel the most in the common and vulgar professions the speaker of the house of commons is usually an eminent lawyer yet the harangue of his majesty will always be found much superior to that of the speaker in every parliament during his reign every science as well as polite literature must be considered as being yet in its infancy scholastic learning and polemical divinity retarded the growth of all true knowledge sir henry Saville, in the preamble of that deed by which he annexed a salary to mathematical and astronomical professors in oxford says that geometry was almost totally abandoned and unknown in england the best learning of that age was the study of the ancients casaubon eminent for this species of knowledge was invited over from france by james and encouraged by a pension of three hundred pounds a year as well as by church preferments the famous antonio de dominus archbishop of spalatro no despicable philosopher came likewise into england and afforded great triumph to the nation by their gaining so considerable a proselyte from the papists but the mortification followed soon after the archbishop though advanced to some ecclesiastical preferments received not encouragement sufficient to satisfy his ambition and he made his escape into italy where he died in confinement End of section 64, Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 4. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington.